Introduction to The Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith Introduction Throned on a grassy knoll, I watch the elfin host come trooping by, and hear the whir of fairy wings, the goblin voices, shrill and high. Behind them glides a magic train, of kings and princes, armor-clad, and serving as their squires bold, boots, ashy paddle, cinder lad. With silken rustle, flash of gem, Queen and Tsaritsa sweep along, while red-capped troll and rainbow sprite peep out amid the enchanted throng. Tingling, tingling, how sweet the ring, like golden bells of fairy laughter. Rap tap, rap tap, how sharp the clap of fairy footfalls following after. Where witch grass grows and fern seed lies, a fairy ring is dimly seen, and there a glittering host is met to dance upon the moonlit green. Riquet the tufted lightly turns the fair one with the golden hair, and Prince Desire and Mignonette form yet another graceful pair. Tall as a tower stands Galifron, the desert fay with snakes bedight, first pirouettes with him, and then with wee Tom Thumb, King Arthur's knight. Tingling, tingling, how sweet the ring, like golden bells of fairy laughter. Rap tap, rap tap, how sharp the clap of fairy footfalls following after. Sweet unseen harpers harp and sing, faint elfin horns the air repeat. Rapunzel shakes her shining braids, the white cat trips with velvet feet. Rose-red, snow-white, the faithful bear, cross hands with gallant Percinet, while Tattercoats, in turn, salutes Yvonne the fearless, and Finette. But hark, the cock begins to crow, the darkness turns to day, and look, the fairy dancers whirl within the crimson covers of this book. Nora Archibald Smith End of Introduction Story One of the Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janelle Parham The Fairy Ring Edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith Story One East of the Sun and West of the Moon once on a time there was a poor husbandman who had so many children that he hadn't much of either food or clothing to give them. Pretty children they all were, but the prettiest was the youngest daughter, who was so lovely that there was no end to all her loveliness. So one day, twas on a Thursday evening, late at the fall of the year, the weather was so wild and rough outside, and it was so cruelly dark, and rain fell and wind blew till the walls of the cottage shook again. There they all sat round the fire, busy with this thing and that. But just then, all at once, something gave three taps on the window-pane. Then the father went out to see what was the matter, and when he got out of doors, what should he see but a great big white bear? "'Good evening to you,' said the white bear. "'The same to you,' said the man. "'Will you give me your youngest daughter?' "'If you will, I'll make you as rich as you are now poor,' said the bear." Well, the man would not be at all sorry to be rich, but still he thought he must have a bit of a talk with his daughter first. So he went in and told them how there was a great white bear waiting outside, who had given his word to make them rich, if he could only have the youngest daughter. The lassie said no, outright. Nothing could get her to say anything else. So the man went out and settled it with the white bear that he should come again the next Thursday evening and get an answer. Meantime, he talked his daughter over and kept on telling her of all the riches they would get, and how well off she would be herself. And so at last she thought better of it, and washed and mended her rags, made herself as smart as she could, and was ready to start. Next Thursday evening came the white bear to fetch her, and she got upon his back with her bundle, and off they went. So when they had gone a bit of a way, the bear said, "'Are you afraid?' "'No, she wasn't.' "'Well, mind and hold tight to my shaggy coat, and then there's nothing to fear,' said the white bear. So she rode a long, long way, until they came to a very steep hill. There, on the face of it, the white bear gave a knock, and a door opened, and they came into a castle where there were many rooms, all lit up, 
rooms gleaming with silver and gold, and there, too, was a table ready laid, and it was all as grand as grand could be. Then the white bear gave her a silver bell, and when she wanted anything she had only to ring it and she would get it at once. Well, after she had eaten and drunk and evening wore on, she got sleepy after her journey and thought she would like to go to bed. So she rang the bell, and she had scarce taken hold of it before she came into a chamber where there was a bed made, as fair and white as any one could wish to sleep in, with silken pillows and curtains and gold fringe. She slept quite soundly until morning. Then she found her breakfast waiting in a pretty room. When she had eaten it, the girl made up her mind to take a walk around, in order to find out if there were any other people there besides herself. But she saw nobody but an old woman, whom she took to be a witch, and as the dame beckoned to her, the girl went at once. "'Little girl,' said the witch, "'if you'll promise not to say a word to anybody, I'll tell you the secret about this place.' Of course the girl promised at once, so the old dame said, "'In this house there lives a white bear, but you must know that he is only a white bear in the daytime. Every night he throws off his beast shape and becomes a man, for he is under the spell of a wicked fairy. Now, be sure and not to mention this to anybody, or misfortune will come. And with these words she disappeared. So things went on happily for some time, but at last the girl began to grow sad and sorrowful, for she went about all day alone, and she longed to go home to see her father and mother and brothers and sisters. Well, well, said the bear, perhaps there's a cure for all this sorrow, but you must promise me one thing. When you go home, you mustn't talk about me except when they all are present, or if you do, you will bring bad luck to both of us. So one Sunday the white bear came and said now they would set off to see her father and mother. Well, off they started, she sitting on his back, and they went far and long. At last they came to a grand house, and there her brothers and sisters were running about out of doors at play, and everything was so pretty t'was a joy to see. This is where your father and mother live now, said the white bear. "'But don't forget what I told you, or you'll make us both unlucky.' "'No, bless her, she'd not forget.' And when they reached the house, the white bear turned right about and left her. Then, when she went in to see her father and mother, there was such joy there was no end to it. None of them could thank her enough for all the good fortune she had brought them. They had everything they wished, as fine as could be, and they all wanted to know how she got on and where she lived.' Well, she said it was very good to live where she did, and she had all she wished. What she said besides I don't know, but I don't believe any of them had the right end of the stick, or that they got much out of her. But after dinner her sister called her outside the room, and asked all manner of questions about the white bear, whether he was cross, and whether she ever set eyes on him, and such like. And the end of it all was that she told her sister the story of how the white bear was under a spell. But the other girl wouldn't listen to the story, for she said it couldn't be true, and this made the youngest daughter very angry. In the evening the white bear came and fetched her away, and when they had gone a bit of the way he asked her whether she had done as he had told her and refused to speak about him. Then she confessed that she had spoken a few words to her sister about him, and the bear was very angry, for he said she would surely bring bad luck to them both. When they reached home she remembered how her sister had refused to believe the story about the white bear, so in the night, when she knew that the bear was fast asleep, she stole out of bed, lighted her candle, and crept into his room. Yes, there he lay, fast asleep, but instead of being a white bear, he was the handsomest prince you ever saw. She gave such a start that she dropped three spots of hot tallow from the candle onto his pillow, so she ran off in a great fright. Next morning the white bear said to her, I fear you have found out my secret, for I saw the drops of tallow on my pillow this morning, and now I know that you spoke to your sister about me. If you had only kept quiet for a whole year, then I should have become a man for always, and I should have made you my wife at once. But now all ties are snapped between us, and I must go away to a big castle which stands east of the sun and west of the moon, and there, too, lives a princess with a nose three ells long, and she's the wife I must have now. The girl wept and took it ill, but there was no help for it. Go he must. Then she asked if she mightn't go with him. No, she mightn't. Tell me the way, then, she said, and I'll search you out. That surely I may get leave to do. 
Yes, she might do that, but there was no way to the place. It lay east of the sun and west of the moon, and thither she'd never find her way. So next morning, when she woke, both prince and castle were gone, and there she lay on a little green patch in the midst of the thick gloomy wood, and by her side lay the same bundle of rags that she had brought with her from her old home. So when she had rubbed the sleep from her eyes, and wept till she was tired, she set out on her way, and walked many, many days, till she came to a lofty crag. Under it sat an old hag, who played with a golden apple, which she tossed about. The lassie asked her if she knew the way to the prince who lived in the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon, and who was to marry a princess with a nose three ells long. "'How did you come to know about him?' said the old hag. "'But maybe you are the lassie who ought to have had him.' "'Yes, she was.' "'So, so, it's you, is it?' said the old hag. "'Well, all I know about him is that he lives in the castle that lies east of the sun and west of the moon, and thither you'll come, late or never. But still you may have the loan of my horse, and on him you can ride to my next neighbor. Maybe she'll be able to tell you what you want to know. And when you get there, just give the horse a switch under the left ear, and beg him to be off home. And stay, you may take this golden apple with you.' So she got upon the horse and rode a long, long time, till she came to another crag, under which sat another old hag, with a golden carding comb in her hand. The lassie asked her if she knew the way to the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon, and she answered, like the first old hag, that she knew nothing about it, except that it was east of the sun and west of the moon. "'And thither you'll come, late or never, but you shall have the loan of my horse to go to my next neighbor. Maybe she'll tell you all about it.' "'and when you get there, just switch the horse under the left ear "'and beg him to be off home.' "'And this old hag gave her the golden carding comb. "'It might be she'd find some use for it,' she said. "'So the lassie got upon the horse and rode far, far away, "'and had a weary time. "'And so at last she came to another great crag "'under which sat another old hag, spinning with a golden spinning-wheel. The lassie asked her, too, if she knew the way to the prince, and where the castle was that lay east of the sun and west of the moon. So it was the same thing over again. "'Maybe it's you who ought to have had the prince,' said the old hag. Yes, it was. But she, too, didn't know the way a bit better than the other two. East of the sun and west of the moon she knew it was. That was all. "'And thither you'll come, late or never.' "'But I'll lend you my horse, and then I think you'd best ride to the east wind and ask him. "'Maybe he knows those parts and can blow you thither. "'But when you get to him, you need only give the horse a switch under the left ear, "'and he'll trot home of himself.' "'And so, too, she gave the lassie the golden spinning-wheel. "'Maybe you'll find a use for it,' said the old hag. "'Then on she rode a great many weary days before she got to the east wind's house. "'But at last she did reach it and then she asked the east wind if he could tell her the way to the prince who dwelt east of the sun and west of the moon yes the east wind had often heard about them both the prince and the castle but he couldn't tell her the way for he'd never blown so far but if you will i'll go with you to my brother the west wind maybe he's been there for he's much stronger so if you will just jump on my back i'll carry you thither yes she got on his back and i should just think they went swiftly along so when they reached there, they went into the west wind's house, and the east wind said the lassie he had brought was the one that ought to have married the prince, who lived in the castle east of the sun and west of the moon, and that she had set out to seek him. He then said how he had come with her, and we'd be glad to know if the west wind knew how to get to the castle. Nay, said the west wind, for I've never blown so far. But, if you will, I'll go with you to our brother, the south wind, for he's much stronger than either of us, and he has flapped his wings both far and wide. Maybe he'll tell you, so you can get on my back, and I'll carry you to him. Yes, she got on his back, and so they travelled to the south wind, and they weren't so very long on the way, I should think. When they reached there, the west wind asked him if he could tell them the way to the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon, for this was the lassie who ought to have married the prince who lived there. You don't say so. That's she, is it? said the south wind. "'Well, I've blustered about in most places in my time, "'but so far I have never blown. "'But if you will, I'll take you to my brother, the North Wind. "'He is the oldest and strongest of all of us. 
If he doesn't know where to find the place, you will never find anybody to tell you where it is. You can get on my back, and I'll carry you thither. Yes, she got on his back, and away he went from his house at a very high rate, and this time, too, she wasn't long on her way. When they got to the North Wind's house, he was so wild and cross that the puffs came from quite a long way off. "'What do you want?' he roared out to them, in such a voice that it made them both shiver. "'Well,' said the South Wind, "'you needn't talk like that, for here I am, your brother, the South Wind, and here is the lassie, who ought to have had the prince, who dwells at the castle that lies east of the sun and west of the moon, and now she wants to know if you were ever there, and can tell her the way, for she would be so glad to find it again.' "'Yes, I know well enough where it is,' said the North Wind. "'Once in my life I blew an aspen leaf there, "'but I was so tired that I couldn't blow another puff for days after. "'But if you really wish to go there and aren't afraid to trust yourself to me, "'I'll take you on my back and blow you thither.' "'Yes, with all her heart. "'She must and would get thither if it were possible in any way. "'And as for fear, however madly he went, she wouldn't be at all afraid.' "'Very well, then,' said the North Wind. "'But you must sleep here to-night, "'for we must have the whole day before us "'if we are to get thither at all.' "'Early next morning the North Wind woke her "'and puffed himself up and blew himself out "'and made himself so stout and big "'twas fearful to look at him. "'So off they went up through the air "'as if they would never stop "'till they came to the world's end. "'Down below there was such a storm "'it threw down long tracts of wood "'in many houses.' and when it swept over the great sea, ships foundered by hundreds. So they tore on and on. Nobody can believe how far they went. And all the while they still went over the sea, and the north wind got more and more weary, and so out of breath he could scarce get out a puff. His wings drooped and drooped, till at last he sank so low that the crests of the waves dashed over his heels. "'Are you afraid?' asked the north wind. "'No, she wasn't.' but they weren't very far from land, and the north wind had still so much strength in him that he managed to throw her upon the shore under the windows of the castle which lay east of the sun and west of the moon. But then he was so weak and worn out that he had to stay there and rest for many days before he was fit to return home. Next morning the lassie sat down under the castle window and began to play with the golden apple, and the first person she saw was Longnose, who was to marry the prince. "'What do you want for your golden apple, lassie?' said Longnose, and she threw up the window. "'It's not for sale, for gold or money,' said the lassie. "'If it's not for sale, for gold or money, what is it that you will sell for it?' said the princess. "'You may name your own price for it.' "'Well, if you will let me speak a few words alone with the prince who lives in the castle, I will give you the apple,' she answered. "'Yes, she might. That could be done.' So the princess got the golden apple, and the lassie was shown into the prince's room. But when she got inside, she found that the prince was fast asleep, and although she shook him and called him loudly, it was no use, for she couldn't wake him, so she had to go away again. Next day she sat down under the castle window again, and began to card with her golden carding comb, and the same thing happened. The princess asked what she wanted for it, and she said it wasn't for sale for either gold or money but that if she might have a few words alone with the prince, the princess should have the comb. So she was taken up to the prince's room, and again she found him fast asleep. And although she wept and shook him for quite a long time, she couldn't get life into him. So the next morning the lassie sat down under the castle window and began to spin with her golden spinning wheel. And that, too, the princess with the long nose wanted to have. So she threw up the window and asked what the lassie wanted for it. And the girl said, as she had said twice before, that if she might have a few words alone with the prince, the princess might have the wheel and welcome. Yes, she might do that, and the lassie was shown again into the prince's room. This time he was wide awake, and he was very pleased indeed to see her. Ah, said the prince, you've come just in the nick of time, for to-morrow was to be our wedding day. But now I won't have long nose, and you are the bride for me. I'll just say that I want to find out what my wife is fit for, and then I'll beg her to wash the pillow slip, which has on it the three spots of tallow. She will be sure to say yes, but when she tries to get out the spots, she'll soon find that it is not possible, for she is a troll like all the rest of her family, and it is not possible for a troll to get rid of the marks. 
then i'll say that i won't have any other bride than she who can wash out the spots of tallow and i'll call you in to do it the wedding was to take place the next day so just before the ceremony the prince said first of all i'd just like to see what my bride is fit for yes said the mother i'm quite willing well i have a pillow slip which somehow or other has got some spots of grease on it and i have sworn never to take any bride but the woman who was able to wash them out for me if she can't do that she's not worth having well that was no great thing they said so they agreed and she with a long nose began to wash away as hard as ever she could but the more she rubbed and scrubbed the bigger the spots grew ah said the old hag her mother you can't wash let me try but she hadn't long taken the job in hand before it got far worse than ever and with all her rubbing wringing and scrubbing the spots grew bigger and blacker and darker and uglier then all the other trolls began to wash but the longer it lasted the blacker and uglier it grew until at last it looked as though it had been up the chimney ah said the prince you are none of you worth a straw you can't wash why there outside sits a beggar lassie and i'll be bound she knows how to wash better than the whole lot of you so he shouted to the lassie to come in and in she came can you wash this clean lassie said he i don't know but i think i can and almost before she had taken it and dipped it in the water it was white as driven snow and whiter still yes you are the lassie for me said the prince at that the old hag flew in such a rage that she burst on the spot and the princess with the long nose after her and then the whole pack of trolls did the same as for the prince and princess they had a grand wedding and lived happily at the castle east of the sun and west of the moon until the end of their days end of east of the sun and west of the moon recording by janelle parham www.plantsgrownup.blogspot.com Story two of the fairy ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. C. Y. The fairy ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wagen and Nora Archibald Smith. Story two: The Golden Lantern, Golden Goat, and Golden Cloak. There once was a poor widow who had three sons. The two elder ones went out to work for their living, and while at home they were of little use, as they seldom did as their mother wished, whatever she might say to them. But the youngest lad always remained at home, and helped the old widow in her daily occupations. Hence he was much beloved by his mother, but disliked by his brothers, who in mockery gave him the nickname of Pinkle. One day the old widow said to her sons, you must all go abroad in the world, and seek your fortunes while you can. I am no longer able to feed you here at home, now that you are grown up. The lads answered that they wished for nothing better, since it was contrary to their mother's will that they should remain at home. They then prepared for their departure, and set out on their journey, but after wandering about from place to place, were unable to procure any employment. After journeying thus for a long time, they came late one evening to a vast lake. Far out in the water there was an island, on which there appeared a strong light, as of fire. The lads stopped on shore observing the wondrous light, and thence concluded that there must be human beings in the place. As it was now dark, and the brothers knew not where to find a shelter for the night, they resolved on taking a boat that lay among the reeds, and rowing over to the island to beg a lodging. With this view they placed themselves in the boat, and rowed across. On approaching the island, they perceived a little hut standing at the water's edge, on reaching which they discovered that the bright light that shone over the neighborhood proceeded from a golden lantern that stood at the door of the hut. In the yard without, a large goat was wandering about, with golden horns, to which small bells were fastened. They gave forth a pleasing sound whenever the animal moved. The brothers wondered much at all this, but most of all at the old crone, who with her daughter inhabited the hut. The crone was both old and ugly, 
but was sumptuously clad in a palace of cloak, worked so artificially with golden threads that it glittered like burnished gold in every hem. The lads saw now very clearly that they had come to no ordinary human being, but to a troll. After some deliberation the brothers entered, and saw the crumb standing by the fireplace and stirring with a ladle in a large pot that was boiling on the hearth. They told their story and prayed to be allowed to pass the night there, but the crown answered no, at the same time directing them to a royal palace, which lay on the other side of the lake. While speaking, she kept looking intently on the youngest boy, as he was standing and casting his eyes over everything in the hut. The crown said to him, "'What is thy name, my boy?' The lad answered smartly, "'I'm called Pinko.' The troll then said, Thy brothers can go their way, but thou shalt stay here, for thou appearest to me very crafty, and my mind tells me that I have no good to expect from thee if thou shouldst stay long at the king's palace. Pingel now humbly begged to be allowed to accompany his brothers, and promised never to cause a crown harm or annoyance. At length he also had leave to depart after which the brothers hastened to the boat, not a little glad that all three had escaped so well in this adventure. Toward the morning they arrived at a royal palace, larger and more magnificent than anything they had ever seen before. They entered and begged for employment. The eldest two were received as helpers in the royal stables, and the youngest was taken as page to the king's young son and being a sprightly intelligent lad, he soon won the good will of every one, and rose from day to day in the king's favour. At this his brothers were sorely nettled, not in jury that he should be preferred to themselves. At length they consulted together how they might compass the fall of their young brother, in the belief that afterwards they should prosper better than before. They therefore presented themselves one day before the king, and gave him an exaggerated account of the beautiful lantern that shed light over both land and water, adding that it ill beseemed a king to lack so precious a jewel. On hearing this, the king's attention was excited, and he asked, Where is this lantern to be found, and who can procure it for me? The brothers answered, No one can do that unless it be our brother Pinkel. He knows best where the lantern is to be found. The king was now filled with the desire to obtain the golden lantern about which he had to tell, and commanded the youth to be called. When Pinko came, the king said, If thou canst procure me the golden lantern that shines over land and water, I will make thee the chief man in my whole court. The youth promised to do his best to execute his lord's behest, and the king praised him for his willingness, but the brothers rejoiced at heart for they well knew it was a perilous undertaking, which could hardly terminate favourably. Pinkel now prepared a little boat, and, unaccompanied by any one, rowed over to the little island inhabited by the troll Crone. When he arrived it was a red evening, and the Crone was busied in boiling porridge for supper, as was her custom. The youth, creeping softly up to the roof, cast from time to time a handful of salt through the chimney, so that it fell down into the pot that was boiling on the hearth. When the porridge was ready, the crone had begun to eat. She could not conceive what had made it so salt and bitter. She was out of humour, and chided her daughter, thinking that she had put too much salt into the porridge. But let her dilute the porridge as she might, it could not be eaten, so salt and bitter it was. She then ordered her daughter to go to the well, that was just at the foot of the hill, and fetch water, in order to prepare fresh porridge. The maiden answered, How can I go to the well? It is so dark out of doors that I cannot find the way over the hill. Then take my gold lantern, said the crone peevishly. The girl took the beautiful gold lantern accordingly, and hastened her way to fetch the water. But as she stooped to lift the pail, Pinko, who was on the watch, seized her by the feet, and cast her headlong into the water. He then took the golden lantern, and betook himself in all haste to his boat. 
In the meantime the crone was wondering why her daughter stayed out so long, and at the same moment, chancing to look through the window, she saw the light gleaming far out on the water. At this sight she was sorely vexed, and hurrying down to the shore, cried aloud, "'Is that thou, Pinko?' The youth answered, "'Yes, dear mother, it is I,' the troll continued. "'Art thou not a great knave?' the lad answered. "'Yes, dear mother, I am so.' The crown now began to lament and complain, saying, "'Ah, what a fool was I to let thee go from me! I might have been sure thou wouldst play me some trick. If thou ever comest hither again, thou shalt not escape.' And so the matter rested for that time. Pinka now returned to the king's palace, and became the chief person at court, as the king had promised. But when the brothers were informed what complete success he had had in his adventure, they became yet more envious and embittered than before, and often consulted together how they might accomplish the fall of their young brother, and gain the king's favor for themselves. Both brothers went, therefore, a second time before the king, and began relating at full length about the beautiful goat to the horns of the purest goat, from which little gold bells were suspended, which gave forth a pleasing sound whenever the animal moved. They added that it ill became so rich a king to lack so costly a treasure. On hearing their story, the king was greatly excited, and said, "'Where is this goat to be found?' and who can procure it for me the brothers answered that no one can do unless it be our brother pinko for he knows best where the goat is to be found the king then felt a strong desire to possess the goat with the golden horns and therefore commanded the youth to appear before him when pinko came the king said thy brothers have been telling me of a beautiful goat with horns of the purest gold and little bells fastened to the horns which ring whenever the animal moves. Now it is my will that thou go and procure for me this goat. If thou art successful, I will make thee lord over a third part of my kingdom. The youth, having listened to this speech, promised to execute his lord's commission, if only fortune would befriend him. The king then praised his readiness, and the brothers were glad at heart, believing that Pinko would not escape this time so well as the first. Pinky now made the necessary preparations and rode to the island where the troll wife dwelt. When he reached it, evening was already advanced, and it was dark, so that no one could be aware of his coming, the golden lantern being no longer there, but shedding its light in the royal palace. The youth now deliberated with himself how to get the golden goat, but the task was no easy one, for the animal lay every night in the crone's hut. At length it occurred to his mind that there was one method which might probably prove successful, though nevertheless sufficiently difficult to carry into effect. A night, when it was time for the crone and her daughter to go to bed, the girl went as usual to bolt the door, but Pinko was just outside on the watch, and had placed a piece of wood behind the door, so that it would not shut close. The girl stood for a long time trying to lock it but to no purpose. On perceiving this, the crone thought there was something out of order, and called out that the door might very well remain unlocked for the night, as soon as it was daylight they could ascertain what was wanting. The girl then left the door ajar, and laid herself down to sleep. When the night was a little more advanced, and the crone and her daughter were snug in deep repose, the youth stole softly into the hood and approached the goat where he lay stretched out on the hearth. Pinko now stuffed wool into all the golden bells, lest their sound might betray him. Then, seizing the goat, he bore it off to his boat. When he had reached the middle of the lake, he took the wool out of the goat's ears, and the animal moved so that the bells rang aloud. At the sound the crone awoke, ran down to the water, and cried in an angry tone, is that thou, Pinko? The youth answered. Yes, dear mother, it is. The crone said, Hast thou stolen my golden goat? The youth answered, 
"'Yes, dear mother, I have.' The troll continued. "'Art thou not a big knave?' Pinker returned for answer. "'Yes, I am so, dear mother.' Now the beldam began to whine and complain, saying, "'Ah, what a dimpleton was I for letting thee slip away from me! I well knew thou wouldst play me some trick. But if thou comest hither ever again, thou shalt never go hence.' Pinkel now returned to the king's court, and obtained the government of a third part of the kingdom, as the king had promised. But when the brothers heard how the enterprise had succeeded, and also saw the beautiful lantern and the goat with the golden horns, which were regarded by every one as great wonders, they would become still more hostile and bitter than ever. They could think of nothing but how they might accomplish his destruction. They went, therefore, one day again before the king to whom they gave a most elaborate description of the troll crown's fur cloak, that shone like the brightest gold, and was worked with golden threads in every seam. The brother said it was more befitting a queen than a troll to possess such a treasure, and added that that alone was wanting to the king's good fortune. When the king heard all this, he became very thoughtful, and said, "'Where is this cloak to be found, and who can procure it for me?' The brothers answered, "'No one can do that, except our brother Pinko, for he knows best where the golden cloaks to be found.' The king was thereupon seized with an ardent longing to possess the golden cloak, and commanded the youth to be called before him. When Pinko came, the king said, "'I have long been aware that thou hast an affection for my young daughter, and thy brothers have been telling me of a beautiful fur cloak.' which shines with the reddest gold in every seam. It is therefore my will that thou go and procure for me this cloak. If thou art successful, thou shalt be my son-in-law, and after me shalt inherit the kingdom. When the youth heard this, he was glad beyond measure, and promised either to win the young maiden or perish in the attempt. The king thereupon praised his readiness, but the brothers were delighted in their false hearts, and trusted that the enterprise would prove their brother's destruction. Pinkyo then betook himself to his boat, and crossed over to the island inhabited by the troll crone. On the way he anxiously deliberated with himself how he might get possession of the crone's golden cloak, but it appeared to him not very likely that his undertaking would prove successful seeing that the troll always wore the cloak upon her. So after having concerted diverse plans, one more hazardous than another, it occurred to him that he would try one method which might perhaps succeed, although it was bold and rash. In pursuance of his scheme he bound a bag under his clothes, and walked with trembling step and humble demeanour into the beldam's hut. On perceiving him, the troll cast on him a savage glance, and said, "'Pinko, is that thou?' The youth answered, "'Yes, dear mother, it is.' The crone was overjoyed, and said, "'Although thou art come voluntarily into my power, thou canst not surely hope to escape again from me, after having played me so many tricks.' She then took a large knife and prepared to make an end of poor Pinkle, but the youth, seeing her design, appeared sorely terrified, and said, "'If I must needs die, I think I might be allowed to choose the manner of my death. I would rather eat myself to death with milk porridge than be killed with a knife.' The crone thought to herself that the youth had made a bad choice, and therefore promised to comply with his wish. She then set a huge pot on the fire, in which she put a large quantity of porridge. When the mess was ready, she placed it before Pinkel that he might eat, who for every spoonful of porridge that he put into his mouth, poured two into the bag that was tied under his clothes. At length the crone began to wonder how Pinkel could contrive to swallow such a quantity, but just at the same moment the youth, making a show of being sick to death, sank down from his seat as if he were dead, and, unobserved, cut a hole in the bag, so that the porridge ran over the floor. 
The crone, thinking that Pinkel had burst with the quantity of porridge he had eaten, was now a little glad, clapped her hands together, and ran off to look for her daughter, who was gone to the well. But as the weather was wet and stormy, she first took off her beautiful fur cloak and laid it aside in the hut. Before she could have proceeded far, the young came to life again, and springing up like lightning, seized on a golden cloak, and ran off at the top of his speed. Shortly after, the crone perceived Pinkel as he was rowing his little boat. On seeing him alive again, and observing the golden cloak glittering on the surface of the water, she was angry beyond all conception, and went far out on the strand, crying, "'Is that thou, Pinkel?' the youth answered. "'Yes, it is I, dear mother,' the crown said. "'Hast thou taken my beautiful golden cloak?' Pinkel responded. "'Yes, dear mother, I have,' the troll continued. "'Art thou not a great knave?' the youth replied. "'Yes, I am so, dear mother.' The old witch was now almost beside herself, and began to whine and lament, and said, "'Ah, how silly was it of me to let thee slip away! I was well assured thou wouldst play me many wicked tricks.' They then parted from each other. The troll wife now returned to her hut, and Pinko crossed the water, and arrived safely at the king's palace. There he delivered the golden cloak, of which everyone said that a more sumptuous garment was never seen nor heard of. The king honorably kept his word with the youth, and gave him his young daughter to wife. Pinko afterwards lived happy and content to the end of his days, but his brothers were and continued to be helpers in the stable as long as they lived. End of the Golden Lantern, Golden Goat, and Golden Cloak Story three of the Fairy Ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story three. Mother Roundabout's Daughter. Once upon a time there was a goody who had a son, and he was so lazy and slow, he would never turn his hand to anything that was useful, but singing and dancing he was very fond of. And so he danced and sang as long as it was day, and sometimes even some way on in the night. The longer this lasted, the harder it was for the goody. The boy grew, and meat he must have without stint, and more and more was spent in clothing as he grew bigger and bigger, and it was soon worn out, I should think, for he danced and sprung about both in wood and field. At last the goody thought it too bad, so she told the lad that now he must begin to turn his hand to work and live steadily, or else there was nothing before both of them but starving to death. But that the lad had no mind to do. He said that he would far rather woo Mother Roundabout's daughter and if he could only get her, he would be able to live well and softly all his days, and sing and dance, and never do one stroke of work. When his mother heard this, she too thought it would be a very fine thing, and so she fitted out the lad as well as she could, that he might look tidy when he reached Mother Roundabout's house, and so he set off on his way. Now when he got out of doors, the sun shone warm and bright, but it had rained the night before, so that the ways were soft and miry, and all the bog-holes stood full of water. The lad took a short cut to Mother Roundabout's, and he sang and jumped, as was ever his wont, but just as he sprang and leaped, he came to a bog-hole, and over it lay a little bridge, and from the bridge he had to make a spring across a hole onto a tuft of grass, that he might not dirty his shoes, but plump, it went all at once, and just as he put his foot on the tuft, it gave way under him, and there was no stopping till he found himself in a nasty, deep, dark hole. At first he could see nothing, but when he had been there a while, 
he had a glimpse of a rat that came wiggle-waggle up to him with a bunch of keys at the tip of her towel. "'What, you here, my boy?' said the rat. "'Thank you kindly for coming to me. I have waited long for you. You come, of course, to woo me, and you are eager at it, I can very well see. But you must have patience yet a while, for I shall have a great dower. I am not ready for my wedding just yet, but I'll do my best that it shall be as soon as ever I can.' When she had said that, she brought out ever so many eggshells, with all sorts of bits and scraps, such as rats are wont to eat, and set them before him, and said, Now you must sit down and eat. I am sure you must be both tired and hungry. But the lad thought he had no liking for such food. If I were only well away from this, above ground again, he thought to himself, but he said nothing out loud. Now I dare say you'll be glad to go home again, said the rat. I know your heart is set on this wedding, and I'll make all the haste I can, and you must take with you this linen thread, and when you get above, you must not look around, but go straight home, and on the way, you must mind and say nothing but, short before and long back, short before and long back. And as she said this, she put the linen thread into his hand. Heavens be praised, said the lad when he got above ground. Thither I'll never come again, if I can help it. But he still had the thread in his hand, and sprang and sang as he was wont. But even though he thought no more of the rat-hole, he had got his tongue into the tune, and so he sang, short before and long back, short before and long back. And when he got back home into the porch, he turned round, and there lay many, many hundred elves of the whitest linen, so fine that the handiest weaving girl could not have woven it finer. "'Mother, mother, come out!' he cried, and roared. Out came the goody in a bustle, and asked whatever was the matter, but when she saw the linen woof, which stretched as far back as she could see, and a bit besides, she couldn't believe her eyes, till the lad told her how it had all happened. And when she had heard it, and tried the woof between her fingers, she grew so glad that she too began to dance and sing. So she took the linen and cut it out, and sewed shirts out of it both for herself and her son, and the rest she took into the town and sold, and got money for it. And now they both lived well and happily for a while, but when the money was all gone, the goody had no more food in the house, and so she told her son he really must now begin to go to work and live like the rest of the world, else there was nothing for it but starving for them both. But the lad had more mind to go to Mother Roundabout and woo her daughter. Well, the goody thought that a very fine thing, for now he had good clothes on his back, and he was not such a bad-looking fellow either. So she made him smart and fitted him out as well as she could, and he took out his new shoes and brushed them till they were as bright as glass, and when he had done that, off he went. But all happened just as it did before. When he got out of doors, the sun shone warm and bright. But it had rained overnight, so that it was soft and miry, and all the bog-holes were full of water. The lad took the shortcut to Mother Roundabout, and he sang and sprang as he was ever went. Now he took another way than the one he went before, but just as he leaped and jumped, he got upon the bridge over the moor again, and from it he had to jump over a bog-hole on to a turf, that he might not soil his shoes. But plump it went, and down it went under him, and there was no stopping till he found himself in a nasty deep dark hole. At first he could see nothing, but when he had been there a while he caught a glimpse of a rat, with a bunch of keys at the tip of her tail, who came wiggle-waggle up to him. "'What, you here, my boy?' said the rat. "'That was nice of you to wish to see me so soon again. "'You are very eager, that I can see, "'but you really must wait a while, "'for there is still something wanting to my dower. "'The next time you come, it shall be all right.' "'When she had said this, "'she set before him all kinds of scraps and bits in eggshells, "'such as rats eat and like, "'but the lad thought it all looked like meat "'that had already been eaten once, "'and he wasn't hungry, he said and all the time he thought, if I could only once more get above ground, or out of this hole. 
but he said nothing out loud. So after a while the rat said, I dare say now you would be glad to get home again, but I'll hasten on the wedding as fast as I ever can. And now you must take with you this shred of wool, and when you come above ground you must not look round, but go straight home, and all the way you must mind and say nothing but short before and long back, short before and long back. And as she said that, she gave him a thread of wool in his hand. Heaven be praised, said the lad, that I got away. Thither I'll never go again, if I can help it. And so he sang and jumped, as he was wont. As for the rat-hole, he thought no more about it, but as he got his tongue into tune, he sang, short before and long back, short before and long back. And so he kept on the whole way home. When he had got into the yard at home again, he turned and looked behind him, and there lay the finest cloth, more than many hundred ells, ay, almost above half a mile long, and so fine that no town dandy could have had finer cloth to his coat. "'Mother, mother, come out!' cried the lad. So the goody came out of doors, and clapped her hands, and was almost ready to swoon for joy, when she saw all that lovely cloth and then he had to tell her how he had got it, and how it had all happened to him from first to last. Then they had a fine time of it, you may fancy. The lad got new clothes of the finest sort, and the goody went off to the town, and sold the cloth by little and little, and made heaps of money. Then she decked out her cottage, and looked as smart in her old days as though she had been born a lady. So they lived well and happily, but at last that money came to an end too, and so the day came when the goody had no more food in the house, and then she told her son he really must turn his hand to work and live like the rest of the world, else there was nothing but starvation staring both of them in the face. But the lad thought it far better to go to mother roundabout and woo her daughter. This time the goody thought so too, and said not a word against it for now he had new clothes of the finest kind, and he looked so well, she thought it quite out of the question, that any one could say no to so smart a lad. So she smartened him up, and made him as tidy as she could, and he himself brought out his new shoes, and rubbed them till they shone so he could see his face in them, and when he had done that, off he went. This time he did not take the shortcut, but made a great bend, for down to the rats he would not go, if he could help it. He was so tired of all that wiggle-waggle, and that everlasting bridal gossip. As for the weather and the ways, they were just as they had been twice before. The sun shone, so that it was dazzling on the pools and the bog holes, and the lad sang and sprang as he was wont. But just as he sang and jumped, before he knew where he was, he was on the very same bridge, across the bog again. So he tried to jump from the bridge over a bog-hole, on to a tuft that he might not dirty his bright shoes. Plump it went, and it gave way with him, and there was no stopping till he was down in the same nasty, deep, dark hole again. At first he was glad, for he could see nothing, but when he had been there a while, he had a glimpse of the ugly rat, and loath he was to see her with the bunch of keys at the end of her tail. "'Good day, my boy,' said the Rat. "'You are heartily welcome again, "'for I see you can't bear to be any longer without me. "'Thank you, thank you kindly. "'But now everything is ready for the wedding, "'and we shall set off to church at once.' "'Something dreadful is going to happen,' thought the lad, "'but he said nothing out loud. "'Then the Rat whistled, and they came swarming out, "'such a lot of small rats and mice of all the holes and crannies.' and six big rats came harnessed to a frying-pan. Two mice got up behind as footmen, and two got up before and drove. Some two got into the pan, and the rat with a bunch of keys at her tail took her seat among them. Then she said to the lad, This road is a little narrow here, so you must be good enough to walk by the side of the carriage, my darling boy, till it gets broader, and then you shall have leave to sit up in the carriage alongside me. Very fine that will be, I dare say, thought the lad. If I were only well above ground, I'd run away from the whole pack of you. That was what he thought, 
but he said nothing out loud. So he followed them as well as he could. Sometimes he had to creep on all fours, and sometimes he had to stoop and bend his back as well, for the road was low and narrow in places. But when it got broader, he went on in front, and looked about him how he might best give them the slip and run away. But as he went forward, he heard a clear, sweet voice behind him which said, Now the road is good, come, my dear, and get up into the carriage. The lad turned round in a trice, and had near lost both nose and ears. There stood the grandest carriage, with six white horses to it, and in the carriage sat a maiden as bright and lovely as the sun, and round her sat others who were as pretty and soft as stars. They were a princess and her playfellows, who had been bewitched altogether, but now they were free, because he had come down to them, and never said a word against them. "'Come now,' said the princess. So the lad stepped up into the carriage, and they drove to the church, and when they drove from the church again, the princess said, "'Now we will drive first to my house, and then we'll send to fetch your mother.' "'That is all very well,' thought the lad.' for he still said nothing even now, but for all that he thought it would be better to go home to his mother and down into that nasty rat's hole. But just as he thought that, they came to a grand castle. Into it they turned, and there they were to dwell, and so a grand carriage with six horses was sent to fetch the goody, and when it came back they set to work at the wedding feast. It lasted fourteen days, and maybe they are still at it. So let us all make haste, perhaps we too may come in time to drink the bridegroom's health and dance with the bride. End of Mother Roundabout's Daughter Story 4 of The Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shirley Anderson The Fairy Ring Edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith Story 4 The Bear and Scrattle One Christmas day, the King of Norway sat in the great hall of his palace, holding a feast. Here's a health, said he, to our brother, the King of Denmark. What present shall we send our royal brother as a pledge of our good will this Christmas time? "'Send him, please, Your Majesty,' said the Norseman Gunter, who was the king's chief huntsman. "'One of our fine white bears, that his liegemen may show their little ones what sort of kittens we play with.' "'Well said, Gunter,' cried the king. "'But how shall we find a bear that will travel so long a journey willingly, and will know how to behave himself to our worthy brother when he reaches him?' "'Please, Your Majesty,' said Gunter, "'I have a glorious fellow as white as snow, that I caught when he was a cub.' He will follow me wherever I go, play with my children, stand on his hind legs, and behave himself as well as any gentleman ought to do. He is at your service, and I myself will take him wherever you choose. So the king was well pleased, and ordered Gunter to set off at once with Master Bruin. Start with the morning's dawn, said he, and make the best of your way. The Norseman went home to his house in the forest, and early next morning he walked Master Bruin, put the king's collar round his neck, and away they went over rocks and valleys, lakes and seas, the nearest road to the court of the king of Denmark. When they arrived there, the king was away on a journey, and Gunter and his fellow traveller set out to follow. It was bright weather, the sun shone and the birds sang, as they journeyed merrily on day after day, over hill and over dale, till they came within a day's journey of where the king was. All that afternoon they travelled through a gloomy, dark forest, but toward evening the wind began to whistle through the trees, and the clouds began to gather and threaten a stormy night. The road, too, was very rough, and it was not easy to tell which was more tired, Bruin or his master. What made matters the worse was that they had found no inn that day by the roadside, and their provisions had fallen short, so that they had no very pleasant prospect before them for the night. "'A pretty affair, this,' said Gunter. "'I am likely to be charmingly off here in the woods, "'with an empty stomach, a damp bed, and a bear for my bedfellow.' "'While the Norseman was turning this over in his mind, "'the wind blew harder and harder, 
and the clouds grew darker and darker. The bear shook his ears, and his master looked at his wit's end, when to his great joy a woodman came whistling along, out of the woods, by the side of his horse dragging a load of faggots. As soon as he came up, Gunter stopped him, and begged hard for a night's lodging for himself and his countrymen. The woodman seemed hearty and good-natured enough, and was ready to find shelter for the huntsman, but as to the bear, he had never seen such a beast before in his life, and would have nothing to do with him on any terms. The huntsman begged hard for his friend, and told how he was bringing him as a present to the king of Denmark, and how he was the most good-natured, best-behaved animal in the world, though he must allow that he was by no means one of the handsomest. The woodman, however, was not to be moved. His wife, he was sure, would not like such a guest, and who could say what he might take it into his head to do? Besides, he should lose his dog and his cat, his ducks and his geese, for they would all run away for fright, whether the bear was disposed to be friends with them or not. "'Good night, Master Huntsman,' said he. "'If you and old Shaggy back there cannot part, I am afraid you must e'en stay where you are, though you will have a sad night of it, no doubt.' Then he cracked his whip, whistled up his horse, and set off once more on his way homeward. The huntsmen grumbled, and Bruin grunted, as they followed shortly after, when to their great joy they saw the woodman, before he had gone many yards, pull up his horse once more and turn round. "'Stay, stay!' said he. "'I think I can tell you of a better plan than sleeping in a ditch. I know where you may find shelter, if you will run the risk of a little trouble from an unlucky imp that has taken up its abode in my old house, down the hill yonder. You must know, friend, that till last winter I lived in yon snug little house that you will see at the foot of the hill, if you come this way. Everything went smoothly on with us, till one unlucky night, when the storm blew as it seems likely to do to-night, some spiteful guest took it into his head to pay us a visit. And there have ever since been such noises, clattering and scumping upstairs and down, from midnight till the cock crows in the morning, that at last we were fairly driven out of house and home. What he is like no one knows, for we never saw him or anything belonging to him, except a little crooked high-heeled shoe that he left one night in the pantry. But though we have not seen him, we know he has a hand or a paw as heavy as lead, for when it pleases him to lay it upon any one, down he goes as if the blacksmith's hammer had hit him. There is no end of his monkey tricks. If the linen is hung out to dry, he cuts the line. If he wants a cup of ale, he leaves the tap running. If the fowls are shut up, he lets them loose. He puts the pig into the garden, rides upon the cows, and turns the horses into the hay-yard, and several times he nearly burned the house down, by leaving a candle alight among the faggots. And then he is sometimes so nimble and active, that when he is once in motion, nothing stands still around him. Dishes and plates, pots and pans, dance about, clattering, making the most horrible music, and breaking each other into pieces, and sometimes, when the whim takes him, the chairs and tables seem as if they were alive, and dancing a hornpipe, or playing battledore and shuttlecock together. Even the stones and beams of the house seem rattling against one another, and it is of no use putting things in order, for the first freak the imp took would turn everything upside down again. My wife and I bore such a lodger as long as we could, but at length we were fairly beaten, and as he seemed to have taken up his abode in the house, we thought it best to give up to him what he wanted, and the little rascal knew what we were about when we were moving, and seemed afraid we should not go soon enough, so he helped us off, from the morning we were to start, as we were going to put our goods upon the wagon, there it stood before the door ready loaded. And when we started, we heard a loud laugh, and a sharp little voice cried out of the window, "'Good-bye, neighbours!' So now he has our old house all to himself to play his gambols in, whenever he likes to sleep within doors, and we have built ourselves a snug cottage on the other side of the hill, where we live as well as we can, though we have no great room to make merry in. Now if you and your ugly friend there like to run the hazard of taking up your quarters in the elf's house, pray do. Yonder is the road. He may not be at home to-night. We will try our luck, said Gunter. Anything is better to my mind than sleeping out of doors such a night as this. Your troublesome neighbour will perhaps think so too, and we may have to fight for our lodging. But never mind, Bruin is rather an awkward hand to quarrel with, and the goblin may perhaps find a worse welcome from him than your house-dog could give him. He will at any rate let him know what a bear's hug is, for I dare say he has not been far enough north to know much about it yet. Then the woodman gave Gunter a faggot to make his fire with, and wished him a good night. 
He and the bear soon found their way to the deserted house, and no one being at home, they walked into the kitchen and made a capital fire. "'Lack a day!' said the Norseman. "'I forgot one thing. I ought to have asked that good man for some supper. I have nothing left but some dry bread. However, this is better than sleeping in the woods. We must make the most of what we have, keep ourselves warm, and get to bed as soon as we can.' So after eating up all their crusts, and drinking some water from the well close by, the huntsman wrapped himself up close in his cloak, and lay down in the snuggest corner he could find. Bruin rolled himself up in the corner of the wired fireplace, and both were fast asleep, the fire out, and everything quiet within doors long before midnight. Just as the clock struck twelve, the storm began to get louder. The wind blew. A slight noise within the room wakened the huntsman, and all in a sudden, in popped a little ugly scrattle, scarce three spans high, with a hump on his back, a face like a dried pippin, a nose like a ripe mulberry, and an eye that had lost its neighbour. He had high-heeled shoes and a pointed red cap, and came dragging after him a nice fat kid, ready-skinned and fit for roasting. "'A rough night, this,' grumbled the goblin to himself. "'But, thanks to that booby, woodman, I've a house to myself, and now for a hot supper and a glass of good ale till the cock crows. No sooner said than done. The squattle busied himself about, here and there. Presently the fire blazed up, the kid was put on a spit, and turned merrily round. A keg of ale made its appearance from a closet, the cloth was laid, and the kid was soon dished up for eating. Then the little imp, in the joy of his heart, rubbed his hands, tossed up his red cap, danced before the hearth, and sang his song. Oh, tis weary enough abroad to ride in the shivery midnight blast, and tis dreary enough to bide, hungry and cold, on the wintry wold, where the drifting snow falls fast. But tis cheery enough to revel by night in the crackling faggot's light. Tis merry enough to have and to hold the savoury roast and the nut-brown toast, with jolly good ale and old. The huntsman lay snug all this time, sometimes quaking in dread of getting into trouble, and sometimes licking his lips at the savoury supper before him and half in a mind to fight for it with the imp. However, he kept himself quiet in his corner, till all of a sudden the little man's eye wandered from his cheering ale-cup to Bruin's carcass as he lay rolled up like a ball, fast asleep in the chimney-corner. The imp turned round sharp in an instant, and crept softly nearer and nearer to where Bruin lay, looking at him very closely, and not able to make out what in the world he was. "'One of the family, I suppose.' said he to himself. But just then Bruin gave his ears a shake, and showed a little of his shaggy muzzle. Oh ho! said the imp. That's all, is it? But what a large one! Where could he have come from, and how came he here? What shall I do? Shall I let him alone, or drive him out? Perhaps he may do me some mischief, and I am not afraid of mice or rats. I have driven all the rest of the livestock out of the house, and why should I be afraid of sending this brute after them? With that, the elf walked slowly to the corner of the room, and taking up the spit, stole back on tiptoe, till he got quite close to the bear, then raising up his weapon. Down came a rattling thump across Bruin's mazard that sounded as hollow as a drum. The bear raised himself slowly up, snorted, shook his head, then scratched it, opened first one eye, then the other, took a turn across the room, and grinned at his enemy who, somewhat alarmed, rang back a few paces and stood with a spit in his hand, foreseeing a rough attack. And it soon came, for the bear, rearing himself up, walked leisurely forward, and putting out one of his paws, caught hold of the spit, jerked it out of the goblin's hand, and sent it spinning to the other end of the kitchen. And now began a fierce battle. This way and that flew tables and chairs, pots and pans. The elf was one moment on the bear's back, lugging his ears and pommeling him with blows that might have felled an ox. In the next the bear would throw him up in the air, and treat him as he came down with a hug that would make the little imp squall. Then up he would jump upon one of the beams out of Bruin's reach, and soon, watching his chance, would be down astride upon his back. Meantime Gunter had become sadly frightened, and seeing the oven door open, crept in for a shelter from the fray, and lay there quaking for fear. The struggle went on thus a long time, without it seeming at all clear who would get the better, biting, scratching, hugging, clawing, roaring, and growling, till the whole house rang. The elf, however, seemed to grow weaker and weaker, 
The rival stood for a moment as if to get breath, and the bear was getting ready for a fierce attack, when, all in a moment, the scrattle dashed his red cap in his eye, and while Bruin was smarting with a blow and trying to recover his sight, darted to the door, and was out of sight in a moment, though the wind blew, the rain pattered, and the storm raged in a merciless manner. "'Well done! Bravo, Bruin!' cried the huntsman, as he crawled out of the oven and ran and bolted the door. "'Thou hast combed his locks rarely, and as for thine own ears, they are rather the worse for pulling. But come, let us make the best of the good cheer our friend has left us.' So saying, they fell to and ate a hearty supper. The huntsman, wishing the scrattle a good night and pleasant dreams in a cup of his sparkling ale, laid himself down and slept till morning, and Bruin tried to do the same, as well as his aching bones would let him. In the morning the huntsman made ready to set out on his way, and had not got far from the door when he met the woodman, who was eager to hear how he had passed the night. Then Gunter told him how he had been awakened, what sort of creature the elf was, and how he and Bruin had fought it out. "'Let us hope,' said he, "'you will now be well rid of the gentleman. I suspect he will not come where he is likely to get any more of Bruin's hugs, and thus you will be well paid for your entertainment of us, which, to tell the truth, was none of the best, for if your ugly little tenant had not brought his supper with him, we should have had but empty stomachs this morning.' The huntsman and his fellow traveller journeyed on, and let us hope they reached the King of Denmark safe and sound. But to tell the truth, I know nothing more of that part of the story. The woodman, meantime, went to his work, and did not fail to watch at night to see whether the scrattle came, or whether he was thoroughly frightened out of his old haunt by the bear, or whatever he might take the beast to be that handled him as he was never handled before. But three nights passed over, and no traces being seen or heard of him, the woodman began to think of moving back into his own house. On the fourth day he was out at his work in the forest, and as he was taking a shelter under a tree, from a cold storm of sleet and rain that passed over, he heard a little cracked voice singing, or rather croaking a mournful tune. So he crept along quietly, and peeped over some bushes, and there sat the very same figure that the huntsman had described to him. The goblin was sitting without any hat or cap on his head, with a woe-begone face, and with his jacket torn into shreds, and his legs scratched and smeared with blood, as if he had been creeping through a bramble-bush. The woodman listened quietly to his song, and it ran as before. Oh, tis weary enough abroad to ride in the shivery midnight blast, and tis dreary enough alone to bide, hungry and cold, on the wintry wold, where the drifting snow falls fast. "'Sing us the other verse, man,' cried the woodman, for he could not help cracking a joke on his old enemy, who he saw was sadly in the dumps of the loss of his good cheer, and the shelter against the bad weather. But the instant his voice was heard, the little imp jumped up, stamped with rage, and was out of sight in the twinkling of an eye. The woodman finished his work, and was going home in the evening, whistling by his horse's side, when all of a sudden he saw, standing on a high bank by the wayside, the very same little imp, looking as grim and sulky as before. "'Hark ye, bumpkin!' cried the scrattle. "'Canst thou hear, fellow? Is thy great cat alive and at home still?' "'My cat?' said the woodman. "'Thy great right cat, man!' thundered out the little imp. "'Oh, my cat!' said the woodman, at last recollecting himself. "'Oh, yes, to be sure, alive and well, I thank you. Very happy, I'm sure, to see you and all friends, whenever you will do us the favour to call.' "'And hark, ye friend, as you seem to be so fond of my great cat, "'you may like to know that she had five kittens last night.' Five kittens?' muttered the elf. "'Yes,' replied the woodman, Five of the most beautiful white kits you ever saw. "'So like the old cat, it would do your heart good to see the whole family. "'Such soft, gentle paws, such delicate whiskers, such pretty little mouths.' Five kittens?' muttered, or rather shrieked out, the imp again. "'Yes, to be sure,' said the woodman. Five kittens. Do look in to-night, about twelve o'clock. "'The time, you know, that you used to come and see us. "'The old cat will be so glad to show them to you, "'and we will be so happy to see you once more. "'But where can you have been all this time?' "'I come? Not I, indeed,' shrieked the scrattle. "'What do I want with the little wretches? "'Did I not see the mother once? "'Keep your kittens to yourself. "'I must be off. This is no place for me. Five kittens. So there are six of them now.' "'Good-bye to you. You'll see me no more.' 
So bad luck to your ugly cat in your beggarly house. And bad luck to you, Mr. Crookback, cried the woodman, as he threw him the red cap he had left behind in his battle with Bruin. Keep clear of my cat, and let us hear no more of your pranks, and be hanged to you. So now that he knew his troublesome guest had taken his leave, the woodman soon moved back all his goods, and his wife and children, into their snug old house, and there they lived happily. For the elf never came to see them any more, and the woodman every day after dinner drank, Long life to the king of Norway, for sending the cat that cleared his house of vermin. End of The Bear and Scrattle Recording by Shirley Anderson Story 5 of The Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Lars Rolander The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 5. The Golden Bird There was once upon a time a king who had a garden. In that garden there was an apple tree, and on that apple tree there grew a golden apple every year. But when the time came to pluck the apple, it was gone, and no one knew who took it or what became of it, but gone it was. The king had three sons, and one day he told them that he who could bring him the apple or get hold of the thief should have the kingdom after him, no matter whether he was the eldest, the second, or the youngest son. The eldest set out first, and sat down under the tree to keep watch for the thief. Soon after dark a golden bird came flying, and light from it was so strong and dazzling that it could be seen a long way off. When the prince saw the bird and the dazzling light, he became so frightened that he dared not stay any longer, but rushed indoors as fast as he could. Next morning the apple was gone. The prince had then, however, recovered his courage, and began to get ready for his journey, and wanted to set off to find the bird. The king fitted him out in grand style, and spared neither money nor fine raiment. When the prince had gone a bit on the way, he became hungry, opened his scrip, and sat down to his breakfast by the roadside. A fox then came out of the wood, and sat down and looked at him. Do give me a little to eat said the fox. I'll give you some powder and shot, said the prince. My food I shall want myself. Nobody can tell how far and how long I may have to travel, said he. Just so, said the fox, and so he went back into the wood again. When the prince had finished his meal and rested a while, he set out on his way again. After a long time he came to a big city, and in that city there was an inn, where there was always joy and never any sorrow. He thought that would be a nice place to stop at, and so he remained. And there was such dancing and drinking and joy and merrymaking that he forgot the bird and his father and his journey and the whole kingdom. Away he was, and away he stopped. The next year the second prince was to watch for the thief in the garden. He also sat down under the tree when the apple began to ripen. But one night, all of a sudden, the golden bird came flying, shining like the sun, and the prince became so afraid that he took to his heels and ran indoors as fast as he could. In the morning the apple was gone, but the prince had then recovered his courage and wanted to set out to find the bird. He began to get ready, and the king fitted him out in grand style, and spared neither money nor fine raiment. But the same thing happened to him as to his brother. When he had got a bit on the way, he became hungry, opened his scrip, and sat down to his breakfast by the roadside. A fox then came out from the pine wood, and sat down and looked at him. Do give me a little to eat, said the fox. I'll give you some powder and shot, said the prince. My food I shall want myself. Nobody can tell how far and how long I may have to travel, said he. Just so, said the fox. 
and so he went back into the wood again. When the prince had finished his meal and rested a while, he set out on his way again. After a long time he came to the same city and the same inn, where there was always joy and never any sorrow, and there he also thought it would be nice to stop, and the first he met was his brother, and so he remained. The brother had been leading a gay and reckless life, and had scarcely any clothes left on his back, but now he began afresh, and there was such dancing and drinking and joy and merriment that the second prince also forgot the bird and his father and his journey and the whole kingdom. Away he was, and away he stopped. When the time came for the apple to ripen again, the youngest prince was to go into the garden and watch for the thief. He took a companion with him who was to help him up into the tree and to pass away the time so that he should not fall asleep. All of a sudden they saw a bright light, as if from the sun. Every feather of the bird could be seen long before it came to the tree. The prince climbed up into the tree, and at the same time the golden bird swooped down and took the apple. The prince tried to seize the bird, but he only caught a feather out of its tail. So he went to the king's bedroom, and as he came in with the feather it became as light as day. He also wanted to try if he could find his brothers and catch the bird, for he had been so near to it that he had got a feather from its tail, and would know it again anywhere, he said. Well, the king went and pondered long whether he should let him go, for he thought the youngest would not fare any better than the two eldest, who ought to have more knowledge of the world, and he was afraid he should lose him also. But the prince begged so earnestly that at last he got permission to go. He then began to get ready, and the king fitted him out in grand style both with clothes and money, and so he set off. When he had travelled for some time he became hungry, and took his scrip and sat down to have his breakfast. But just as he was in the midst of it a fox came out of the wood, and sat down close by his side and looked at him. Do give me a little to eat, said the fox. I shall want the food myself, said the prince, for I cannot tell how far I shall have to travel, but I have enough to give you a little. When the fox had got the piece of meat, he asked the prince where he was going. Yes, that he would tell him. If you will listen to me, I will help you, and you will have good luck, said the fox. The prince promised he would, and so they set off together. They travelled a while till they came to the same city and the same inn, where there was always joy but no sorrow. I must keep outside here. The dogs are rather a nuisance, said the fox, and so he told the prince where his brothers were to be found, and what they were doing. And if you go in there, you will not get any further either said he. The prince promised he would not go in there, and gave him his hand on it, and so each went his way. But when the prince came to the inn and heard the noise and merriment going on, he felt he must go in. There was no help for it, and when he met his brothers there was much rejoicing that he forgot both the fox and the journey and the bird and his father. But when he had been there a while, the fox came. He had ventured into the city after all, and opened the door a little, and made a sign to the prince, saying that now they must be off. So the prince bethought himself, and they went their way. When they had travelled a while, they saw a big mountain far away. The fox said, Three hundred miles at the back of that mountain there is a gilded linden tree with golden leaves, and in that tree sits the golden bird from which you took the feather. Thither they travelled together. When the prince was going to catch the bird, the fox gave him some bright feathers which he was to wave in his hands, and so attract the bird which would then fly down and sit on his hand. But the fox said he must not touch the linden tree, for inside it was a big troll, who owned it, and if the prince touched only the smallest twig, the troll would come out and kill him on the spot. 
No, he would not touch it, said the prince. But when he had got the bird on his hand, he thought he must have a twig of the tree. There was no help for it. It was so bright and beautiful. So he took a tiny little sprig, but the same moment the troll came out. Who is that stealing my tree and my bird? roared the troll. And he was so angry that he spurted sparks of fire. Thieves believe that all men steal, said the prince. But only those get hanged who do not steal properly, said he. The troll said that made no difference, and was going to kill him, but the prince begged him to spare his life. Well, said the troll, if you can bring me back the horse which my nearest neighbor has taken from me, you will get off with your life. Where shall I find it then, said the prince? Oh, he lives three hundred miles at the back of that big blue mountain against the horizon yonder said the troll the prince promised he would do his best but when he came back to the fox he found him in rather a bad temper now you've got yourself into trouble said the fox if you had listened to me we could have been on our way home by this said he so they had to make a fresh start for the prince had pledged his word and his life depended on his finding the horse. At last they got there, but as the prince was going to take the horse, the fox said, When you come into the stable, you will find all sorts of bridles hanging on the wall, but of gold and silver you must not touch them, for then the troll will come and kill you. You must take the ugliest and shabbiest you see. Yes, the prince promised he would. But when he came into the stable, he thought it was quite unreasonable not to take a fine bridle, for there were plenty of them, and so he took the brightest he could find. It was as bright as gold, but just then the troll came and was so angry that sparks flew from him. "'Who is that stealing my horse and my bridle?' he shrieked. Thieves believe that all men steal, said the prince, but only those get hanged who do not steal properly, said he. Well, that makes no difference. I'll kill you on the spot, shouted the troll. But the prince begged him to spare his life. Well, said the troll, if you can bring me back the fair damsel which my nearest neighbor has taken from me, I will spare you. "'Whereabouts does he live, then?' asked the prince. "'Oh, he lives three hundred miles at the back of that big blue mountain, against the horizon yonder,' said the troll. The prince promised he would fetch the damsel, and was allowed to go, and so escaped with his life. But when he came out, you may imagine how angry the fox was. "'Now you've got yourself into trouble again,' said he. If you had listened to me, we could have been on our way home long ago. I almost think I will not go with you any further. But the prince begged and prayed, and promised he would never do anything else but what the fox told him, if he would only remain with him. At last the fox gave in, and they became firm friends again. So they set off once more, and came at last to where the fair damsel was. Well, said the fox, I have your promise, but I dare not let you in to the troll after all. This time I must go myself. So he went in, and after a while he came out with the damsel, and so they went back the same way they had come. When they got to the troll who had the horse, they took both the horse and the brightest bridle, and when they got to the troll who had the linden tree and the bird, they took both the tree and the bird and started off with them. When they had got a bit on the way, they came to a field of rye, and the fox then said, I hear a thundering noise. You had better go on ahead. I will remain here a while, he said. He then plaited himself a gown of rye straw in which he looked like a preacher. All at once the three trolls came rushing along, hoping to overtake the prince. "'Have you seen anyone passing here with a fair damsel, a horse with a golden bridle, a golden bird, and a gilded linden tree?' 
they shouted to the fox as he stood there preaching well i've heard from my grandmother's grandmother that something of the kind passed this way but that was in the good old times when my grandmother's grandmother baked half penny cakes and gave back the half penny then all the trolls burst out laughing ho 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 they laughed and held on to one another if we have slept so long we may as well turn our noses homeward and go to sleep again they said and so they went back the way they came the fox then set off after the prince but when they came to the city where the inn and his brothers were he said i dare not go through the town on account of the dogs i must go my own way just above here but you must take good care your brothers do not get hold of you but when the prince came into the city he thought it would be too bad if he did not look in upon his brothers and have a word with them and so he tarried there for a while when the brothers saw him they came out and took the damsel and the horse and the bird and the linden tree and everything from him and they put him in a barrel and threw him into the sea and so they set off home to the king's palace with the damsel and the horse and the bird and the linden tree and everything but the damsel would not speak and she became pale and wretched to look upon the horse got so thin and miserable that it could hardly hang together the bird became silent and shone no more and the linden tree withered in the meantime the fox was sneaking about outside the city where the inn and the merriment were and was waiting for the prince and the damsel and wondering why they did not return he went hither and thither waiting and watching for them and at last he came down to the shore and when he saw the barrel which was lying out at sea drifting he shouted why are you drifting about there you empty barrel oh it is i said the prince in the barrel the fox then swam out to sea as fast as he could got hold of the barrel and towed it in to land then he began to gnaw the hoops and when he had got some off the barrel he said to the prince stamp and kick the prince stamped and kicked till all the staves flew out and out he jumped from the barrel so they went together to the king's palace and when they got there the damsel regained her beauty and began to talk the horse became so fat and sleek that every hair glistened the light shone from the bird and it began to sing the linden tree began to blossom and its leaves to sparkle and the damsel said he is the one who has saved us they planted the linden tree in the garden and the youngest prince was to marry the princess for such the damsel really was but the two eldest brothers were put each in a barrel and rolled down a high mountain then they began to prepare for the wedding but the fox first asked the prince to put him on the block and cut his head off and although the prince both prayed and cried there was no help for it he would have to do it but as he cut the head off the fox turned into a handsome prince and he was the brother of the princess whom they had rescued from the troll so the wedding came off and everything was so grand and splendid that the news of the festivities reached all the way here end of the golden bird read by lars rolander story six of the fairy ring this is a librivox recording all librivox recording are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Hui Jin. The Fairy Ring. Edited by Kate Douglas Wigging and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 6 The Doll in the Grass. Once upon a time, there was a king who had twelve sons. When they were grown up, he told them they must go out into the world and find themselves wives, who must all be able to spin and weave and make a shirt in one day else he would not have them for daughters-in-law he gave each of his sons a horse and a new suit of armor 
and so they set out in the world to look for wives. When they had traveled a bit on the way, they said they would not take Ashpedal with them, for he was good for nothing. Ashpedal must stop behind. There was no help for it. He did not know what he should do or which way he should turn. He became so sad that he got off the horse and sat down on the grass and began to cry. When he had sat a while, one of the tussock. Among the grass began to move, and out of it came a small white figure. As it came nearer, Ashpedal saw that it was a beautiful little girl, but she was so tiny, so very, very tiny. She went up to him and asked him if he would come below and pay a visit to the doll in the grass. Yes, that he would, and so he did. When he came down below, the doll in the grass was sitting in the chair, dressed very finely and looking still more beautiful. She asked Ashpedal where he was going and what was his errand. He told her they were twelve brothers, and that the king had given them each a horse and a suit of armor, and told them to go out in the world and find themselves wives. But they must all be able to spin and weave and make a shirt in a day. If you can do that and will become my wife, I will not travel any farther," said Ashpedal to the doll in the grass. Yes, that she would, and she set to work at once to get the shirt spun, woven, and made. But it was so tiny. So very, very tiny, no bigger than so. Ashpedal then returned home, taking the shirt with him. But when he brought it out, he felt very shy because it was so small. But the king said he could have her for all that, and you can imagine how happy and joyful Ashpedal became. The road did not seem so long to him as he set out to fetch his little sweetheart. When he came to the doll in the grass, he wanted her to sit with him, on his horse, but no, that she wouldn't. She said she would sit and drive in a silver spoon, and she had two small white horses, which would draw her. So they set out. He on his horse and she in a silver spoon, and the horses which drew her were two small white mice. Ash paddles always kept to one side of the road, for he was so afraid he should ride over her. She was so very very tiny. When they had travelled a bit on the way, they came to a large lake. There, Ashpedal's horse took fright and shied over to the other side of the road, and upset the spoon, so that the doll in the grass fell into the water. Ashpedal became very sad, for he did not know how he should get her out again. But after a while, a merman brought her up. But now. She had become just as big as any other grown-up being, and was much more beautiful than she was before. So he placed her in front of him on the horse and rode home. When Ashpedal got there, all his brothers had also returned, each with a sweetheart, but they were so ugly and ill-favored, and bad-tempered. That they had come to blows with their sweethearts on their way home. On their hats, they had hats which were painted with tar and soot, and this had run from their hats down their faces, so that they were still uglier and more ill-favored to behold. When the brothers saw Ashpedal's sweetheart, they all became envious of him. But the king was so pleased with Ashpedal and his sweetheart that he drove all the others away, 
and so Ashpaddle was married to the doll in the grass. And afterwards, they lived happy and comfortable for a long, long while. And if they are not dead, they must be still alive. End of the doll in the grass. Recording by Hui Jing. Story Seven of the Fairy Ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Fairy Ring. Edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story Seven, The Princess on the Glass Hill. Once upon a time, there was a man who had a meadow, which lay on the side of a mountain, and in the meadow there was a barn in which he stored hay. But there had not been much hay in the barn for the last two years, for every Saint John's Eve, when the grass was in the height of its vigour. It was all eaten clean up, just as if a whole flock of sheep had gnawed it down to the ground during the night. This happened once, and it happened twice. But then the man got tired of losing his crop, and said to his sons, he had three of them, and the third was called Cinderlad, that one of them must go and sleep in the barn on St. John's night, for it was absurd to let the grass be eaten up again blade and stalk as it had been the last two years and the one who went to watch must keep a sharp lookout the man said the eldest was quite willing to go to the meadow he would watch the grass he said and he would do it so well that neither man nor beast nor even the devil himself should have any of it so when evening came he went to the barn and lay down to sleep but when night was drawing near, there was such a rumbling and such an earthquake that the walls and roof shook again, and the lad jumped up and took to his heels as fast as he could, and never looked back. And the barn remained empty that year as it had been for the last two. Next St. John's Eve, the man again said he could not go on in this way, losing all the grass in the outlying field year after year and that one of his sons must go there and watch it and watch well too so the next oldest son was willing to show what he could do he went to the barn and lay down to sleep as his brother had done but when night was drawing near there was a great rumbling and then an earthquake which was even worse than that on the former st john's night and when the youth heard it he was terrified and went off running as if for a wager the year after it was cinderlad's turn but when he made ready to go the others laughed at him and mocked him well you are just the right one to watch the hay you who have never learnt anything but how to sit among the ashes and bake yourself said they cinderlad did not trouble himself about what they said but when evening drew near rambled away to the outlying field when he got there he went into the barn and lay down but in about an hour's time the rumbling and creaking began and it was frightful to hear it well if it gets no worse than that i can manage to stand it thought cinderlad in a little time the creaking began again and the earth quaked so that all the hay flew about the boy oh if it gets no worse than that i can manage to stand it thought cinderlad but then came a third rumbling and a third earthquake so violent that the boy thought the walls and roof had fallen down but when that was over everything suddenly grew as still as death around him i am pretty sure that it will come again thought cinderlad but no it did not everything was quiet and everything stayed quiet and when he had lain still a short time he heard something that sounded as if a horse were standing chewing just outside the barn door he stole away to the door which was ajar to see what was there and a horse was standing eating 
It was so big and fat and fine a horse that Cinderlad had never seen one like it before, and a saddle and bridle lay upon it, and a complete suit of armor for a knight, and everything was of copper, and so bright that it shone again. Ha, ha, ha! It is thou who eatest up our hay, then, thought the boy. But I will stop that. So he made haste and took out his steel for striking fire, and threw it over the horse, and then it had no power to stir from the spot, and became so tame that the boy could do what he liked with it. So he mounted it and rode away to a place which no one knew but himself, and there he tied it up. When he went home again, his brothers laughed and asked how he had got on. "'You didn't lie long in the barn, even if you have been so far as the field,' said they. "'I lay in the barn till the sun rose, but I saw nothing and heard nothing. Not I,' said the boy. "'Heaven knows what there was to make you two so frightened. "'Well, we shall soon see whether you have watched the meadow or not.' answered the brothers but when they got there the grass was all standing just as long and as thick as it had been the night before the next st john's eve it was the same thing once again neither of the two brothers dared to go to the outlying field to watch the crop but cinderlad went and everything happened exactly the same as on the previous st john's eve first there was a rumbling and an earthquake and then there was another and then a third, but all three earthquakes were much, very much more violent than they had been the year before. Then everything became still as death again, and the boy heard something chewing outside the barn door, so he stole as softly as he could to the door, which was slightly ajar, and again there was a horse standing close by the wall of the house, eating and chewing, and it was far larger and fatter than the first horse, and it had a saddle on its back, and a bridle was on it too, and a full suit of armour for a knight, all of bright silver, and as beautiful as any one could wish to see. Ho, ho, thought the boy, is it thou who eatest up our hay in the night? But I will put a stop to that. So he took out his steel for striking fire, and threw it over the horse's mane, and the beast stood there as quiet as a lamb. Then the boy rode this horse too away to the place where he kept the other, and then went home again. "'I suppose you will tell us that you have watched well again this time,' said the brothers. "'Well, so I have,' said Cinderlad. So they went there again, and there the grass was standing, as high and as thick as it had been before, but that did not make them any kinder to Cinderlad. When the third St. John's night came, neither of the two elder brothers dared to lie in the outlying barn to watch the grass, for they had been so heartily frightened the night that they had slept there that they could not get over it. But Cinderlad dared to go, and everything happened just the same as on the two former nights. There were three earthquakes, each worse than the other, and the last flung the boy from one wall of the barn to the other but then everything suddenly became still as death. When he had lain quietly a short time, he heard something chewing outside the barn door. Then he once more stole to the door, which was slightly ajar, and behold, a horse was standing just outside it, which was much larger and fatter than the two others he had caught. Ho, ho! It is thou, then, who art eating up our hay this time, thought the boy but I will put a stop to that. So he pulled out his steel for striking fire, and threw it over the horse, and it stood as still as if it had been nailed to the field. And the boy could do just what he liked with it. Then he mounted it and rode away to the place where he had the two others, and then he went home again. Then the two brothers mocked him just as they had done before, and told him that they could see that he must have watched the grass very carefully that night, for he looked just as if he were walking in his sleep. But Cinderlad did not trouble himself about that, but just bade them go to the field and see. 
they did go, and this time, too, the grass was standing, looking as fine and as thick as ever. The king of the country, in which Sindela's father dwelt, had a daughter, whom he would give to no one who could not ride up to the top of the glass hill, for there was a high, high hill of glass, slippery as ice, and it was close to the king's palace. Upon the very top of this the king's daughter was to sit with three golden apples in her lap, and the man who could ride up and take the three golden apples should marry her and have half the kingdom. The king had this proclaimed in every church in the whole kingdom, and in many other kingdoms too. The princess was very beautiful, and all who saw her fell violently in love with her, even in spite of themselves. So it is needless to say that all the princes and knights were eager to win her, and half the kingdom besides, and that for this cause they came riding thither from the very end of the world, dressed so splendidly that their raiments gleamed in the sunshine, and riding on horses which seemed to dance as they went. And there was not one of these princes who did not think that he was sure to win the princess. When the day appointed by the king had come, there was such a host of knights and princes under the glass hill that they seemed to swarm, and every one who could walk or even creep was there too, to see who won the king's daughter. Sindelad's two brothers were there, but they would not hear of letting him go with them, for he was so dirty and black with sleeping and grubbing among the ashes, that they said every one would laugh at them if they were seen in the company of such an oaf. "'Well, then, I will go alone by myself,' said Cinderlad. When the two brothers got to the glass hill, all the princes and knights were trying to ride up it, and their horses were in a foam. But it was all in vain, for no sooner did the horses set foot upon the hill than down they slipped, and there was not one which could get even so much as a couple of yards up. Nor was that strange, for the hill was as smooth as glass window panes, and as steep as the side of a house. But they were all eager to win the king's daughter, and half the kingdom. So they rode, and they slipped, and thus it went on. At length all horses were so tired that they could do no more, and so hot that the foam dropped from them and the riders were forced to give up the attempt. The king was just thinking that he would cause it to be proclaimed that the riding should begin afresh on the following day, when perhaps it might go better, when suddenly a knight came riding up on so fine a horse that no one had ever seen the like of it before, and the knight had armour of copper, and his bridle was of copper too, and all his accouterments were so bright that they shone again. The other knights all called out to him that he might just as well spare himself the trouble of trying to ride up the glass hill, for it was of no use to try. But he did not heed them, and rode straight off to it, and went up as if it were nothing at all. Thus he rode for a long way. It may have been a third part of the way up, but when he had got so far he turned his horse round and rode down again. But the princess thought that she had never yet seen so handsome a knight, and while he was riding up she was sitting thinking, Oh, how I hope he may be able to come up to the top! And when she saw that he was turning his horse back, she threw one of the golden apples down after him, and it rolled into his shoe. But when he had come down from off the hill, he rode away, and that so fast that no one knew what had become of him. So all the princes and knights were bidden to present themselves before the king that night, so that he who had ridden so far up the glass hill might show the golden apple which the king's daughter had thrown down. But no one had anything to show. One knight presented himself after the other, and none could show the apple. At night, too, Cinderlad's brothers came home again, and had a long story to tell about the riding up the glass hill. At first, they said, there was not one who was able to get even so much as one step up, but then came a knight who had armour of copper, and a bridle of copper, and his armour and trappings were so bright 
that they shone to a great distance, and it was something like a sight to see him riding. He rode one-third of the way up the glass hill, and he could easily have ridden the whole of it if he had liked, but he had turned back for he had made up his mind that that was enough for once. Oh, I should have liked to see him too, that I should, said Cinderlad, who was as usual sitting by the chimney among the cinders. You, indeed, said the brothers, you look as if you were fit to be among such great lords, dirty creature that you are to sit there. Next day the brothers were for setting out again, and this time, too, Cinderlad begged them to let him go with them and see who rode. But no, they said he was not fit to do that, for he was much too ugly and dirty. Well, well, then I will go all alone by myself, said Cinderlad. So the brothers went to the glass hill, and all the princes and knights began to ride again, and this time they had taken care to rough the shoes of their horses but that did not help them. They rode and they slipped as they had done the day before, and not one of them could even get so far as a yard up the hill. When they had tired out their horses so that they could do no more, they again had to stop altogether. But just as the king was thinking that it would be well to proclaim that the riding should take place next day for the last time, so that they might have one more chance, he suddenly bethought himself that it would be well to wait a little longer to see if the knight in copper armour would come on this day too, but nothing was to be seen of him. Just as they were still looking for him, however, came a knight riding on a steed that was much, much finer than that which the knight in copper armour had ridden, and this knight had silver armour and a silver saddle and bridle and all were so bright that they shone and glistened when he was a long way off. Again the other knights called to him and said that he might just as well give up the attempt to ride up the glass hill, for it was useless to try. But the knight paid no heed to that, but rode straight away to the glass hill, and went still farther up than the knight in copper armour had gone. But when he had ridden two-thirds of the way up, he turned his horse round and rode down again. The princess liked this knight still better than she had liked the other, and sat longing that he might be able to get up above, and when she saw him turning back she threw the second apple after him, and it rolled into his shoe, and as soon as he had got down the glass hill he rode away so fast that no one could see what had become of him. In the evening, when everyone was to appear before the king and princess, in order that he who had the golden apple might show it, one knight went in after the other, but none of them had a golden apple to show. At night the two brothers went home, as they had done the night before, and told how things had gone, and how everyone had ridden, but no one had been able to get up the hill. But last of all, they said, came one in silver armour, and he had a silver bridle on his horse, and a silver saddle, and, oh, but he could ride. He took his horse two-thirds of the way up the hill, but then he turned back. He was a fine fellow, said the brothers, and the princess threw the second golden apple to him. Oh, how I should have liked to see him too, said Cinderlad. Oh, indeed! He was a little brighter than the ashes that you sit grubbing among, you dirty black creature, said the brothers. On the third day everything went just as on the former days. Cinderlad wanted to go with them to look at the riding, but the two brothers would not have him in their company, and when they got to the glass hill there was no one who could ride even so far as a yard up it and every one waited for the knight in silver armour, but he was neither to be seen nor heard of. At last, after a long time, came a knight riding upon a horse that was such a fine one its equal had never yet been seen. The knight had golden armour and the horse a golden saddle and bridle, and these were all so bright that they shone and dazzled every one. 
even while the knight was still at a great distance. The other princes and knights were not able even to call to tell him how useless it was to try to ascend the hill, so amazed were they at the sight of his magnificence. He rode straight away to the glass hill, and galloped up it as if it were no hill at all, so that the princess had not even time to wish that he might get up the whole way. As soon as he had ridden to the top, he took the third golden apple from the lap of the princess, and then turned his horse about, and rode down again, and vanished from their sight before any one was able to say a word to him. When the two brothers came home again at night, they had much to tell of how the riding had gone off that day, and at last they told about the knight in the golden armour too. He was a fine fellow, that was. Such another splendid knight is not to be found on earth, said the brothers. Oh, how I should have liked to see him too, said Cinderlad. Well, he shone nearly as brightly as the coal heaps that thou art always lying raking among, dirty black creature that thou art, said the brothers. Next day all the knights and princes were to appear before the king and the princess. It had been too late for them to do it the night before, in order that he who had the golden apple might produce it. They all went in turn, first princes and then knights, but none of them had a golden apple. But somebody must have it, said the king, for with our own eyes we all saw a man ride up and take it. So he commanded that every one in the kingdom should come to the palace and see if he could show the apple. And one after the other they all came, but no one had the golden apple. And after a long, long time, Cinderlad's two brothers came likewise. They were the last of all. So the king inquired of them if there was no one else in the kingdom left to come. Oh, yes, we have a brother, said the two, but he never got the golden apple. He never left the cinder heap on any of the three days. Never mind that, said the king. As everyone else has come to the palace, let him come too. So Cinderlad was forced to go to the king's palace. Hast thou the golden apple? asked the king. Yes, here is the first, and here is the second, and here is the third too, said Cinderlad. And he took all the three apples out of his pocket and with that threw off his sooty rags, and appeared there before them in his bright golden armour, which gleamed as he stood. Thou shalt have my daughter and the half of my kingdom, and thou hast well earned both, said the king. So there was a wedding, and Cinderlad got the king's daughter, and every one made merry at the wedding, for all of them could make merry, though they could not ride up the glass hill. And if they have not left off their merrymaking, they must be at it still. End of the Princess on the Glass Hill Read by Lars Rolander Story 8 of The Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hui Jing. The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wigging and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 8. The Rain and the Pig Who Went Into the Woods. There was once upon a time a rain, who was being fattened up for killing. He had therefore plenty to eat, and he soon became round and fat with all the good things he got. One day the dairymaid came and gave him some more food. You must eat, Ram, she said. You will not be long here now, for tomorrow we are going to kill you. There's an old saying that no one should sneer at old woman's advice. And that advice and physic can be had for everything except death thought the rain to himself, but perhaps I might manage to escape it this time. 
and so he went on eating till he was full. And when he was quite satisfied, he ran his horn against the door, burst it open, and set off to the neighboring farm. There he made straight for the pig sty, to look for a pig with whom he had struck up an acquaintance on the common, since they had always been good friends and got on well together. Good day and thanks for your kindness. Last time we met, said the rain to the pig. Good day and thanks to you," said the pig. "Do you know why they make you so comfortable, and why they feed you and look after you so well?" said the rain. "No," said the pig. "There are many mouths to feed on this farm. You must know," said the rain. "They are going to kill you and eat you." "Are they?" said the pig. "Well, much good may it do them." If you are of the same mind as I, we will go into the woods and build a house and live by ourselves. There's nothing like having a home of your own, you know," said the rain. "Yes," the pig was quite willing. "It's nice to be in fine company," said he, and off they started. When they had got a bit on the way, they met a goose. Good day, my good people, and thanks for your kindness. Last time we met," said the goose. "Where are you off to?" "Good day, and thanks to you," said the rain. "We had it all together too comfortable at our place, so we are off to the woods to live by ourselves. In your own house, you are your own master, you know," said he. "Well, I'm very comfortable where I am," said the goose. "But why shouldn't I join you?" Good company makes the days shorter," said she. "But neither hut nor house can be built by gabbling and quacking," said the pig. "What do you think you can do? Good counsel and skill may do as much as a giant's will," said the goose. "I can pluck moss and stuff it into the crevices, so that the house will be warm and comfortable." Well, she might come with them," thought the pig. For he likes the place to be warm and cozy. When they had gone a bit on the way, the goose was not getting along very fast. They met a hare, who came scampering out of the wood. "Good day, my good people, and thanks for your kindness the last time we met," said the hare. "How far are you going today?" said he. "Good day, and thanks to you," said the ram. We had it all together too comfortable at our place, so we are off to the woods to build a house and live by ourselves. When you have tried both east and west, you'll find a home of your own. This, after all, the best," said he. "Well, I have, of course, a home in every bush," said the hare. "But I have often said to myself in the winter that if I live till the summer, I will build a house." So I have a good mind to go with you and build one after all," said he. "Well, if the worst comes to the worst, we might take you with us to frighten the dogs away," said the pig. "For you couldn't help us build the house, I should say. There is always something for willing hands to do in this world," said the hare. "I have teeth to gnaw pegs with, and I have paws to knock them into the walls." So I'll do very well for a carpenter, for good tools makes good work, as the man said, when he skinned his mare with an auger. Said the hare, "Well, he might come along with them, and help to build a house. There could be no harm in that." When they had got a bit farther on the way, they met a cock. "Good day, my good people." And thanks for your kindness. Last time we met," said the cock. "Where are you all going today?" he said. "Good day and thanks to you," said the rain. "We had it all together too comfortable at our place, so we are off to the woods to build a house and live by ourselves. For unless at home you bake, you'll lose both fuel and cake," said he. "Well, I'm comfortable enough where I am," said the cock. But it's better to have your own roost than to sit on the stranger's perch and crawl. And that cock is best off who has a home of his own," said he.
if I could join such fine company as yours, I too would like to go to the woods and build a house. Well, flapping and crowing is all very well for noise, but it won't cut the joists," said the pig. "You can't help us build a house," he said. "It is not well to live in a house where there is neither dog nor cock," said the cock. I'm early to rise and early to crow. Yes, early to rise makes one wealthy and wise. So let him come with us," said the pig. He was always the heaviest sleeper. Sleep is a big thief and steals half one's life," he said. So they all set off to the woods and build a house. The pig fell the trees and the rain dragged them home. The hare was the carpenter, and now packs and hammered them into walls and roof. The goose plucked moss and stuffed it into the crevices between the logs. The cock crew and took care that they did not oversleep themselves in the mornings. And when the house was ready and the roof covered with birch bark and thatched with turf, they could at least live by themselves. And they were all both happy and contented. It's pleasant to travel both east and west, but home is, after all, the best," said the rain. But a bit further into the wood, two wolves had their lair, and when they saw that a new house had been built hard by, they wanted to know what sort of folks they had got for neighbors, for they thought. A good neighbor is better than a brother in a foreign land, and it is better to live among good neighbors than to be known far and wide. So one of them made it his business to call there and ask for a light for his pipe. The moment he came inside the door, the rain rushed at him, and gave him such a butt with his horns that the wolf fell on his head into the hearth. The pig snapped and bit, the goose nipped and pecked, the cock flew up on the rafter and began to crow and cackle, and the hare became so frightened that he scampered and jumped around both high and low, and knocked and scrambled about from one corner of the room to the other. At last, the wolf managed to get out of the house. Well, to no one's neighbors is. To add to one's wisdom," said the wolf, who was waiting outside. "I suppose you had a grand reception, since you stayed so long. But what about the light? I don't see either pipe or smoke," said he. "Yes, that was a nice light I got, and a nice lot of people they were," said he, who had been inside. Such treatment I never met with before, but as you make your bed, so you must lie, and an unexpected guest must put up with what he gets," said the wolf. No sooner was I inside the door than the shoemaker threw his lash at me, and I fell on my head in the middle of the forge. There sat two smiths, blowing bellows and pinching. And snipping bits of flesh off me with red-hot tongs and pincers. The hunter rushed about the room looking for his gun, but as luck would have it, he couldn't find it. And up on the rafters sat someone beating his arms about and shouting, "Let's hook him! Let's hook him! Sling him up! Sling him up!" And if he had only got hold of me. I should never have come out alive. End of the rain and the pig who went into the woods. Recording by Hui Jing. Story nine of the fairy ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story Nine: The Troll's Hammer.
When a great famine prevails in a country, even the rich suffer. Hard indeed must the lot of the poor peasant be at such a time. During a famine, a poor peasant, unable to support all his family, told his eldest son, Niels, that he would have to go out in the world and provide for himself. Niels left home and went out to seek his fortune. As the evening of the first day drew on, he found himself in a dense forest, and fearing lest the wild beasts might do him harm during the night, he climbed into a tree. Hardly had he reached his perch when he saw a little man running toward the tree. He was hunchbacked and had crooked legs, a long beard, and wore on his head a red cap. He was pursued by a wolf which attacked him just under the tree in which Niels was sitting. The little man began to scream. He bit and scratched and defended himself as well as he could. But the wolf was stronger and would have torn the little fellow to pieces if Niels had not sprung down from the tree. As soon as the wolf saw that he had two to contend with, he fled back into the forest. The troll then said to Niels, Thou hast preserved my life and done me a good service. In return I shall give thee something that will be of use. See, here is a hammer with which thou shalt be able to do smith's work that no one shall be able to equal. When the troll had spoken these words, he sank into the ground and disappeared. The next day the boy wandered on until he came to the neighborhood of the royal palace, and there he engaged himself to a smith. Now it just happened that a few days before a thief had broken into the king's treasury and stolen a large bag of money. All the smiths in the city were therefore sent for to the palace, and the king promised that he who could make the best lock should be appointed court locksmith and have a handsome reward into the bargain. The lock had to be finished in eight days and so constructed that it could not be picked by any one. When the smith, with whom Niles lived, returned home and related this, the boy thought he should like to try whether his hammer really possessed those qualities which the troll had said. He therefore begged his master to allow him to make a lock, and promised that it should be finished by the appointed time. Although the smith had no great opinion of the boy's ability, he permitted the trial. Niels then requested a separate workshop, locked himself in, and began hammering the iron. One day went, and then another, and the master began to be curious. But Niels let no one come into his shop, and the smith was obliged to remain outside and peep through the keyhole. The work, however, succeeded far better than the boy himself had expected, and without really knowing how it came to pass, the lock was finished on the evening of the third day. The following morning he went down to his master and asked for some money. Yesterday I worked hard, said Niels, and today I will enjoy myself. He went out of the city and did not return to the workshop till late in the evening. The next day and the next he did the same, and so through the rest of the week. His master was very angry at this, and threatened to turn him away unless he finished his work at the appointed time. But Niles told him to rest easy, and engaged that his lock should be the best. When the day arrived, Niels brought his work forth, and carried it up to the palace. His lock was so ingenious and so delicately made, that it far excelled all the others. Niels's master was acknowledged as the most skillful, and he received the promised office and reward. The smith was delighted, but he took good care not to confess to any one who it was that had made the curious lock. He received one job after another from the king, and let Niels do them all. In the meantime, the report spread from place to place of the wonderful lock the king had got for his treasury. Travellers came from a distance to see it, and a foreign king came among them. When he had examined the work a long time, he said that the man who had made such a lock deserved to be honoured and respected. But however good a smith he may be, added the foreign king, I have his master at home. He continued boasting in this manner, till at length the two kings made a wager as to which smith could execute the most skilful piece of workmanship. The smiths were sent for, and the two kings determined that each smith should make a knife. The smith related to Niels what had passed, and desired him to try whether he could make as good a knife as the lock he had made. Niels promised to do so, although his last work had not brought him much. The smith was in truth a mean man, and treated Niles so niggardly that sometime he had not enough to eat and drink. 
One day, as he was out buying steel to make the knife, he met a man from his own village, and, in the course of conversation, Niels learned that his father was in great want and misery. Then he asked his master for some money, but this was the answer. "'You shall not have a shilling until you have made the knife.' Thereupon Niels shut himself up in the workshop for a whole day, and, as on the former occasion, the knife was made without knowing how it had happened. When the day arrived on which the work was to be exhibited, Niels dressed himself in his best clothes, and went with his master up to the palace where the two kings were expecting them. The strange smith first showed his knife. It was so beautiful and so curiously wrought that it was a pleasure to look at. It was, moreover, so sharp and well-tempered that it would cut through a millstone as easily as through cheese. Niels's knife, on the contrary, looked very poor and common. The king already began to think he had lost his wager, and spoke harshly to the master smith when his boy begged leave to examine the stranger's knife a little more closely. After having looked at it for some time, he said, this is a beautiful piece of workmanship which you have made, and shame on those who would say otherwise. But my master is, nevertheless, your superior, as you shall soon experience. Saying this, he took the stranger's knife and split it lengthwise from point to handle with his own knife as easily as one splits a twig of willow. The kings could scarcely believe their eyes, and the consequence was that Niles's master was declared the victor. When Niles asked for payment, the master refused to give him anything, although knowing full well that the poor boy only wanted the money to help his father. Upon this Niles grew very angry. He went to the king, and told who it was that had made both the lock and the knife. The master was then called, but he denied everything, and accused Niles of being an idle boy, whom he had taken into service out of charity and compassion. "'We shall soon find out the truth of this story,' said the king, who sided with the master. "'Since thou sayest it is thou who hast made this wonderful knife, and thy master says it is he who has done it, I will adjudge each of you to make a sword for me within eight days. He who can make the most perfect one shall be my master smith, but he who loses shall forfeit his life.' Niels was well satisfied with this agreement. He went home, packed up all his things, and bade his master farewell. The smith would gladly have made all good again, but Niels appeared not to understand him, and went on his way. He engaged with another master, and began cheerfully to work on the sword. When the appointed day arrived, both Niels and his former master met at the palace, and the master produced a sword of the most beautiful workmanship that any one could wish to see. It was inlaid with gold, and set with precious stones. The king was greatly delighted with it. "'Now, little Niels,' said he, "'what dost thou say to this sword?' "'It is not so badly made as one might expect from such a bungler,' said the boy. "'Canst thou show anything like it?' asked the king. "'I believe I can,' answered Niels. "'Well, where is thy sword?' said the king. "'In my waistcoat pocket,' replied Niels. Hereupon there was a general laugh which was increased when they saw the boy take a little packet out of his waistcoat pocket. Niels opened the paper in which... The blade was rolled up like a watch-spring. "'Here is my work,' said he. "'Will you just cut the thread, master?' The smith did it willingly, and in a moment the blade straightened out and struck him in the face. Niels took out of his pocket a hilt of gold and screwed it fast to the blade. Then he presented the sword to the king, and all present were obliged to confess that they never had before seen such matchless workmanship. Niels was declared the victor, and the master was obliged to acknowledge that the boy had made both the lock and the knife. The king, in his indignation, would have had the master put to death if the boy had not begged for mercy on the culprit. Niels received a handsome reward from the king, and from that day all the work from the palace was entrusted to him. He took his old father to reside with him, and lived in comfort and happiness till his death. End of the Troll's Hammer Story ten of the Fairy Ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Trishka. The Fairy Ring. Edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin 
and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 10. The Clever Print. Once upon a time there was a youthful print who was so wonderfully handsome that no one had ever seen his like, and he knew this, and was very glad of it. And everybody said that he was as clever as he was handsome, and that no one could be compared to him. Of this he was quite convinced, and he made a solemn vow that he would never take any woman to wife unless she was as handsome and nearly as clever as he was himself. If he could find such a paragon, he would marry her. There were many beautiful maidens in the land, but they were not the cleverest. There were also many maidens who were clever enough, but they were not the fairest. This is much as certain. The prince found no girl who combined in her person half enough good looks and wit to suit him. He was now of an age when he and his father, the king, and their faithful subjects, were all of an opinion that he ought to get married. But, as we have seen, because of the vow he had made, there was not a maiden in the land to whom he could play his addresses. So he determined to journey to other countries, and to travel incognito and unattended. He wanted to see things for himself and to have no one with him who could reveal anything about him. He travelled far and wide, from one land to another, but it fared with him abroad as it had fared with him at home. He could find no girl beautiful or clever enough for him, much less could he find one who could lay claim to the possession of both these attributes. So once more he felt his quest for a worthy bride had proved vain, and turned his face homeward. One day he was riding through a wood. He rode and rode, but still he could not get to the end of the forest. Noonday came, and evening came, and he was still in the wood, and still could see no way out of it. He had completely lost his way. He had no idea where he was, nor where he was going, nor where he should find shelter for the night and food and rest for himself and his horse. And they were both tired out. At last he saw a small cloud of blue smoke rising amid the green trees, and riding towards it he soon came to a little cottage, very poor and mean looking. But he was glad enough, for here at least he should find somebody. He got off his horse and knocked at the door. A poor old man opened it, and a poor old woman also came forward. They appeared very much astonished to see such a fine, handsome young knight. The prince, after wishing them good evening, said that he had lost his way, and that he had been riding through the wood all day long without coming to a dwelling of any kind, and now he begged them to give him shelter for the night. At first they said they were not the sort of people to receive such grand gentlefolk. It was easy to see they wanted to get rid of him. But when he told them that neither he nor his horse could hold out any longer, so greatly did they need rest and a night's lodging, the old couple had not the heart to refuse, so they agreed to take him if he would put up with what they could offer him. His first care was for his horse. The stable there was none, but there was a bit of a shed for the old people's cow. As it was summer time, the cow was out to grass, so the prince put his horse up in the shed and gave him a drink of water and a bundle of hay, to the great content of the poor, tired beast. Then he went into the cottage, which consisted of one little room, which was both dark and low. He sat down on a wooden bench and began to talk to the old people. Did they live here all alone in the wild wood? Yes, the old folks said, they did. There was nobody else in the house and there was no other house for miles and miles around. They got on as best they could, and managed to make a living out of their goat and their cow. Then the prince had his supper, the best the house could afford, a crust of dry bread and a bowl of milk. The old folk then fetched a wisp of straw and spread it out on the floor, intending to lie upon it. They had but one bed, and they meant to give it up to this grand guest, but the prince would not hear of such a thing. They should sleep in their own bed, and he would lie on the bundle of straw that was spread upon the floor. So it was arranged as he wished, 
and all three retired to rest. It was quite a different sort of couch from the one he was accustomed to, but he was thoroughly tired out, so he soon fell asleep, and he dreamt of all the beautiful maidens who were not clever enough, and of all the clever maidens who were not beautiful enough. And so he slept sweetly till the day began to dawn. Then he awoke, and stiff enough he was in all his limbs from lying on so hard a bed, twist and turn as he might, he could not get to sleep again. Presently he heard something stirring in the little loft overhead. It might be rats or mice, or perhaps a cat. Yes, it was certainly a cat. But a little while after he heard a whirring sound, exactly like a spinning wheel. Then he heard singing. And that could not be the cat, nor was it the song of the birds out in the wood. No. It was a woman's sweet voice keeping time with the whirring of the wheel. So sweet a song he had never heard before. He sprang to his feet, rubbed his eyes, pricked up his ears, and at the same moment the old folk got up too. The prince at once asked them who it was up there in the loft that had begun spinning and singing at the break of day. All was quite quiet overhead now, and the old people persisted, as they had the previous night that there was no one in the house but themselves. Nay, said the prince, there's no use trying to make me believe that. I prefer believing what I have heard with my own ears, and you may as well tell me the plain truth, for I am determined to learn it, one way or another. So then the old man made a clean breast of it. The prince was quite right. There was somebody else in the house. It was their daughter, in her little room up in the loft. They were so afraid lest someone should see her and want to take her away from them, for, indeed, they would miss her sadly, old and feeble as they were. She earned a few pence by her spinning and weaving. Who else was there to take care of them? Soon they would be no longer able to look after themselves. Well, the prince said he had heard her, and now he wanted to see her. He was no man-eater, nor woman eat her either, so far as he knew. Therefore they might surely let him see the maiden. So the old man had to go and call her, and she came running down, tripping along, clad in mean attire, so blithe and fresh and fair. When she saw the handsome young man, she blushed rosy red, and the prince was thunderstruck as he looked on her. Never had he seen anything half so lovely as she was. He was utterly at a loss what to say or do. In all his travels he had seen no one to be compared with her. This poor peasant's daughter was far more beautiful than all the princesses and grand ladies he had ever met at home or abroad. He could not picture to himself anything more lovely. But a poor beggar maid such as she was, he might not even dream of making his wife. So he turned resolutely away, and at once bestirred himself, getting his horse ready to start, and would not so much as allow himself to look at her again. But when he was in the saddle, just sitting off, as he nodded goodbye to the old folk, to whom he had given a broad gold piece for his night's lodging, and who were now bowing and scraping before him. He could not help giving a side glance to where she stood gazing at him with lovely, wondering eyes. And now, of course, he was obliged to lift his hat and bow farewell, and as she returned his greeting with downcast eyes and bowed and blushing face, the prince felt as if his heart were in his mouth. The lovely eyes looked up once more as he galloped off, and they followed him till he was out of sight. And not only did they follow him thus far, but long after he had left both house and wood far behind, those beautiful eyes still haunted him. And as he rode along he said to himself, Yes, she is beautiful, and more than beautiful enough for me, but I also vowed that she whom I marry must be as clever, or nearly as clever, as I am, and that, of course, she cannot be. 
He marked well where the little cottage stood, and soon he reached a road he knew well, for the wild wood lay on the very border of his own lands. He rode straight home to his father's castle, and told him he had not yet found anyone who could be considered his equal. The old king was much vexed on hearing this, but he was so certain of his son's exceeding cleverness that he had no doubt matters were exactly as the prince represented. He had but one wish, to see his son married before closing his eyes forever, and he had such faith in his son that he knew the prince's choice of a wife would be a wise one. So now the prince was at home once more, surrounded by all the good things imaginable, and yet he knew not one moment's certainty. Dainty food failed to tempt his appetite, no sweet sleep came to him on his downy couch. His thoughts were always with the fair young maiden who dwelt in the wild wood. He thought of her early and late, and whether he would or not. At last he said to himself, There must be an end of this. He called to mind his vow that the loveliest and cleverest girl should be his bride, and so, in order to be rid of all thought of her, he determined to convince himself that although the peasant's daughter might be beautiful enough, she was far from being clever enough for him. So he wrote a letter to her, enclosing two skeins of silk, and bidding her weave for him with them a pair of bear curtains. He sent off a royal courier at once, bidding him bring back an immediate answer. The messenger returned the same evening with a letter from the woodland maiden, and in the letter lay two splinters of wood. The maiden had written that if out of these bits of wood he would make her a loom, she would weave him the curtains he had ordered. After this the prince could no longer doubt that she was quite as clever as he was, and now he felt bound to perform the vow that he had made which was just what he most wished to do. So he rode forth with all his royal train to the cottage in the wild wood, and he told the old people that he had come to woo their daughter for his bride, if she were willing. And she was willing. The old folk were very downhearted at parting from their child, but they did not wish to stand in the way of her happiness, so they gave their consent. Then the court ladies clad the bride in scarlet and silk attire, and adorned her with gold and jewels. And she had ladies in waiting, and coaches and carriages, and all sorts of splendour. And the wedding was celebrated with joy and great magnificence. End of the Clever Prince. Recorded by Rachel Trishka. Story 11 of the Fairy Ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Fairy Ring. Edited by Kate Douglas Wigging and Nora Archibald Smith. STORY Eleven, LARS, MY LAD There was once a prince or a duke or something of that sort, but at any rate he belonged to a very grand family, and he would not stop at home. So he travelled all over the world, and wherever he went he was well liked, and was received in the best and gayest families, for he had no end of money. He made friends and acquaintances, as you may imagine, wherever he went, for he who has a well-filled trough is sure to fall in with pigs who want to have their fill. But he went on spending his money until he came to want, and at last his purse became so empty that he had not even a farthing left. And now there was an end to all his friends as well, for they behaved like the pigs when the trough was empty and he had no more to give them, they began to grunt and grin, and then they ran away in all directions. There he stood alone with a long face. Everybody had been so willing to help him get rid of his money, 
but nobody would help him without it and so there was nothing for it but to trudge home and beg for crusts on the way so late one evening he came to a great forest he did not know where he should find a shelter for the night but he went on looking and searching till he caught sight of an old tumble-down hut which stood in the middle of some bushes it was not exactly good enough for such a fine cavalier but when you cannot get what you want you must take what you can get and since there was no help for it he went into the hut not a living soul was to be seen there was not even a stool to sit upon but alongside the wall stood a big chest what could there be inside that chest if only there were some bits of mouldy bread in it how nice they would taste for you must know he had not had a single bit of food the whole day and he was so hungry and his stomach so empty that it groaned with pain he lifted the lid but inside the chest was another chest and inside that chest there was another and so it went on each one smaller than the other until they became quite tiny boxes the more there were the harder he worked away for there must be something very fine inside he thought since it was so well hidden at last he came to a tiny little box and in this box lay a bit of paper and that was all he got for his trouble it was very annoying of course but then he discovered there was something written on the paper and when he looked at it he was just able to spell it out although at first it looked somewhat difficult lars my lad as he pronounced these words something answered right in his ear what are master's orders he looked round but he saw nobody this was very funny he thought and so he read out the words once more lars my lad and the answer came as before what are master's orders but he did not see anybody this time either if there is anybody about who hears what i say then be kind enough to bring me something to eat he said and the next moment there stood a table laid out with all the best things one could think of he set to work to eat and drink and had a proper meal he had never enjoyed himself so much in all his life he thought when he had eaten all he could get down he began to feel sleepy and so he took out the paper again lars my lad what are master's orders well you have given me food and drink and now you must get me a bed to sleep in as well but i want a really fine bed he said for you must know he was a little more bold now that his hunger was stayed well there it stood a bed so fine and dainty that even the king himself might covet it now this was all very well in its way but when once you are well off you wish for still more and he had no sooner got into bed than he began to think that the room was altogether too wretched for such a grand bed so he took out the paper again lars my lad what are master's orders since you are able to get me such food and such a bed here in the midst of the wild forest i suppose you can manage to get me a better room for you see i am accustomed to sleep in a palace with golden mirrors and great walls and ornaments and comforts of all kinds he said well he had no sooner spoken the words than he found himself lying in the grandest chamber anybody had ever seen now he was comfortable he thought and felt quite satisfied as he turned his face to the wall and closed his eyes but that was not all the grandeur for when he woke up in the morning and looked round he saw it was a big palace he'd been sleeping in one room led into the other and wherever he went the place was full of all sorts of finery and luxuries both on the walls and on the ceilings and they glittered so much when the sun shone on them that he had to shade his eyes with his hand so strong was the glare of gold and silver wherever he turned he then happened to look out of the window good gracious how grand it was 
there was something else than pine forest and juniper bushes to look at for there was the finest garden any one could wish for with splendid trees and roses of all kinds but he could not see a single human being or even a cat and that you know was rather lonely for otherwise he had everything so grand and had been set up as his own master again so he took out the bit of paper lars my lad what are master's orders well now you have given me food and bed and a palace to live in i intend to remain here for i like the place he said yet i don't like to be quite by myself i must have both lads and lasses whom i may order about to wait on me he said and there they were there came servants and stewards and scullery maids and chambermaids of all sorts and some came bowing and some courtesying so now the duke thought he was really satisfied but no it happened that there was a large palace on the other side of the forest and there the king lived who owned the forest and the great big fields around it as he was walking up and down in his room he happened to look out through the window and saw the new palace where the golden weathercocks were swinging to and fro on the roof in the sunlight dazzling his eyes this is very strange he thought and so he called his courtiers they came rushing in and began bowing and scraping do you see the palace over there said the king they opened their eyes and began to stare yes of course they saw it who is that has dared to build such a palace on my grounds said the king they bowed and they scraped with their feet but they did not know anything about it the king then called his generals and captains they came stood at attention and presented arms be gone soldiers and troopers said the king and pull down the palace over there and hang him who has built it and don't lose any time about it well they set off in great haste to arm themselves and away they went the drummers beat the skins of their drums and the trumpeters blew their trumpets and the other musicians played and blew as best they could so that the duke heard them long before he could see them but he had heard this kind of noise before and knew what it meant so he took out his scrap of paper lars my lad what are master's orders there are soldiers coming here he said and now you must provide me with soldiers and horses that i may have double as many as those over in the wood and with sabres and pistols and guns and cannons with all that belongs to them but be quick about it and no time was lost for when the duke looked out he saw an immense number of soldiers who were drawn up around the palace when the king's men arrived they came to a sudden halt and dared not advance but the duke was not afraid he went straight up to the colonel of the king's soldiers and asked him what he wanted the colonel told him his errand it is of no use said the duke you see how many men i have and if the king will listen to me we shall become good friends and i will help him against his enemies and in such a way that it will be heard of far and wide he said the colonel was of the same opinion and the duke then invited him and all his soldiers inside the palace and the men had more than one glass to drink and plenty of everything to eat as well but while they were eating and drinking they began talking and the duke then got to hear that the king had a daughter who was his only child and was so wonderfully fair and beautiful that no one had ever seen her like before and the more the king's soldiers ate and drank the more they thought she would suit the duke for a wife and they went on talking so long that the duke at last began to be of the same opinion the worst of it said the soldiers is that she is just as proud as she is beautiful and will never look at a man but the duke laughed at this 
"'If that's all,' said the Duke, "'there's sure to be a remedy for that complaint.' When the soldiers had eaten and drunk as much as they could find room for, they shouted, "Hurrah!" so that it echoed among the hills, and then they set out homeward. But, as you may imagine, they did not walk exactly in parade order, for they were rather unsteady about the knees, and many of them did not carry their guns in regulation manner. The duke asked them to greet the king from him. He would call on him the following day, he said. When the duke was alone again, he began to think of the princess and to wonder if she were as beautiful and fair as they had made her out to be. He would like to make sure of it, and as so many strange things had happened that day, it might not be impossible to find that out as well, he thought. Lars, my lad? What are master's orders? Well, now you must bring me the king's daughter as soon as she has gone to sleep, he said. But she must not be awakened either on the way here or back. "'Do you hear that?' he said. And before long the princess was lying on the bed. She slept so soundly and looked so wonderfully beautiful as she lay there. Yes, she was as sweet as sugar, I can tell you. The duke walked round about her, but she was just as beautiful from whatever point of view he looked at her. The more he looked, the more he liked her. "'Lars, my lad?' what are master's orders you must now carry the princess home he said for now i know how she looks and to-morrow i will ask for her hand he said next morning the king looked out of the window i suppose i shall not be troubled with the sight of that palace any more he thought but sounds there it stood just as on the day before and the sun shone so brightly on the roof and the weathercocks dazzled his eyes. He now became furious and called all his men. They came quicker than usual. The courtiers bowed and scraped, and the soldiers stood at attention and presented arms. "'Do you see the palace there?' screamed the king. They stretched their necks and stared and gaped. "'Yes, of course, that they did.' "'Have I not ordered you to pull down the palace and hang the builder?' he said. Yes, they could not deny that. But then the colonel himself stepped forward and reported what had happened and how many soldiers the duke had and how wonderfully grand the palace was. And next he told him what the duke had said and how he had asked him to give his greetings to the king and all that sort of thing. The king felt quite confused and had to put his crown down on the table and scratch his head. He could not understand all this, although he was a king, for he could take his oath it had been all been built in a single night, and if the duke were not an evil one himself, he must in any case have done it by magic. While he sat pondering, the princess came into the room. "'Good morning to you, father,' she said. "'Just fancy, I had such a strange and beautiful dream last night,' she said. "'What did you dream, then, my girl?' said the king. "'I dreamt that I was in the new palace over yonder, and that I saw a duke there, so fine and handsome that I could never have imagined the like. And now I want to get married, father,' she said. "'Do you want to get married? You, who have never cared to look at a man?' "'That's very strange,' said the king. "'That may be,' said the princess. "'But it's different now. "'And I want to get married, and it is the duke I want,' she said. "'The king was quite beside himself. "'So frightened did he become of the duke. "'But all of a sudden he heard a terrible noise of drums and trumpets "'and instruments of all kinds. "'And then came a message that the duke had just arrived with a large company, all of whom were so grandly dressed that gold and silver glistened in every fold. The king put on his crown and his coronation robes, and then went out on the steps to receive them, and the princess was not slow to follow him. The duke bowed most graciously, and the king of course did likewise, and when they had talked a while about their affairs and their grandeur, they became the best of friends. A great banquet was then prepared, 
and the duke was placed next to the princess at the table. What they talked about is not easy to tell, but the duke spoke so well for himself that the princess could not very well say no to anything he said, and then he went up to the king and asked for her hand. The king could not exactly say no either, for he could very well see that the duke was a person with whom it was best to be on friendly terms, but give his sanction there and then he could not very well do that either. He wanted to see the duke's palace first, and find out about the state of affairs over there, as you may understand. So it was arranged that he should visit the duke, and take the princess with him to see his palace, and with this they parted company. When the duke returned home, Lars became busier than ever, for there was so much to attend to, but he set to work and strove hard, and when the king and his daughter arrived everything was so magnificent and splendid that no words can describe it. They went through all the rooms and looked about, and they found everything as it should be, and even still more splendid, thought the king, and so he was quite pleased. The wedding then took place, and that in grand style, and on the duke's arrival home with his bride he too gave a great feast, and then there was an end to the festivities. Some time passed by, and one evening the duke heard these words. Are you satisfied now? It was Lars, as you may guess, but the duke could not see him. Well, I ought to be, said the duke. You have provided me with everything I have, he said. Yes, but what have I got in return? asked Lars. Nothing, said the duke, but bless me, what could I have given you, who are not of flesh and blood, and whom I cannot see either, he said. But if there is anything I can do for you, tell me what it is, and I shall do it. Well, I should like to ask you for that little scrap of paper which you found in the chest, said Lars. Nothing else, said the duke. If such a trifle can help you, I can easily do without it for now I begin to know the words by heart, he said. Lars thanked the duke, and asked him to put the paper on the chair in front of the bed when he retired to rest, and he would be sure to fetch it during the night. The duke did as he was told, and so he and the princess lay down and went to sleep. But early in the morning the duke awoke and felt so cold that his teeth chattered, and when he had got his eyes quite open he found that he was quite naked and had not even as much as a thread on his back and instead of the ground bed and the beautiful bedroom and the magnificent palace he lay on the big chest in the old tumble-down hut he began to shout lars my lad but he got no answer he shouted once more lars my lad but he got no answer this time either so he shouted all he could, Lars, my lad! But it was all in vain. Now he began to understand how matters stood. When Lars had got the scrap of paper, he was freed from service at the same time, and now he had taken everything with him. But there was no help for it. There stood the duke in the old hut, quite naked, and as for the princess, she was not much better off, although she had her clothes on, for she had got them from her father, so Lars had no power over them. The duke had now to tell the princess everything, and ask her to leave him. He would have to manage as best as he could, he said, but she would not hear of it. She well remembered what the parson had said when he married them, and she would never, never leave him, she said. In the meantime the king in his palace had also awakened, and when he looked out of the window he did not see any sign whatever of the other palace where his daughter and son-in-law lived. He became uneasy, as you may imagine, and called his courtiers. They came in and began to bow and scrape. "'Do you see the palace over yonder, behind the forest?' he asked. They stretched their necks and stared with all their might. No, they did not see it. "'Where had it gone, then?' asked the king. 
Well, really, they did not know. It was not long before the king set out with all his court through the forest, and when he arrived at the place where the palace with the beautiful gardens should have been, he could not see anything but heather and juniper bushes and firs. But then he discovered the old tumble-down hut which stood there among the bushes. He entered the hut and, mercy on us, what a sight met his eyes. There stood his son-in-law quite naked, and his daughter, who had not very many clothes on either, and who was crying and moaning. "'Dear, dear, what does all this mean?' said the king. But he did not get any answer, for the duke would rather have died than tell him. The king did his utmost to get him to speak, but in spite of all the king's promises and threats, the duke remained obstinate and would not utter a word. The king then became angry, and no wonder, for now he could see that this grand duke was not what he pretended to be, and so he ordered the duke to be hanged, and that without any loss of time. The princess begged and prayed for mercy, but neither prayers nor tears were of any help now for an impostor he was, and as an impostor he should die, said the king, and so it had to be. They erected a gallows, and placed the rope round the duke's neck. But while they were getting the gallows ready, the princess got hold of the hangman, and gave both him and his assistant some money, that they should so manage the hanging of the duke, that he should not lose his life and in the night they were to cut him down, so that he and the princess might then flee the country. And that's how the matter was arranged. In the meantime they had strung up the duke, and the king and his court and all the people went their way. The duke was now in great straits. He had, however, plenty of time to reflect how foolish he had been in not saving some of the scrums when he was living in plenty and how unpardonably stupid he had been in letting Lars have the scrape of paper. This vexed him more than all. If only he had it again, he thought, they should see he had been gaining some sense in return for all he had lost. But it is of little use snarling if you haven't got any teeth. Ah, well, well, he sighed, and so he dangled his legs, which was really all he could do. The day passed slowly and tediously for him, and he was not at all displeased when he saw the sun setting behind the forest. But just before it disappeared he heard a fearful shouting, and when he looked down the hill he saw seven cartloads of worn-out shoes, and on the top of the hindmost cart he saw a little old man in grey clothes, and with a red-pointed cap on his head. His face was like that of the worst scarecrow, and the rest of him was not very handsome either. He drew straight up to the gallows, and when he arrived right under it, he stopped and looked up at the duke, and then burst out laughing, the ugly old fellow. "'How stupid you were!' he said. But what should the fool do with his stupidity if he did not make use of it? And then he laughed again. Yes, there you are hanging now, and here am I carting away all the shoes I have worn out for your whims. I wonder if you can read what is written on this bit of paper, and if you recognize it, he said with an ugly laugh, holding up the paper before the duke's eyes. But all who hang are not dead, and this time it was Lars who was befooled. The duke made a clutch and snatched the paper from him. Lars, my lad, what are master's orders? Well, you must cut me down from the gallows and put the palace and all the rest in its place again, exactly as it was before, and when the night has set in you must bring back the princess. All went merrily as in a dance, and before long everything was in its place, just as it was when Lars took himself off. When the king awoke the next morning, he looked out of the windows, as was his custom, and there stood the palace again, with the weathercocks glittering so beautifully in the sunshine. 
He called his courtiers, and they came and began to bow and scrape. They stretched their necks as far as they could, and stared and gaped. "'Do you see the palace over there?' said the king. "'Yes, of course they did.' The king then sent for the princess, but she was not to be found. He then went out to see if his son-in-law was still hanging on the gallows, but neither son-in-law nor gallows was to be seen. He had to lift off his crown and scratch his head, but that did not improve matters. He could not make head or tail of either one thing or the other. He set off at once with all his court through the forest, and when he came to the place where the palace should stand, there it stood, sure enough. The garden and the roses were exactly as they used to be, and the duke's people were to be seen everywhere among the trees. His son-in-law and his daughter received him on the steps, dressed in their finest clothes. "'Well, I never saw the like of this,' said the king to himself. He could scarcely believe his own eyes, so wonderful did it all seem to him. "'God's peace be with you, father, and welcome here,' said the duke. The king stood staring at him. "'Are you my son-in-law?' he asked. "'Well, I suppose I am,' said the duke. "'Who else should I be?' "'Did I not order you to be hanged yesterday, like any common thief?' said the king. "'I think you must have been bewitched on the way,' said the duke with a laugh. "'Do you think I am the man to let myself be hanged? "'Or is there anyone here who dares to believe it?' he said, and looked so fiercely at the courtiers that they felt as if they were being pierced through and through. They bowed and scraped and cringed before him. Who could believe such a thing? Was it at all likely? Well, if there is anyone who dares to say the king could have wished me such evil, let him speak out, said the duke, and fixed his eyes upon them still more fiercely than before. Then they went on bowing and scraping and cringing. How could anyone dare say such a thing? No, they had more sense than that, they should hope. The king did not know what to believe, for when he looked at the duke he thought he never could have wished him such evil, but still he was not quite convinced. "'Did I not come here yesterday, and was not the whole palace gone, and was there not an old hut in its place? And did not I go into that hut, and did not you stand stark naked right before my eyes?' he asked. "'I wonder the king can talk so,' said the duke. "'I think the trolls must have bewitched your eyes in the forest "'and made you quite crazy. "'Or what do you think?' he said, and turned round to the courtiers. "'They bowed and bowed till their backs were bent double, "'and agreed with everything he said. "'There could be no mistake about that. "'The king rubbed his eyes and looked round about him. "'I suppose it is as you say, then,' he said to the duke, "'and it is well I have got back my proper sight "'and have come to my senses again, "'for it would have been a sin and a shame "'if I had let you be hanged,' he said. "'And so he was happy again, "'and nobody thought any more about the matter. "'Once bitten, twice shy, as the proverb says.' and the duke now took upon himself to manage and look after most of his affairs, so that it was seldom Lars had to wear out his shoes. The king soon gave the duke half the kingdom into the bargain, so he had now plenty to do, and people said they would have to search a long time to find his equal in wise and just ruling. Then one day Lars came to the duke, looking very little better than the first time he had seen him. But he was, of course, more humble, and did not dare jiggle and make grimaces. "'You do not want my help any longer now,' he said, "'for although I did wear out my shoes at first, I am now unable to wear out a single pair, and my feet will soon be covered all over with moss.' "'So I thought I might now get my leave of absence,' he said. The duke quite agreed with him. 
"'I have tried to spare you, and I almost think I could do without you,' he said. "'But the palace and all the rest I do not want to lose. "'For such a clever builder as you I shall never get again, "'nor do I ever want to adorn the gallows again, as you can well understand. "'So I cannot give you back the paper on any account,' he said. "'Well, as long as you have got it, I need not fear.' said lars but if anybody else should get hold of it there will be nothing but running and trudging about again and that's what i want to avoid for when one has been tramping about for a thousand years as i have done one begins to get tired of it he said but they went on talking and at last they agreed that the duke should put the paper in the box and then bury it seven ells under the ground under a stone fixed in the earth. Then they gave mutual thanks for the time they had spent in each other's company, and so they parted. The duke carried out his part of the agreement, for he was not likely to want to change it. He lived happy and contented with the princess, and they had both sons and daughters. When the king died, he got the whole of the kingdom, and you may guess he was none the worse off for that. And there, no doubt, he still lives and reigns, if he's not dead. But, as for the box with the scrap of paper in it, there are many who are still running about looking for it. End of Lars, my lad. Read by Lars Rolander. Story 12 of The Fairy Ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Fairy Ring. Edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 12. Twigmontus, Cowbellyantus, Perchnosius. Once upon a time there was a king who was so very learned that no parson in the whole world could surpass him. In fact, he was so learned that ordinary folks could hardly understand what he said, nor could he understand them either. But in order to have someone to talk with, he procured seven wise professors, who were not quite so learned as himself, but who were just able to interpret his learned sayings so that people could apprehend them and who could twist and turn about the talk of ordinary folk, so that it became sufficiently learned and complicated for the king to understand it. The king had no son, but he had a daughter, and in order that she should be happily married, and the country governed according to the fundamental principles of his learning, he issued an edict that he who was so learned as to put the king and his professors to silence should have his daughter and half the kingdom there and then but any one who attempted the task and did not succeed should lose his head for having dared to exchange words with the king that was no joke but the princess was so fair and beautiful that it was no joke to gaze at her either and the king did not keep her caged up for any one who wished could see her there came princes and counts and barons and parsons and doctors and learned persons from all quarters of the world and no sooner did they see the princess than they one and all wanted to try their luck. But however learned they were, their learning never proved sufficient, and every one of them lost his head. Over in the corner of the kingdom there lived a farmer who had a son. This lad was not stupid, he was quick of apprehension and sharp-witted, and he was not afraid of anything. When the king's edict came to this out-of-the-way place, and the parson had read it from the pulpit, the lad wanted to try his luck. He who nothing risks, nothing wins, thought the lad, and so he went to the parson and told him that if he would give him lessons in the evenings, he would work for this worship in the daytime, but he wanted to become so learned that he could try a bout with the king and his professors. Whoever means to compete with them must be able to do something more than munch bread, said the parson. That may be, said the lad, but I'll try my luck. The parson thought, of course, that he was mad. But when he could get such a clever hand to work for him, only for his keep, he thought he could not very well say no, and so the lad got what he wanted. He worked for the parson in the daytime, and the parson read with him in the evening, and in this way they went on for some time, but at last the lad grew tired of his books. 
"'I am not going to sit here and read and grind away "'and lose what few wits I have,' he said. "'And it won't be of much help either, "'for if you are lucky things will come right of themselves, "'and if you are not lucky you'll never make a silk purse out of a sow's ear.' "'And with this he pitched the books on the shelf and went his way. "'All at once he came to a large forest, "'where the trees and the bushes were so thick "'that it was with difficulty he could get along.' While he was thus pushing his way through, he began wondering what he should say when he came to the king's palace, and how best he could make use of the learning he had picked up from the parson. All of a sudden the twig of a tree trunk struck him across the mouth, so that his teeth rattled. "'That is Twig Muntus,' he said. A little while after he came to a meadow where a cow was standing, bellowing so furiously that it almost deafened him. "'That is Cowbellyantus,' he said. He then came to a river, but as there was neither bridge nor planks across it, he had to put his clothes on his head and swim across. While he was swimming, a perch came and bit him on the nose. "'That is Perch Nosius,' he said. At last he came to the king's palace, where things did not look at all pleasant, for there were men's heads stuck on long stakes round about, and they grinned so horribly that they were enough to frighten anyone out of his wits.' but the lad was not easily frightened. "'God's peace,' he said, and raised his cap. "'There you stick and grin at me, but who knows if I may not be keeping you company before the day is over, and be grinning with you at others. But if I happen to be alive, you shall not stick there any longer gaping at people,' he said. So he went up to the palace and knocked at the gate. The guard came out and asked what he wanted. "'I have come to try my luck with the princess,' said the lad." You, said the guard, well, you're a likely one you are. Have you lost your senses? There have been princes and counts and barons and parsons and doctors and learned persons here, and all of them have had to pay with their heads for that pleasure. And yet you think you'll succeed, he said. I should say it is no concern of yours, said the lad. Just open the gate, and you'll see one who's not afraid of anything. But the guard would not let him in. "'Do as I tell you,' said the lad, "'or there'll be a fine to-do.' But the guard would not. The lad then seized him by the collar and flung him against the wall so that it creaked, and then he walked straight in to the king, who sat in his parlour with his seven professors about him. Their faces were long and thin, and they looked like puny, sickly persons about to die. They were sitting with their heads on one side, meditating and staring at the floor. Then one of them, who looked up, asked the lad in ordinary language, "'Who are you?' "'A suitor,' said the lad. "'Do you want to try for the princess's hand?' "'Well, that's about it,' said the lad. "'Have you lost your wits? There have been princes and counts and barons and parsons and doctors and learned persons here, and all of them have gone headless away. So you had better turn about and get away while your head is on your shoulders,' he said." "'Don't trouble yourself on that account, but rather think of the head on your own shoulders,' said the lad. "'You look after yours, and I'll take care of mine. So just begin, and let me hear how much wit you have got, for I don't think you look so very clever,' he said. The first professor then began a long harangue of gibberish, and when he had finished the second went on, and then the third, and in this way they continued till at length it was the turn of the seventh. The lad did not understand a single word of it all, but he didn't lose courage for all that. He only nodded his approval to all of it. When the last had finished his harangue, he asked, "'Can you reply to that?' "'That's easy enough,' said the lad. "'Why, when I was in my cradle and in my go-cart, I could twist my mouth about and prate and jabber like you,' he said. "'But since you are so terribly learned, I'll put a question to you, and that shall not be a long one.' Twigmuntus, Cowbellyantus, Perchnosius. Can you give me an answer to that? And now you should have seen how they stretched their necks and strained their ears. They put on their spectacles and began to look into their books and turn over the leaves. But while they were searching and meditating, the lad put his hands in his trousers pockets and looked so frank and fearless that they could not help admiring him and wondering that one who was so young could be so learned and yet look just like other people. "'Well, how are you getting on?' said the lad. "'Cannot all your learning help you to open your mouths, "'so that I can have an answer to my question?' he said. 
Then they began to ponder and meditate, and then they glanced at the ceiling, and then they stared at the walls, and then they fixed their eyes upon the floor. But they could not give him any answer, nor could the king himself, although he was much more learned than all the others together. They had to give it up, and the lad got the princess and half the kingdom. This he ruled in his own way, and if it did not fare better, it did not fare worse for him than for the king with all his fundamental principles. End of Twigmontus Cowbelliantus Perchnosius Story 13 of the Fairy Ring This is LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vero Nasser. The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 13. Master Tobacco. Once upon a time, there was a poor woman who went about begging with her son. For at home, she had neither a morsel to eat nor a stick to burn. First she tried the country, and went from parish to parish, but it was poor work, and so she came into the town. There she went about from house to house for a while, and at last she came to the Lord Mayor. He was both open-hearted and open-handed, and he was married to the daughter of the richest merchant in the town, and they had one little daughter. As they had no more children, you may fancy she was sugar and spice and all that's nice, and in a word there was nothing too good for her. This little girl soon came to know the beggar boy as he went about with his mother. And as the Lord Mayor was a wise man, as soon as he saw what friends the two were, he took the boy into his house that he might be his daughter's playmate. Yes, they played and read and went to school together, and never had so much as one quarrel. One day the lady mayoress stood at the window, and watched the children as they were trudging off to school. There had been a shower of rain, and the street was flooded, and she saw how the boy first carried the basket with their dinner over the stream, and then he went back and lifted the little girl over, and when he set her down he gave her a kiss. When lady mayoress saw this, she got very angry. To think of such a ragamuffin kissing our daughter, we who are the best people in the place, that was what she said. Her husband did his best to stop her tongue. No one knew, he said, how children would turn out in life, or what might befall his own. The boy was a clever, handy lad, and often and often a great tree sprang from a slender plant. But no. It was all the same, whatever he said and whichever way he put it. The lady mayoress held her own, and said beggars on horseback always rode their cattle to death, and that no one had ever heard of a silk purse being made out of a sow's ear, adding that a penny would never turn into a shilling even though it glittered like a guinea. The end of it all was that the poor lad was turned out of the house and had to pack up his rags and be off. When the Lord Mayor saw there was no help for it, he sent him away with a trader who had come thither with a ship, and he was to be a cabin boy on board her. He told his wife he had sold the boy for a roll of tobacco. But before he went, the Lord Mayor's daughter broke her ring into two bits, and gave the boy one bit, that it might be a token to know him by if they ever met again. And so the ship sailed away, and the lad came to a town far, far off in the world. And to that town a priest had just come who was so good a preacher that everyone went to church to hear him. And the crew of the ship went with the rest the Sunday after to hear the sermon. As for the lad, he was left behind to mind the ship and to cook dinner. So while he was hard at work, he heard someone calling out across the water on an island. So he took the boat and rowed across, and there he saw an old hag who called and roared. Hey, she said, you have come at last. 
here have I stood a hundred years calling and bowling, and thinking how I should ever get over this water. But no one has ever heard or heeded but you, and you shall be well paid if you will put me over to the other side. So the lad had to row her to her sister's house, who lived on a hill on the other side close by. And when they got there, she told him to beg for the old tablecloth which lay on the dresser. Yes, he would beg for it, and when the old witch who lived there knew that he had helped her sister over the water, she said he might have whatever he chose to ask. Oh, said the boy, then I won't have anything else than that old tablecloth on the dresser yonder. Oh, said the old witch, that you never asked out of your own wits. Now I must be off, said the lad, to cook the Sunday dinner for the church-goers. Never mind that, said the first old hag. It will cook itself while you are away. Stop with me, and I will pay you better still. Here have I stood and called and bawled for a hundred years, but no one has ever heeded me but you. The end was he had to go with her to another sister, and when he got there, the old hag said he was to be sure and ask for the old sword, which was such that he could put it into his pocket and it became a knife, and when he drew it out, it was a long sword again. One edge was black and the other was white, and if he smote with the black edge, everything fell dead, and if with the white, everything came to life again. So when they came over, and the second old witch heard how he had helped her sister across, she said he might have anything he chose to ask for her fare. Oh, said the lad, then I will have nothing else but the old sword which hangs over the cupboard. That you never asked out of your own wits, said the old witch, but for all that he got that sword. Then the old hag said again, Come on with me to my third sister. Here have I stood and called and bawled for a hundred years, and no one has heeded me but you. Come unto my third sister, and you shall have better pay still. So he went with her, and on the way she told him he was to ask for the old hymn book, and that was such a book that when anyone was sick and the nurse sang one of the hymns, the sickness passed away, and they were well again. Well, when they got across, and the third old witch heard he had helped her sister across, she said he was to have whatever he chose to ask for his fare. Oh, said the lad, then I won't have anything else but Granny's old hen book. That, said the old hag, you never asked out of your own wits. When he got back to the ship, the crew was still at church, so he tried his tablecloth, and spread just a little bit of it out, for he wanted to see what good it was before he laid it on the table. Yes. In a trice it was covered with good food and strong drink, enough and to spare. So he just took a little snack, and then he gave the ship's dog as much as it could eat. When the churchgoers came on board, the captain said, Wherever did you get all that food for the dog? Why, he's as round as a sausage and as lazy as a snail. Oh, if you must know, said the lad, I gave him the bones. Good boy, said the captain, to think of the dog. So he spread out the cloth, and once the whole table was covered all over with such brave meat and drink as they had never before seen in all their born days. Now when the boy was again alone with the dog, he wanted to try the sword, so he smote at the dog with the black edge, and it fell dead on the deck. But when he turned the blade and smote with the white edge, the dog came to life again and wagged his tail and fawned on his playmate. But the book, that he could not get tried just then. Then they sailed well and far, till a storm overtook them which lasted many days. So they lay to and drove till they were quite out of their course, and could not tell where they were. At last the wind fell, and then they came to a country far, far off that none of them knew. They could easily see there was great grief there, as well there might be, for the king's daughter was a leper. The king came down to the shore, and asked was there any one on board who could cure her and make her well again no there was not that was what they all said who were on deck is there no one else on board the ship than those i see asked the king yes there's a little beggar boy well said the king let him come on deck so when he came and heard what the king wanted 
he said he thought he might cure her and then the captain got so wroth and mad with rage that he ran round and round like a squirrel in a cage for he thought the boy was only putting himself forward to do something in which he was sure to fail and he told the king not to listen to such childish chatter but the king only said that wit came as children grew and that there was the making of a man in every bairn the boy had said that he could do it and he might as well try after all there were many who had tried and failed before him so he took him home to his daughter and the lad sang a hymn once then the princess could lift her arm once again he sang it and she could sit up in bed and when he had sung it thrice the king's daughter was as well as you and i are the king was so glad he wanted to give him half his kingdom and the princess to wife yes said the lad land and power are fine things to have half of and was very grateful but as for the princess he was betrothed to another he said and he could not take her to wife so he stayed there a while and got half the kingdom and when he had not been very long there war broke out and the lad went out to battle with the rest and you may fancy he did not spare the black edge of his sword the enemy soldiers fell before him like flies and the king won the day but when they had conquered he turned the white edge and they all rose up alive and became the king's soldiers who had granted them their lives but then there were so many of them that they were badly off for food though the king wished to send them away full both of meat and drink so the lad had to bring out his tablecloth and then there was not a man that lacked anything now when he had lived a little longer with the king he began to long to see the lord mayor's daughter so he fitted out four ships of war and set sail and when he came off the town where the lord mayor lived he fired off his cannon like thunder till half the panes of glass in the town were shivered on board those ships everything was as grand as in a king's palace and as for himself he had gold on every seam of his coat so fine he was it was not long before the lord mayor came down to the shore and asked if the foreign lord would not be so good as to come up and dine with him yes he would go he said and so he went up to the mansion house where the lord mayor lived and there he took his seat between the lady mayoress and her daughter so as they sat there in the greatest state and ate and drank and were merry he threw the half of the ring into the daughter's glass and no one saw it but she was not slow to find out what he meant and excused herself from the feast and went out and fitted his half to her half her mother saw there was something in the wind and hurried after her as fast as she could do you know who that is in there mother said the daughter no said the lady mayoress he whom papa sold for a roll of tobacco said the daughter at these words the lady mayoress fainted and fell down flat on the floor in a little while the lord mayor came out to see what was the matter and when he heard how things stood he was almost as uneasy as his wife there is nothing to make a fuss about said master tobacco i have only come to claim the little girl i kissed as we were going to school but to the lady mayoress he said you should never despise the children of the poor and needy for none can tell how they may turn out since there is the making of a man in every child of man and wit and wisdom come with growth and strength end of master tobacco recording by Vero nasser story 14 of the fairy ring this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vero Nasser. The Fairy Ring Edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith Story 14 The History of Tom Thumb In the days of the great Prince Arthur, there lived a mighty magician, called Merlin, the most learned and skillful enchanter the world has ever seen. This famous magician, 
who could take any form he pleased, was travelling about as a poor beggar, and being very tired, he stopped at the cottage of a ploughman to rest himself and asked for some food. The countryman bade him welcome, and his wife, who was a very good-hearted woman, soon brought him some milk in a wooden bowl, and some coarse brown bread on a platter. Merlin was much pleased by the kindness of the ploughman and his wife, but he could not help noticing that though everything was neat and comfortable in the cottage, they both seemed to be very unhappy. He therefore asked them why they were so melancholy, and learned that they were miserable because they had no children. The poor woman said, with tears in her eyes, I should be the happiest creature in the world if I had a son. Although he was no bigger than my husband's thumb, I would be satisfied. Merlin was so much amused with the idea of a boy no bigger than a man's thumb that he determined to grant the poor woman's wish. Accordingly, in a short time after, the ploughman's wife had a son, who, wonderful to relate, was not a bit bigger than his father's thumb. The queen of fairies, wishing to see the little fellow, came in at the window while the mother was sitting up in the bed admiring him. The queen kissed the child and, giving it the name of Tum Thumb, sent for some of the fairies who dressed her little godson according to her orders. An oak leaf hat he had for his crown, his shirt of web by spider spun, with jacket wove of thistles down, his trousers wear of feathers done, his stockings of apple rind they tie, with eyelash from his mother's eye. His shoes were made of mouse's skin, tanned with the downy hair within. Tom never grew any larger than his father's thumb, which was only of ordinary size, but as he got older he became very cunning and full of tricks. When he was old enough to play with the boys and had lost all his own cherry stones, he used to creep into the bags of his playfellows, fill his pockets, and, getting out without their noticing him, would again join in the game. One day, however, as he was coming out of a bag of cherry stones, where he had been stealing as usual, the boy to whom it belonged chanced to see him. Ah, ah, my little Tommy, said the boy, so I have caught you stealing my cherry stones at last, and you shall be rewarded for your thievish tricks. On saying this, he drew the string tight round his neck and gave the back such a hearty shake that poor little Tom's legs, thighs, and body were sadly bruised. He roared loud with pain and begged to be let out, promising never to steal again. A short time afterwards his mother was making a batter pudding, and Tom, being very anxious to see how it was made, climbed up to the edge of the bowl, but his foot slipped and he plumped over head and ears into the batter, without his mother noticing him, who stared him into the pudding bag and put him in the pot to boil. The batter filled Tom's mouth and prevented him from crying, but, unfeeling the hot water, he kicked and struggled so much in the pot that his mother thought that the pudding was bewitched, and, pulling it out of the pot, she threw it outside the door. Poor Tinker, who was passing by, lifted up the pudding and, then putting it into his budget, walked off. As Tom had now got his mouth cleared of the batter, he then began to cry aloud, which so frightened the tinker that he flung down the pudding and ran away. The pudding being broken to pieces by the fall, Tom crept out, covered all over with the batter, and walked home. His mother, who was very sorry to see her darling in such woeful state, put him into a teacup and soon washed off the batter, after which she kissed him and laid him in bed. Soon after the adventure of the pudding, Tom's mother went to milk her cow in the meadow, and she took him along with her. As the wind was very high, for fear of being blown away, she tied him to a thistle with a piece of fine thread. The cow soon observed Tom's oak leaf hat, and liking the appearance of it, took poor Tom and the thistle at one mouthful. While the cow was chewing the thistle, Tom was afraid of her great teeth, which threatened to crush him in pieces, and he roared out as loud as he could, Mother! Mother! Where are you, Tommy, my dear Tommy? said his mother. Here, mother, replied he, in the red cow's mouth. 
his mother began to cry and wring her hands but the cow surprised at the odd noise in her throat opened her mouth and let tom drop out fortunately his mother caught him in her apron as he was falling to the ground where he would have been dreadfully hurt she then put tom in her bosom and ran home with him tom's father made him a whip of a barley straw to drive the cattle with and having one day gone into the fields tom slipped a foot and rolled into the furrow a raven which was flying over picked him up and flew with him over the sea and there dropped him a large fish swallowed tom the moment he fell into the sea which was soon after caught and bought for the table of king arthur when they opened the fish in order to cook it every one was astonished at finding such a little boy and tom was quite delighted at being free again they carried him to the king who made tom his dwarf and he soon grew a great favorite at court for by his tricks and gambles he not only amused the king and queen but also all the knights of the round table it is said that when the king rode out on horseback he often took tom along with him and if a shower came up on he used to creep into his majesty's waistcoat pocket where he slept till the rain was over king arthur one day asked tom about his parents wishing to know if they were as small as he was and whether they were well off tom told the king that his father and mother were as tall as anybody about the court but in rather poor circumstances on hearing this the king carried tom to his treasury the place where he kept all his money and told him to take as much money as he could carry home to his parents which made the poor little fellow caper with joy tom went immediately to procure a purse which was made of a water bubble and then returned to the treasury where he received a silver three-penny piece to put into it our little hero had some difficulty in lifting the burden upon his back but he at last succeeded in getting it placed to his mind and set forward on his journey however without meeting with any accident and after resting himself more than a hundred times by the way in two days and two nights he reached his father's house in safety tom had traveled forty-eight hours with a huge silver piece on his back and was almost tired to death when his mother ran out to meet him and carried him into the house but he soon returned to court as tom's clothes had suffered much in the batter pudding and the inside of the fish his majesty ordered him a new suit of clothes and to be mounted as a knight on a mouse of butterflies wings his shirt was made his boots of chicken's hide and by a nimble fairy blade well learned in the tailoring trade his clothing was supplied a needle dangled by his side a dapper mouse he used to ride thus strutted tom in stately pride it was certainly very diverting to see tom in this dress and mounted on the mouse as he rode out a hunting with the king and nobility who were all ready to expire with laughter at tom and his fine prancing charger the king was so charmed with his address that he ordered a little chair to be made in order that tom might sit upon his table and also a palace of gold a span high with a door an inch wide to live in he also gave him a coach drawn by six small mice the queen was so enraged at the honors conferred on sir thomas that she resolved to ruin him and told the king that the little knight had been saucy to her the king sent for tom in a great haste but being fully aware of the danger of royal anger he crept into an empty snail shell where he lay for a long time until he was almost starved with hunger but at last he ventured to peep out and seeing a fine large butterfly on the ground near the place of his concealment he got close to it and jumping astride on it was carried up into the air the butterfly flew with him from tree to tree and from field to field and at last returned to the court where the king and nobility all strove to catch him but at last poor tom fell from his seat into a watering pot in which he was almost drowned when the queen saw him she was in a rage and said he should be beheaded and he was again put into a mousetrap until the time of his execution however a cat observing something alive in the trap patted it about till the wires broke and set thomas at liberty the king received tom again into favor which he did not live to enjoy for a large spider one day attacked him and although he drew his sword and fought well 
Yet the spider's poisonous breath at last overcame him. He fell dead on the ground where he stood, and the spider sucked every drop of his blood. King Arthur and his whole court were so sorry at the loss of their little favorite that they went into mourning and raised a fine white marble monument over his grave with the following epitaph. Here lies Tom Thumb, King Arthur's knight, who died by a spider's cruel bite. He was well known in Arthur's court, where he afforded gallant sport. He rode the tilt and tournament, and on a mouse a hunting went. Alive he filled the court with mirth, his death to sorrow soon gave birth. Wipe, wipe your eyes and shake your head, and cry, alas, Tom Thumb is dead. End of the History of Tom Thumb Recording by Vero Nasser Story 15 of the Fairy Ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Chang. The Fairy Ring. Edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 15 Tattercoats. In a great palace by the sea, there once dwelt a very rich old lord who had neither wife nor children living, only one little granddaughter, whose face he had never seen in all her life. He hated her bitterly, because at her birth his favourite daughter died, and when the old nurse brought him the baby, he swore that it might live or die as it liked, but he would never look on its face as long as it lived. So he turned his back and sat by his window, looking out over the sea, and weeping great tears for his lost daughter till his white hair and beard grew down over his shoulders, and twined round his chair, and crept into the chinks of the floor, and his tears, dropping onto the window-ledge, wore a channel through the stone, and ran away in a little river to the great sea. And meanwhile his granddaughter grew up, with no one to care for her or clothe her. Only the old nurse, when no one was by, would sometimes give her a dish of scraps from the kitchen, or a torn petticoat from the rag-bag, while the other servants of the palace would drive her from the house with blows and mocking words, calling her tattercoats, and pointing at her bare feet and shoulders, till she ran away crying to hide among the bushes. And so she grew up, with little to eat or wear, spending her days in the fields and lanes, with only the goose-herd for a companion, who had played her so merrily on his little pipe when she was hungry or cold or tired, that she forgot all her troubles and fell to dancing, with his flock of noisy geese for partners. But one day people told each other that the king was travelling through the land, and in the town near by was to give a great ball to all the lords and ladies of the country, when the prince, his only son, was to choose a wife. One of the royal invitations was brought to the palace by the sea, and the servants carried it up to the old lord, who still sat by his window, wrapped in his long white hair, and weeping into the little river that was fed by his tears. But when he heard the king's command, he dried his eyes, and bade them bring shears to cut him loose, for his hair had bound him a fast prisoner, and he could not move. And then he sent them for rich clothes and jewels which he put on, and he ordered them to saddle the white horse with gold and silk that he might ride to meet the king. Meanwhile, Tattercoats had heard of the great doings in the town, and she sat by the kitchen door weeping, because she could not go to see them. And when the old nurse heard her cry, she went to the lord of the palace, and begged him to take his granddaughter with him to the king's ball. But he only frowned and told her to be silent, while the servants laughed and said, Tattercoats is happy in her rags, playing with the goose herd. Let her be, it is all she is fit for. A second and then a third time, the old nurse begged him to let the girl go with him, but she was answered only by black looks and fierce words, till she was driven from the room by the jeering servants with blows and mocking words. Weeping over her ill success, the old nurse went to look for tattercoats, but the girl had been turned from the door by the cook, and had run away to tell her friend the gooseherd how unhappy she was because she could not go to the king's ball. But when the gooseherd had listened to her story, he bade her cheer up, and propose that they should go together into the town to see the king, and all the fine things. 
and when she looked sorrowfully down at her rags and bare feet, he played a note or two upon his pipe so gay and merry that she forgot all about her tears and her troubles, and before she well knew, the herd-boy had taken her by the hand, and she and he and the geese before them were dancing down the road toward the town. Before they had gone very far, a handsome young man, splendidly dressed, rode up and stopped to ask the way to the castle where the king was staying, and when he found that they too were going thither, he got off his horse and walked beside them along the road. The herd-boy pulled out his pipe and played a low, sweet tune, and the stranger looked again and again at Tattercoat's lovely face, till he fell deeply in love with her and begged her to marry him. But she only laughed and shook her golden head. "'You would be finally put to shame if you had a goose-girl for your wife,' said she. "'Go and ask one of the great ladies you will see to-night at the king's ball, and do not flout poor tattercoats.' But the more she refused him, the sweeter the pipe played, and the deeper the young man fell in love, till at last he begged her, as a proof of his sincerity, to come that night at twelve to the king's ball, just as she was with the herd-boy and his geese, and in her torn petticoat and bare feet, and he would dance with her before the king and the lords and ladies, and present her to them all as his dear and honoured bride. So when night came, and the hall in the castle was full of light and music, and the lords and ladies were dancing before the king, just as the clock struck twelve, Tattercoats and the herd-boy, followed by his flock of noisy geese, entered at the great doors and walked straight up the ballroom, while on either side the ladies whispered, the lords laughed, and the king, seated at the far end, stared in amazement. But as they came in front of the throne, Tattercoat's lover rose from beside the king and came to meet her. Taking her by the hand, he kissed her thrice before them all, and turned to the king. Father, he said, for it was the prince himself, I have made my choice, and here is my bride, the loveliest girl in all the land and the sweetest as well. But before he had finished speaking, the herd-boy put his pipe to his lips and played a few low notes that sounded like a bird singing far off in the woods, and as he played, Tattercoat's rags were changed to shining robes sewn with glittering jewels, a golden crown lay upon her golden hair, and the flock of geese behind her became a crowd of dainty pages bearing her long train and as the king rose to greet her as his daughter, the trumpet sounded loudly in honour of the new princess, and the people outside in the street said to each other, Ah, now the prince has chosen for his wife the loveliest girl in all the land. But the gooseherd was never seen again, and no one knew what became of him, while the old lord went home once more to his palace by the sea, for he could not stay at court when he had sworn never to look on his granddaughter's face. So there he still sits by his window, if you could only see him as you some day may, weeping more bitterly than ever as he looks out over the sea. End of Tattercoats Recording by Anne Cheng Story 16 of The Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 16. History of Jack the Giant Killer. In the reign of the famous King Arthur, there lived in Cornwall a lad named Jack, who was a boy of a bold temper, and took delight in hearing or reading of conjurers, giants, and fairies, and used to listen eagerly to the deeds of the knights of King Arthur's round table. In those days there lived on St. Michael's Mount, off Cornwall, a huge giant, eighteen feet high and nine feet round, and whose fierce and savage looks were the terror of all who beheld him. He dwelt in a gloomy cavern on the top of the mountain, and used to wade over to the mainland in search of prey, when he would throw half a dozen oxen upon his back, tie three times as many sheep and hogs around his waist, and march back to his own abode. The giant had done this for many years, when Jack resolved to destroy him. Jack took a horn, a shovel, a pickaxe, his armor, and a dark lantern, and one winter's evening he went to the mount. There he dug a pit twenty-two feet deep and twenty broad, he covered the top over so as to make it look like solid ground. 
He then blew such a tantivy that the giant awoke and came out of his den with a cry, "'You saucy villain! You shall pay for this! I'll broil you for my breakfast!' He had just finished when, taking one step further, he tumbled headlong into the pit, and Jack struck him a blow on the head with his pickaxe that killed him. Jack then returned home to cheer his friends with the news. Another giant, called Blunderbore, vowed to revenge on Jack if ever he should have him in his power. This giant kept an enchanted castle in the midst of a lonely wood, and some time after the death of Cormoran, Jack was passing through a wood, and being weary, sat down and went to sleep. The giant, passing by and seeing Jack, carried him to his castle, where he locked him in a large room, the floor of which was covered with the bodies, skulls, and bones of men and women. Soon after the giant went to fetch his brother, who was likewise a giant, to take a meal off his flesh, and Jack saw with terror through the bars of his prison the two giants approaching. Jack, perceiving in one corner of the room a strong cord, took courage, and making a slipknot at each end, he threw them over their heads and tied it to the window bars. He then pulled till he had choked them. When they were black in the face, he slid down the rope and quickly disposed of them. Jack next took a bunch of keys from the pocket of Blunderbore and went into the castle again. He made a strict search through all the rooms, and in one of them found three ladies tied up by the hair of their heads and almost starved to death. They told him that their husbands had been killed by the giants, who had then condemned them to be starved to death because they would not eat the flesh of the captives he brought in. "'Ladies,' said Jack, "'I have put an end to the monster and his wicked brother, "'and I give you this castle and all the riches it contains "'to make some amends for the dreadful pains you have felt.' "'He then very politely gave them the keys of the castle "'and went further on his journey to Wales. "'As Jack had but little money, "'he went on as fast as possible. "'At length he came to a handsome house. "'Jack knocked at the door, "'whence there came forth a Welsh giant.' Jack said he was a traveller who had lost his way, on which the giant made him welcome, and led him into a room where there was a good bed to sleep in. Jack took off his clothes quickly, but though he was weary he could not go to sleep. Soon after this he heard the giant walking backward and forward in the next room, saying to himself, "'Though here you lodge with me this night, you shall not see the morning light. My club shall dash your brains out quite.' "'Say you so?' thought Jack. Are these your tricks upon travellers? But I hope to prove as cunning as you are. Then getting out of bed, he groped about the room, and at last found a large thick billet of wood. He laid it in his own place in the bed, and then hid himself in a dark corner of the room. The giant, about midnight, entered the apartment, and with his bludgeon struck many blows on the bed, in the very place where Jack had lain the log. Then he went back to his own room, thinking he had broken all Jack's bones. Early in the morning, Jack put a bold face upon the matter, and walked into the giant's room to thank him for his lodging. The giant started when he saw him, and began to stammer out, "'Oh, dear me, is it you? Pray, how did you sleep last night? Did you hear or see anything in the dead of night?' "'Ah, nothing worth speaking of,' said Jack carelessly. "'A rat, I believe, gave me three or four slaps with its tail, and disturbed me a little.' but I soon went to sleep again. The giant wondered more and more at this, yet he did not answer a word, but went to bring two great bowls of hasty pudding for their breakfast. Jack wanted to make the giant believe that he could eat as much as himself, so he contrived to button a leathern bag inside his coat and slip the hasty pudding into this bag, while he seemed to be putting it into his mouth. When breakfast was over, he said to the giant, "'Now I will show you a fine trick. "'I can cure all the wounds with a touch. "'I could cut off my head in one minute, "'and the next put it sound again on my shoulders. "'You shall see an example.' "'He then took hold of the knife, "'ripped up the leathern bag, "'and all the hasty pudding tumbled out on the floor. "'Oods! Splutter her nails!' "'cried the Welsh giant, "'who was ashamed to be outdone "'by such a little fellow as Jack. "'Her can do that herself!' "'So he snatched up the knife,' plunged it into his own stomach, and in a moment dropped down dead. Jack, having hitherto been successful in all his undertakings, resolved not to be idle in future. He therefore furnished himself with a horse, a cap of knowledge, a sword of sharpness, shoes of swiftness, 
and an invisible coat, the better to perform the wonderful enterprises that lay before him. He travelled over high hills, and on the third day he came to a large and spacious forest through which his road lay. Scarcely had he entered the forest when he beheld a monstrous giant dragging along by the hair of their heads a handsome knight and his lady. Jack alighted from his horse, and tying him to an oak tree, put on his invisible coat, under which he carried his sword of sharpness. When he came up to the giant, he made several strokes at him, but could not reach his body, though he wounded his thighs in several places, and at length, putting both hands to his sword, and aiming with all his might, he cut off both his legs. Then Jack, setting his foot upon the giant's neck, plunged his sword into the great body, when the monster gave a groan and expired. The knight and his lady thanked Jack for their deliverance, and invited him to their house to receive a proper reward for his services. No, said Jack, I cannot be easy till I find out this monster's habitation. So taking the knight's directions, he mounted his horse, and soon after came in sight of another giant, who was sitting on a block of timber, waiting for his brother's return. Jack alighted from his horse, and, putting on his invisible coat, approached and aimed a blow at the giant's head, but missing his aim, he only cut off his nose. On this the giant seized his club, and laid about him most unmercifully. Nay, said Jack, if this be the case, I'd better dispatch you. So, jumping upon the block, he stabbed him in the back, when he dropped down dead. Then Jack proceeded on his journey, and travelled over hills and dales, till arriving at the foot of a high mountain, he knocked at the door of a lonely house, when an old man let him in. When Jack was seated, the hermit thus addressed himself, My son, on the top of this mountain, is an enchanted castle, kept by the giant, Galagantus, and a vile magician. I lament the fate of a duke's daughter, whom they seized as she was walking in her father's garden, and brought hither, transformed into a deer. Jack promised that in the morning, at the risk of his life, he would break the enchantment, and after a sound sleep he rose early, put on his invisible coat, and made ready for the attempt. When he had climbed to the top of the mountain, he saw two fiery griffins, but he passed between them without the least fear of danger, for they could not see him because of his invisible coat. On the castle gate he found a golden trumpet, under which were written these lines, Whoever can this trumpet blow shall cause the giant's overthrow. As soon as Jack had read this, he seized the trumpet and blew a shrill blast, which made the gates fly open, and the very castle itself tremble. The giant and the conjurer now knew that their wicked course was at an end, and they stood biting their thumbs and shaking with fear. Jack, with his sword of sharpness, soon killed the giant, and the magician was then carried away by a whirlwind, and every knight and beautiful lady who had been changed into birds and beasts returned to their proper shapes. The castle vanished away like smoke, and the head of the giant, Galagantus, was then sent to King Arthur. The knights and ladies rested that night at the old man's hermitage, and next day they set out for the court. Jack then went up to the king, and gave his majesty an account of all his fierce battles. Jack's fame had now spread through the whole country, and at the king's desire the duke gave him his daughter in marriage, to the joy of all his kingdom. After this the king gave him a large estate, on which he and his lady lived the rest of their days in joy and contentment. End of History of Jack the Giant Killer Part One of Story Seventeen of The Fairy Ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wigan and Nora Archibald Smith. Story Seventeen Yvonne and Finette, A Tale of Brittany. Part One. Chapter One. Once upon a time, there lived in Brittany a noble lord, who was called the Baron Curver. His manor house was the most beautiful in the province. It was a great gothic castle with a groined roof and walls, covered with carving, that looked at a distance, like a vine climbing over an arbor. 
On the first floor, six stained glass balcony windows looked out on each side toward the rising and setting sun. In the morning, when the baron, mounted on his dun mare, went forth into the forest, followed by his tall greyhounds, he saw at each window one of his daughters, with prayer book in hand, praying for the house of Curva, and who, with their fair curls, blue eyes, clasped hands, might have been taken for six madonnas in the azure niche. At evening, when the sun declined and the baron returned homeward, after riding around his domains, he perceived from afar in the windows looking towards the west six sons with dark locks and eagle gaze, the hope and pride of the family, who might have been taken for six sculptured knights at the portal of a church. For ten leagues round, all who wished to quote a happy father and a powerful lord named the Baron Curver. The castle had but twelve windows, and the Baron had thirteen children. The last, the one that had no place, was a handsome boy of sixteen by the name of Yvonne. As usual, he was the best beloved. In the morning of his departure, and at evening on his return, the Baron always found Yvonne waiting on the threshold to embrace him, with his fair hair falling to his waist, his graceful figure, his wilful air, and his bold bearing, Yvonne was beloved of all the Bretons. At twelve years of age, he had bravely attacked and killed a wolf with an axe, which had won him the name of Fearless. He deserved the title, for never was there a bolder heart. One day, when Baron had stayed at home, and was amusing himself by breaking a lance with his squire, Yvonne entered the armory in a travelling dress, and, bending one knee to the ground, "'My lord and father,' said he to the baron, "'I come to ask your blessing. The house of Curva is rich in knights, and has no need of a child. It is time for me to go seek my fortune. I wish to go to distant countries to try my strength, and to make myself a name.' "'You are right, fearless,' replied the baron, more moved than he wished to appear. "'I will not keep you back. I have no right to do so, but you are very young, my child. Perhaps it would be better for you to stay another year with us.' "'I am sixteen, my father. At that age you had already fought one of the proudest lords in the country. I have not forgotten that our arms are a unicorn ripping up a lion, and our motto, "'Onward!' I do not wish the curvers to blush for their last child. Yvonne received his father's blessing, shook hands with his brothers, embraced his sisters, bade adieu to all the weeping vassals, and set out with a light heart. Nothing stopped him on his way. A river appeared. He swam it. A mountain? He climbed it. A forest? He made his way through it with the sun for a guide. On the curver! he cried. Whenever he met with an obstacle, he went straight forward in spite of everything. For three years he had been roaming over the world in search of adventures, sometimes conquering, sometimes conquered, always bold and gay, when he received an offer to go to fight the heathen of Norway. To kill unbelievers and to conquer a kingdom was a double pleasure. Yvonne enlisted twelve brave comrades, freighted a ship, and hoisted from the mainmast a blue standard, with the unicorn and the motto of the curvers. The sea was calm, the wind fair, and the night serene. Yvonne stretched on the deck, watched the stars, and sought the one which cast its trembling light on his father's castle. All at once the vessel struck upon a rock. A terrible crash was heard. The sails fell like tinder and an enormous wave burst over the deck, and swept away everything upon it. "'On the curver!' cried Yvonne, as soon as his head appeared above the water, and he began to swim as tranquilly as if he had been bathing in the lake of the old castle. Happily the moon was rising. Yvonne saw, at a little distance, a black speck among the silvery waves. It was land. He approached it, not without difficulty, and finally succeeded and gaining a foothold. Dripping wet, exhausted with fatigue, and out of breath, he dragged himself on the sand, then without more anxiety, said his prayers, and went to sleep. Chapter 2
In the morning, on awakening, Yvonne tried to discover in what country he had been cast. He saw in the distance a house as large as a church, with windows fifty feet in height. He walked a whole day before reaching it, and at last found himself in front of an immense door, with a knocker so heavy that it was impossible for a man to lift it. Yvonne took a great stone and began to knock. "'Come in!' cried a voice, that sounded like a roar of a bull. At the same instant the door opened, and the little Breton found himself in the presence of a giant not less than forty feet in height. "'What is your name, and what do you want here?' said the giant, taking up Yvonne between his thumb and finger, and lifting him from the ground so as to see him better. "'My name is Fearless, and I am seeking my fortune,' answered Yvonne, looking at the monster with an air of defiance. "'Well, brave Fearless, your fortune is made,' said the giant, in a mocking tone. I am in need of a servant, and I will give you the place. You can go to work directly. This is the time for leading my sheep to pasture, and you may clean the stable while I am gone. I shall give you nothing else to do, added he, bursting into a laugh. You see that I am a good master. Do your task, and above all things don't prowl about the house, or it will cost you your life. Certainly I have a good master. The work is not hard, thought Yvonne, when the giant was gone. I have plenty of time to sweep the stable. What shall I do meanwhile to amuse myself? Shall I look about the house? Since I am forbidden to do so, it must be because there is something to see. He entered the first room, and saw a large fireplace, in which a great pot was hanging suspended from a hook. The pot was boiling, but there was no fire on the hearth. What does this mean? thought Yvonne. There is some mystery here. He cut off a lock of his hair, dipped it into the pot, and took it out, all coated with copper. Oh, oh, cried he, this is a new kind of soup. Anybody that swallows it must have an ironclad stomach. He went into the next room, and there also a pot was suspended from a hook, and boiling without fire. Yvonne dipped a lock of hair into it, and took it out all coated with silver. The broth is not so rich as this in the curver kitchen, thought he, but it may have a better taste. Upon this he entered the third room. There also a pot was suspended from a hook, and boiling without fire. Yvonne dipped a lock of hair into it, and took it out all coated with gold. It shone so brightly that it might have been mistaken for a sunbeam. Good, cried he, in our country the old women have a saying, everything gets worse and worse. Here it is just the contrary, everything gets better and better. What shall I find in the fourth room, I wonder? Diamond soup? He pushed open the door and saw something rarer than precious stones. This was a young woman of such marvellous beauty that Yvonne, dazzled, fell on his knees at the sight. Unfortunate youth! cried she in a trembling voice what are you doing here i belong to the house answered yvonne the giant took me into his service this morning his service repeated the young girl may heaven preserve you from it why so said yvonne i have a good master the work is not hard the stable once swept my task is finished yes and how will you set to work to sweep it asked the lady if you sweep it in the usual way, for every forkful of dung that you throw out the door, ten will come in the window. But I will tell you what to do. Turn the fork and sweep with the handle, and the dung will instantly fly out of itself. I will obey, said Yvonne, upon which he sat down by the young girl and began to talk to her. She was the daughter of a fairy, whom the wretched giant had made his slave. Friendship soon springs up between companions in misfortune. Before the end of the day, Finette, for that was the lady's name, and Yvonne had already promised to belong to each other, if they could escape from their abominable master. The difficulty was to find the means. Time passes quickly in this kind of talk. Evening was approaching when Finette 
sent away her new friend, advising him to sweep the stable before the giant came home. Yvonne took down the fork and attempted to use it, as he had seen it done at his father's castle. He soon had enough of it. In less than a second, there was so much dung in the stable that the poor boy knew not which way to turn. He did as Finette had bid him, and he turned the fork and swept with the handle, when, behold, in the twinkling of an eye, the stable was as clean as if no cattle had ever entered it. Task finished, Yvonne seated himself on a bench before the door of the house. As soon as he saw the giant coming, he lolled back in his seat, crossed his legs, and began to sing one of his native airs. "'Have you cleaned the stable?' asked the giant, with a frown. "'Everything is ready, master,' answered Yvonne, without troubling himself to move. "'I'm going to see for myself,' howled the giant. He entered the stable grumbling, found everything in order, and came out furious. "'You have seen my finette!' cried he. "'This trick did not come from your own head.' "'What is my finette?' asked Yvonne, opening his mouth and shutting his eyes. "'Is it one of the animals that you have in this country? "'Show it to me, master.' "'Hold your tongue, fool!' replied the giant. "'You will see her sooner than you will want to.' The next morning, the giant gathered his sheep together to lead them to the pasture, but before setting out, he ordered Yvonne to go in the course of the day in search of his horse, which was turned out to graze on the mountain. "'After that,' said he, bursting into a laugh, "'you can rest all day long. "'You see that I am a good master. "'Do your task, and above all things don't prowl about the house, "'or I will cut off your head.' Yvonne winked his eye as the giant left. "'Yes, you are a good master,' said he between his teeth. "'I understand your fine tricks, but in spite of your threats,' I shall go into the house and talk with your Finette. It remains to be seen whether she will not be mine or yours. He ran to the young girl's room. Hurrah! cried he. I have nothing to do all day but to go to the mountain after a horse. Very well, said Finette. How will you set work to ride him? A fine question, returned Yvonne. As if it were a difficult thing to ride a horse. I fancy that I have written worse ones than this. It is not so easy as you think, replied Finette, but I will tell you what to do. Take the bit that hangs behind the stable door, and when the animal rushes toward you, breathing fire and smoke from his nostrils, force it straight between his teeth. He will instantly become as gentle as a lamb, and you can do what you please with him. I will obey, said Yvonne, upon which he sat down by the side of Finette and began to talk with her. They talked of everything, but however far their fancy strayed, they always came back to the point, that they were promised to each other, and that they must escape from the giant. Time passes quickly in this kind of talk. The evening drew nigh. Yvonne had forgotten the horse and the mountain, and Finette was obliged to send him away, advising him to bring back the animal before his master's arrival. Yvonne took down the bit that was hidden behind the stable door, and hastened to the mountain, when, lo, a horse almost as large as an elephant rushed toward him, at full gallop, breathing fire and smoke from his nostrils. Yvonne firmly awaited the huge animal, and, the moment he opened his enormous jaws, thrust between the bit, and lo, the horse instantly became as gentle as a lamb. Yvonne made him kneel down, sprang on his back, and tranquilly returned home. His task finished, Yvonne seated himself on the bench before the door of the house. As soon as he saw the giant coming, he lolled back in his seat, crossed his legs, and began to sing one of his native airs. "'Have you brought back the horse?' asked the giant with a frown. "'Yes, master,' answered Yvonne, without taking the trouble to move. "'He is a fine animal and does you credit. "'He is gentle, well-trained, and as quiet as a lamb. "'He is feeding yonder in the stable.' "'I'm going to see for myself,' howled the giant. "'He entered the stable, grumbling, found everything in order, and came out furious.' "'You have seen my finette,' said he. "'This trick does not come from your own head.' 
Oh, master, returned Yvonne, opening his mouth and shutting his eyes. It is the same story over again. What is my finette? Once for all, show me this monster. Hold your tongue, fool, returned the giant. You will see her sooner than you will want to. The third day at dawn, the giant gathered his sheep together to lead them to the pasture. But before setting out, he said to Yvonne, Today you must go to the bottomless pit to collect my rent. And after that, continued he, bursting into a laugh, you may rest all day long. You see that I am a good master. A good master, so be it, murmured Yvonne. But the task is none the less hard. I will go and see my finette, as the giant says. I have great need of her help to get through today's business. When Finette had learned what was the task of the day, well, said she, how will you go to work to do it? I don't know, said Yvonne sadly. I have never been to the bottomless pit, and even if I knew the way there, I should not know what to ask for. Tell me what to do. Do you see that great rock yonder? said Finette. That is one of the gates of the bottomless pit. Take this stick knock three times on that stone and a demon will come out all streaming with flames who will ask you how much you want take care to answer no more than i can carry i will obey said yvonne upon which he took a seat by the side of finette and began to talk with her he would have been there till this time if the young girl had not sent him to the great rock when the evening drew nigh to execute the giant's commands on reaching the spot pointed out to him, Yvonne found a great block of granite. He struck it three times with the stick, when lo, the rock opened and a demon came forth, all streaming with flames. "'What do you want?' he cried. "'I have come from the giant's rent,' answered Yvonne calmly. "'How much do you want?' "'I never want any more than I can carry,' replied the Breton. "'It is well for you that you do not.' answered the man in flames. Enter this cavern, and you will find what you want. Yvonne entered and opened his eyes wide. Everywhere he saw nothing but gold, silver, diamonds, carbuncles, and emeralds. They were as numerous as the sands on the seashore. The young curver filled his sack, threw it across his shoulder, and tranquilly returned home. His task finished, our Breton seated himself on the bench before the door of the house. As soon as he saw the giant coming, he lolled back in his seat, crossed his legs, and began to sing one of his native airs. "'Have you been to the bottomless pit to collect my rent?' asked the giant, with a frown. "'Yes, master,' answered Yvonne, without taking the trouble to stir. "'The sack is there right before your eyes. You can count it.' "'I am going to see for myself,' howled the giant. He untied the strings of the sack, which was so full that the gold and silver rolled in all directions. You have seen my finette, he cried. This trick does not come from your own head. Don't you know but one song, said Yvonne, opening his mouth and shutting his eyes. It is the old story, my finette, my finette. Once for all, show me this thing. Well, well roared the giant with fury wait till tomorrow and you shall make her acquaintance thank you master said yvonne it is very good of you but i see from your face that you are laughing at me chapter three the next morning the giant went out without giving yvonne any orders which troubled finette at noon he returned without his flock complaining of the heat and fatigue and said to the young girl, You will find a child, my servant, at the door. Cut his throat, put him into the great pot to boil, and call me when the broth is ready. Saying this, he stretched himself on the bed to take a nap, and he was soon snoring so loud that it seemed like thunder shaking the mountains. Finette prepared a log of wood, took a large knife, and called Yvonne. She pricked his little finger. Three drops of blood fell on the log. That is enough, said Finette. Now help me fill the pot. They threw into it 
all that they could find. Old clothes, old shoes, old carpets, and everything else. Finette then took Yvonne by the hand and led him through the three antechambers, where she ran in a mould three bullets of gold, two bullets of silver, and one bullet of copper. After which they quitted the house and ran toward the sea. On the curver, cried Yvonne, as soon as he saw himself in the country. Explain yourself, dear Finette. What farce are we playing now? Let us run, let us run, she cried. If we do not quit this wretched island before the night, it is all over for us. On the curver, replied Yvonne, laughing, and down with the giant. When he had snored a full hour, the giant stretched his limbs, half opened one eye, and cried, Is it ready? It is just beginning to boil, answered the first drop of blood on the log. The giant turned over and snored louder than ever for an hour or two longer. Then he stretched his limbs, half opened one eye, and cried out, Do you hear me? Is it almost ready? It is half done answered the second drop of blood on the log. The giant turned over and slept an hour longer. Then he yawned, stretched his great limbs and cried out impatiently, Isn't it ready yet? It is ready now, answered the third drop of blood on the log. The giant sat up in bed, rubbed his eyes and looked around to see who had spoken. But it was in vain to look. He saw no one. Finette, howled he, why isn't the table set? There was no answer. The giant, furious, sprang out of bed, seized a ladle, which looked like a cauldron with a pitchfork for a handle, and plunged it into the pot to taste the soup. Finette, howled he, you haven't salted it. What sort of soup is this? I see neither meat nor vegetables. No, but in return... He saw his carpet, which had not quite all boiled to pieces. At this sight, he fell into such a fit of rage that he could not keep his feet. Villain, said he, you have played a fine trick on me, but you shall pay for it. He rushed out with a stick in his hand and strode along at such a rate that in a quarter of an hour he discovered the two fugitives still far from the seashore. He uttered such a cry of joy that the earth shook for twelve leagues around. Finette stopped trembling. Yvonne clasped her to his heart. On the curver, said he. The sea is not far off. We shall be there before our enemy. Here he is, here he is, cried Finette, pointing to the giant not a hundred yards off. We are lost if this charm does not save us. She took the copper bullet and threw it on the ground, saying, Copper bullet? Save us, pray, stop the giant on his way. And behold, the earth cracked apart with a terrific noise. An enormous fissure, a bottomless pit, stopped the giant, just as he was stretching out his hand to seize his prey. Let us fly, cried Finette, grasping the arm of Yvonne, who was gazing at the giant with a swaggering air, defying him to come on. The giant ran backward and forward along the abyss like a bear in his cage, seeking a passage everywhere and finding none. Then, with a furious jerk, he tore up an immense oak by the roots and flung it across the gap. The branches of the oak nearly crushed the children as it fell. The giant seated himself astride the huge tree, which bent under his weight and crept slowly along suspended between heaven and earth, entangled as he was among the branches. When he reached the other side, Yvonne and Finette were already on the shore, with the sea rolling before them. Alas, there was neither bark nor ship. The fugitives were lost. Yvonne, always brave, picked up stones to attack the giant and to sell his life dearly, Finette, trembling with fear, threw one of the silver bullets into the sea, saying, Silver bullet, bright and pliant, save us from this frightful giant. Scarcely had she spoken the magic words when a beautiful ship rose from the waves like a swan spreading its white wings. Yvonne and Finette plunged into the sea. A rope was thrown them by an invisible hand, 
and when the furious giant reached the shore, the ship was receding rapidly at full sail, leaving behind it a long furrow of shining foam. Giants do not like the water. This fact is certified to by old Homer, who knew Polyphemus, and the same observation will be found in all natural histories worthy of the name. Finette's master resembled Polyphemus. He roared with rage when he saw his slaves about to escape him. He ran hesitatingly along the shore. He flung huge masses of rock after the vessel, which happily fell by the side of it, and only made great black holes in the water. And finally, mad with anger, he plunged head foremost into the sea, and began to swim after the ship with frightful speed. At each stroke he advanced forty feet, blowing like a whale, and like a whale cleaving the waves. By degrees he gained on his enemies. One more effort would bring him within reach of the rudder, and already he was stretching out his arm to seize it, when Finette threw the second silver bullet into the sea and cried in tears, Silver bullet, bright and pliant, save us from this frightful giant. Suddenly, from the mist of foam darted forth a giant swordfish, with a sword at least twenty feet in length. It rushed straight towards the giant, who scarcely had time to dive, chased him under the water, pursued him on top of the waves, followed him closely whichever way he turned, and forced him to flee as fast as he could to his island, where he finally landed with the greatest difficulty, and fell upon the shore dripping worn out and conquered on the curver cried yvonne we're saved not yet said finette trembling the giant has a witch for a godmother i fear that she will revenge on me the insult offered to her godson my art tells me my dear yvonne that if you quit me a single instant until you give me your name in the chapel of the curvers i have everything to dread by the unicorn of my ancestors cried yvonne you have the heart of a hare and not of a hero am i not here am i going to abandon you do you believe that providence has saved us from the fangs of that monster to wreck us in port he laughed so gaily that finette laughed in turn at the terror that had seized her chapter four the rest of the voyage passed off admirably. An invisible hand seemed to impel the ship onward. Twenty days after their departure, the boat landed Yvonne and Finette near Curva Castle. Once on the shore, Yvonne turned to thank the crew. No one was there. Both boat and ship had vanished under the waves, leaving no trace behind but a gull on the wing. Yvonne recognized the spot where he had so often gathered shells, and chased the crabs to their holes when he was a child. Half an hour's walk would bring him in sight of the towers of the old castle. His heart beat. He looked tenderly at Finette, and saw for the first time that her dress was fantastic and unworthy of a woman about to enter the noble house of Curver. "'My dear child,' said he, "'the baron my father is a noble lord, accustomed to be treated with respect.' I cannot introduce you to him in this gypsy dress. Neither is it fitting that you should enter our great castle on foot like a peasant. Wait for me a few moments, and I will bring you a horse and one of my sister's dresses. I wish you to be received like a lady of high degree. I wish my father himself to meet you on your arrival. And hold it an honour to give you his hand. Yvonne, Yvonne, cried Finette. Do not quit me, I beg you. Once return to your castle, I know that you will forget me. Forget you? exclaimed Yvonne. If anyone else were to offer me such an insult, I would teach him with my sword to suspect a curver. Forget you, my finette? <laughs> you do not know the fidelity of a Breton. That the Bretons are faithful, no one doubts. But that they are still more headstrong is a justice that none will deny them. It was useless for poor Finette to plead in her most loving tones. She was forced to yield. She resigned herself with a heavy heart and said to Yvonne, Go without me then, to your castle, but only stay long enough to speak with your friends, then go straight to the stable, and return as soon as possible. You will be surrounded by people. 
act as if you saw no one, and above all, do not eat or drink anything, whatever. Should you take only a glass of water, evil would come upon us both. Yvonne promised and swore all that Finette asked, but he smiled in his heart at this feminine weakness. He was sure of himself, and he thought with pride how different a Breton was from those fickle Frenchmen, whose words, they say, are borne away by the first breath of the wind. On entering the old castle, he could scarcely recognize its dark walls. All the windows were festooned with leaves and flowers within and without. The courtyard was strewn with fragrant grass. On one side were spread tables, groaning under their weight. On the other, musicians mounted on casks were playing merry airs. The vassals, dressed in their holiday attire, were singing and dancing, dancing and singing. It was a day of great rejoicing in the castle. The baron himself was smiling. It is true that he had just married his fifth daughter to the knight of Kervalik. This marriage added another quartering to the illustrious escutcheon of the Kervers. Yvonne, recognized and welcomed by all the crowd, was instantly surrounded by his relatives, who embraced him and shook him by the hand. Where had he been? Where did he come from? Had he conquered a kingdom? A duchy? Or a barony? Had he brought the bride the jewels of some queen? Had the fairies protected him? How many rivals had he overthrown? All these questions were showered upon him without reply. Yvonne respectfully kissed his father's hand, hastened to his sister's chamber, took two of their finest dresses, went to the stable, saddled a pony, mounted a beautiful Spanish jennet, and was about to quit the castle when he found his relatives, friends, squires, and vassals all standing in his way, their glasses in their hands, ready to drink their young lord's health and safe return. Yvonne gracefully thanked them, bowed and made his way by degrees through the crowd, when, just as he was about to cross the drawbridge, a fair-haired lady, with a haughty and disdainful air, a stranger to him, a sister of the bridegroom, perhaps, approached him, holding a pomegranate in her hand. "'My handsome knight,' said she, with a singular smile, "'you surely will not refuse a lady's first request. "'Taste this pomegranate, I entreat you. "'If you are neither hungry nor thirsty after so long a journey, "'I suppose at least that you have not forgotten the laws of politeness?' Yvonne dared not refuse this appeal. He was very wrong. Scarcely had he tasted the pomegranate when he looked around him like a man waking from a dream. "'What am I doing on this horse?' thought he. "'What means this pony that I am leading? Is not my place in my father's house at my sister's wedding? Why should I quit the castle?' He threw the bridle to one of the grooms, leaped lightly to the ground, and offered his hand to the fair-haired lady who accepted him as her attendant on the spot, and gave him her bouquet to hold as a special mark of favour. Before the evening was over, there was another betrothed couple in the castle. Yvonne had pledged his faith to the unknown lady, and Finette was forgotten. End of part one of Yvonne and Finette, A Tale of Brittany Part 2 of Story 17 of The Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Perry The Fairy Ring Edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith Story 17 Yvonne and Finette A Tale of Brittany Part 2 Chapter 5 Poor Finette, seated on the seashore, waited all day long for Yvonne, but Yvonne did not come. The sun was setting in the fiery waves when Finette rose, sighing, and took the way to the castle in her turn. She had not walked long in a steep road, bordered with thorn-trees in blossom, when she found herself in front of a wretched hut, at the door of which stood an old woman about to milk her cow. Finette approached her, and making a low curtsy, begged a shelter for the night. The old woman looked at the stranger from head to foot. With her buskins trimmed with fur, her full red petticoat, 
her blue jacket edged with jet, and her diadem. Finette looked more like an Egyptian princess than a Christian. The old woman frowned, and shaking her fist in the face of the poor forsaken girl. "'Begone, witch!' she cried. "'There is no room for you in this honest house.' "'My good mother,' said Finette, "'give me only a corner of the stable.' "'Oh!' said the old woman, laughing and showing the only tooth she had left, which projected from her mouth like a bear's tusk. "'So you want a corner of the stable, do you? "'Well, you shall have it if you fill my milk-pail with gold.' "'It is a bargain,' said Finette quietly. She opened a leather purse, which she wore at her belt, took from it a golden bullet, and threw it into the milk-pail, saying, "'Golden bullet, precious treasure, save me if it be thy pleasure.' And behold, the pieces of gold began to dance about in the pail. They rose higher and higher, flapping about like fish in a net, while the old woman on her knees gazed with wonder at the sight. When the pail was full, the old woman rose, put her arm through the handle, and said to Finette, "'Madam, all is yours, the house, the cow, and everything else. Hurrah! I am going to town to live like a lady with nothing to do. Oh, dear, how I wish I were only sixty! And shaking her crutch, without looking backward, she set out on a run toward Carevere Castle. Finette entered the house. It was a wretched hovel, dark, low, damp, bad-smelling, and full of dust and spider's webs, a horrible refuge for a woman accustomed to living in the giant's grand castle. Without seeming troubled, Finette went to the hearth, on which a few green boughs were smoking, took another golden bullet from her purse, and threw it into the fire, saying, "'Golden bullet, precious treasure, save me if it be thy pleasure.' The gold melted, bubbled up, and spread all over the house like running water, and behold, the whole cottage, the walls, the thatch, the wooden rocking-chair, the stool, the chest, the bed, the cow's horns, everything, even to the spiders in their webs, was turned to gold. The house gleamed in the moonlight among the trees, like a star in the night. When Finette had milked the cow, and drunk a little new milk, she threw herself on the bed without undressing, and, worn out by the fatigue of the day, fell asleep in the midst of her tears. Old women do not know how to hold their tongues, at least in Brittany. Finette's hostess had scarcely reached the village when she had hastened to the house of the steward. He was an important personage, who had more than once made her tremble when she had driven her cow into her neighbour's pasture by mistake. The steward listened to the old woman's story, shook his head, and said that it looked like witchcraft. Then he mysteriously bought a pair of scales, weighed the guineas, which he found to be genuine and full of weight, kept as many of them as he could, and advised the owner to tell no one of this strange adventure. "'If it should come to the ears of the bailiff or the seneschal,' said he, "'the least that would happen to you, mother, would be to lose every one of these beautiful bright guineas. Justice is impartial. It knows neither favour nor repugnance. It takes the whole.' The old woman thanked the steward for his advice, and promised to follow it. She kept her word so well that she only told her story that evening to two neighbours, her dearest friends, both of whom swore on the heads of their little children to keep it a secret. The oath was a solemn one and so well kept that at noon the next day there was not a boy of six in the village that did not point his finger at the old woman, while the very dogs seemed to bark in their language, "'Here is the old woman with her guineas!' A girl who amuses herself by filling milk-pails with gold is not to be found every day. Even though she should be something of a witch, such a girl would none the less be a treasure in a family. The steward, who was a bachelor, made this wise reflection that night on going to bed. Before dawn he rose to make his rounds in the direction of the stranger's cottage. By the first gleam of the day he spied something shining in the distance like a light among the woods. On reaching the place he was greatly surprised to find a golden cottage instead of the wretched hut that had stood there the day before. But on entering the house he was much more surprised and delighted to find a beautiful young girl, with raven hair, sitting by the window and spinning on her distaff with the air of an empress. Like all men the steward did himself justice, and knew— at the bottom of his heart, that there was not a woman in the world that would not be too happy to give him her hand. Without hesitating, therefore, he declared to Finette that he had come to marry her. The young girl burst out laughing, upon which the steward flew into a passion. "'Take care,' said he, in a terrible voice. "'I am the master here. No one knows who you are or whence you came. The gold that you gave the old woman has raised suspicions. There is magic in this house.' If you do not accept me for a husband this very instant, I will arrest you, and before the night perhaps a witch will be burned before Carevere Castle. You are very amiable, said Finette, with a charming grimace. 
you have a peculiar way of paying court to ladies. Even when they have decided not to refuse, a gallant gentleman spares their blushes. "'We Bretons are plain-spoken people,' replied the steward. "'We go straight to the point. Marriage or prison, which do you choose?' "'Oh!' cried Finette, laying down the distaff. "'There are firebrands falling all over the room.' "'Don't trouble yourself,' said the steward. "'I will pick them up.' "'Lay them carefully on top of the ashes,' returned Finette. "'Have you the tongs?' "'Yes,' said the steward, picking up the crackling coals. "'Abracadabra!' cried Finette, rising. "'Villain, may the tongues hold you, and may you hold the tongues till sunset.' No sooner said than done. The wicked steward stood there all day long with the tongs in his hand, picking up and throwing back the burning coals that snapped in his face, and the hot ashes that flew into his eyes. It was useless for him to shout, pray, weep, and blaspheme. No one heard him. If Finette had stayed at home, she would doubtless have taken pity on him. But after putting the spell upon him, she hastened to the seashore, where, forgetting everything else, she watched for Yvonne in vain. The moment that the sun set, the tongs fell from the steward's hands. He did not stop to finish his errand, but ran as if the devil or justice were at his heels. He made such leaps, he uttered such groans, he was so black and scorched and benumbed, that every one in the village was afraid of him, thinking that he was mad. The boldest tried to speak to him, but he fled without answering, and hid himself in his house, more ashamed than a wolf that has left his paw in the trap. At evening, when Finette returned home in despair, instead of the steward she found another visitor little less formidable. The bailiff had heard the story of the guineas, and had also made up his mind to marry the stranger. He was not rough like the steward, but a fat, good-natured man, who could not speak without bursting into a laugh, showing his great yellow teeth, and puffing and blowing like an ox, though at heart he was not less obstinate or less threatening than his predecessor. Finette entreated the bailiff to leave her alone. He laughed and hinted to her in a good-natured way, that, by right of his office, he had the power to imprison and hang people without process of law. She clasped her hands and begged him with tears to go. For his only answer he took out a roll of parchment from his pocket, wrote on it a contract of marriage, and declared to Finette that should he stay all night, he would not leave the house till she had signed the promise. "'Nevertheless,' said he, "'if you do not like my person, I have another parchment here on which I will write an agreement to live apart, and if my sight annoys you, you have only to shut your eyes.' "'Why?' said Finette. I might decide to do as you wish, if I were sure of finding a good husband in you. But I am afraid. Of what, my dear child? asked the bailiff, smiling, and already as proud as a peacock. Do you think, she said, with a pettish air, that a good husband would leave the door wide open, and not know that his wife was freezing with cold? You are right, my dear, said the bailiff. It was very stupid of me. I will go and shut it. Have you hold of the knob? asked Finette. Yes, my charmer answered the happy bailiff. "'I am just shutting the door.' "'Abracadabra!' cried Finette. "'May you hold the door, villain, and may the door hold you till daybreak.' And behold, the door opened and shut and slammed against the walls like an eagle flapping its wings. You may judge what a dance the poor captive kept up all night. Never had he tried such a waltz, and I imagine that he never wished to dance a second of the same sort. Sometimes the door swung open with him in the street, sometimes it flew back and crushed him against the wall. He swung backward and forward, screaming, swearing, weeping and praying, but all in vain. The door was deaf, and Finette asleep. At daybreak his hands unclasped, and he fell in the road head foremost. Without waiting to finish his errand, he ran as if the moors were after him. He did not even turn around for fear that the door might be at his heels. Fortunately for him, all was still asleep when he reached the village, and he could hide himself in bed without anyone seeing his deplorable plight. This was a great piece of good fortune for him for he was covered with whitewash from head to foot, and so pale, haggard and trembling, that he might have been taken for the ghost of a miller escaped from the infernal regions. When Finette opened her eyes, she saw by her bedside a tall man dressed in black with a velvet cap and a sword. It was the Seneschal of the barony of Kerver. He stood with his arms folded, gazing at Finette in a way that chilled the very marrow of her bones. "'What is your name, vassal?' said he in a voice of thunder. "'Finette, at your service, my lord.' "'replied she, trembling. "'Is this house and furniture yours?' "'Yes, my lord, everything at your service.' "'I mean that it shall be at my service,' returned the Seneschal sternly. "'Rise, vassal! I do you the honour to marry you, "'and to take yourself, your person, and your property under my guardianship.' "'My lord,' returned Finette, 
"'This is much too great an honour for a poor girl like me, "'a stranger, without friends or kindred.' "'Be silent, vassal,' replied the seneschal. "'I am your lord and master. "'I have nothing to do with your advice. "'Sign this paper.' "'My lord,' said Finette, "'I don't know how to write.' "'Do you think that I do either?' "'returned the seneschal in a voice that shook the house. "'Do you take me for a clerk? "'A cross. "'That is the signature of gentlemen.' He made a large cross on the paper, and handed the pen to Finette. "'Sign,' said he. "'If you are afraid to make a cross, infidel, you pass your own death sentence, and I shall take it on myself to execute it.' He drew his heavy sword from the scabbard as he spoke, and threw it on the table. For her only answer, Finette leaped out of the window and ran to the stable. The seneschal pursued her thither, but on attempting to enter an unexpected obstacle stopped him. The frightened cow had backed at the sight of the young girl, and stood in the doorway with Finette clinging to her horns, and making of her a sort of buckler. "'You shall not escape me, sorceress!' cried the seneschal. With a grasp like that of Hercules, he seized the cow by the tail, and dragged her out of the stable. "'Abracadabra!' cried Finette. "'May the cow's tail hold you, villain, and may you hold the cow's tail till you have both been round the world together.' And behold, the cow darted off like lightning, dragging the unhappy seneschal after her. Nothing stopped the two inseparable comrades. They rushed over mountains and valleys, crossed marshes, rivers, quagmires and breaks, glided over the seas without sinking, were frozen in Siberia and scorched in Africa, climbed the Himalayas, descended Mont Blanc, and at length, after thirty-six hours of a journey, the like of which had never been seen, both stopped out of breath in the public square of the village. A seneschal harnessed to a cow's tail is a sight not to be seen every day and all the peasants in the neighbourhood crowded together to wonder at the spectacle. But, torn as he was by the cactuses of Barbary and the thickets of Tartary, the seneschal had lost nothing of his haughty air. With a threatening gesture he dispersed the rabble and limped to his house to taste the repose of which he had begun to feel the need. CHAPTER Six. While the steward, the bailiff and the seneschal were experiencing these little unpleasantnesses, of which they did not think it proper to boast, Preparations were being made for a great event at Kerver Castle, namely the marriage of Yvonne and the fair-haired lady. Two days had passed in these preparations, and all the friends of the family had gathered together for twenty leagues round, when one fine morning Yvonne and his bride, with the Baron and Baroness Kerver, took their seats in a great carriage, adorned with flowers, and set out for the celebrated church of St. Maclau. A hundred knights, in full armour, mounted on horses decked with ribbons, rode on each side of the betrothed couple, each with his visor raised and his lance at rest in token of honour. By the side of each baron, a squire, also on horseback, carried the seigneurial banner. At the head of the procession rode the seneschal, with the gilded staff in his hand. Behind the carriage gravely walked the bailiff, followed by the vassals, while the steward railed at the serfs, a noisy and curious rabble. As they were crossing a brook a league from the castle, one of the traces of the carriage broke, and they were forced to stop. The accident repaired, the coachman cracked his whip, and the horses started with such force that the new trace broke in three pieces. Six times this provoking piece of wood was replaced, and six times it broke anew without drawing the carriage from the hole where it was wedged. Everyone had a word of advice to offer. Even the peasants, as wheelwrights and carpenters, were not the last to make a show of their knowledge. This gave the steward courage, he approached the baron, took off his cap, and scratching his head, "'My lord,' said he, "'in the house that you see shining yonder among the trees, there lives a woman who does things such as nobody else can do. Only persuade her to lend you her tongs, and in my humble opinion they will hold till morning.' The baron made a sign, and ten peasants ran to the cottage of Finette, who very obligingly lent them her gold tongs. They were put in the place of the trace, the coachman cracked his whip, and off went the carriage like a feather. Everyone rejoiced, but the joy did not last long. A hundred steps farther, lo, the bottom of the carriage gave way. Little more, and the noble Kerver family would have sunk quite out of sight. The wheelwrights and the carpenters set to work at once. They sawed planks, nailed them down fast, and in the twinkling of an eye repaired the accident. The coachman cracked his whip, and the horses started, when, behold, half of the carriage was left behind. The Baroness Kerver sat motionless by the side of the bride, while Yvonne and the Baron were carried off at full gallop. Here was a new difficulty. Three times was the carriage mended, three times it broke anew. There was every reason to believe it was enchanted. 
every one had a word of advice to offer. This gave the bailiff courage. He approached the baron, and said in a low tone, "'My lord, in the house that you see shining yonder among the trees, there lives a woman who does things such as nobody else can do. Only persuade her to lend you her door for the bottom of the carriage, and, in my opinion, it will hold till morning.' The baron made a sign, and twenty peasants ran to the cottage of Finette, who very obligingly lent them her gold door. They put it in the bottom of the carriage, where it fitted as if it had been made expressly for it. The party took their seats in the carriage, the coachman cracked his whip, the church was in sight, and all the troubles of the journey seemed ended. Not at all. Suddenly the horses stopped and refused to draw. There were four of them. Six, eight, ten, twenty-four more were put to the carriage, but all in vain. It was impossible to stir them. The more they were whipped, the deeper the wheels sunk into the ground like the coulter of a plough. What were they to do? To go on foot would have been a disgrace. To mount a horse and ride to the church like simple peasants was not the custom of the Kerverse. They tried to lift the carriage, they pushed the wheels, they shook it, they pulled it, but all in vain. Meanwhile the day was declining, and the hour of the marriage had passed. Everyone had a word of advice to offer. This gave the Seneschal courage. He approached the Baron, alighted from his horse, raised his velvet cap, and said, "'My lord, in the house that you see shining yonder among the trees,' There lives a woman who does things such as nobody else can do. Only persuade her to lend you her cow to draw the carriage, and in my opinion she will draw it till morning. The baron made a sign, and thirty peasants ran to the cottage of Finette, who very obligingly lent them her golden-horned cow. To go to church drawn by a cow was not, perhaps, what the ambitious bride had dreamed of, but it was better than to remain unmarried in the road. The heifer was harnessed, therefore, before the horses, and everybody looked on anxiously to see what this boasted animal was capable of doing. But before the coachman had time to crack his whip, lo, the cow started off as if she were about to go around the world anew. Horses, carriage, baron, betrothed, coachman, all were hurried away by the furious animal. In vain the knights spurred their horses to follow the pair, in vain the peasants ran at full speed, taking the crossroads and cutting across the meadows. The carriage flew as if it had wings, a pigeon could not have followed it. On reaching the door of the church, the party, a little disturbed by this rapid journey, would not have been sorry to alight. Everything was ready for the ceremony, and the bridal pair had long been expected, but, instead of stopping, the cow redoubled her speed. Thirteen times she ran around the church like lightning, then suddenly made her way in a straight line across the fields to the castle, with such force that the whole party were almost shaken to pieces before their arrival. CHAPTER Seven. No marriage was to be thought of for that day, but the tables were set and the dinner served, and the Baron Kerver was too noble a knight to take leave of his brave Bretons until they had eaten and drunk according to custom, that is, from sunset till sunrise, and even a little later. Orders were given for the guests to take their seats. Ninety-six tables were ranged in eight rows. In front of them, on a large platform covered with velvet, with a canopy in the middle, was a table larger than the rest, and loaded with fruits and flowers, to say nothing of the roast hares and the peacocks smoking beneath their plumage. At this table the bridal pair were to have been seated, in full sight, in order that nothing might be lacking to the pleasures of the feast, and that the meanest peasant might have the honour of saluting them by emptying his cup of hydromel to the honour and prosperity of the high and mighty house of Kerver. The baron seated the hundred knights at his table, and placed their squires behind their chairs to serve them. At his right he put the bride and Yvonne, but he left the seat at his left vacant, and, calling a page, "'Child,' said he, "'run to the house of the stranger lady who obliged us only too much this morning. It was not her fault if her success exceeded her good will. Tell her that the Baron Curver thanks her for her help, and invites her to the wedding feast of his son, Lord Yvonne.' On reaching the golden house, where Finette, in tears, was mourning for her beloved, the page bent one knee to the ground, and in the baron's name invited the stranger lady to the castle to do honour to the wedding of Lord Yvonne. "'Thank your master for me,' answered the young girl proudly, "'and tell him that if he is too noble to come to my house, I am too noble to go to his.' When the page repeated this answer to his master, the baron curver struck the table such a blow that three plates flew into the air. "'By my honour," said he, "'this is spoken like a lady, and for the first time I own myself beaten. "'Quick!' "'Saddle my dun mare, and let my knights and squires prepare to attend me.' 
It was with this brilliant train that the Baron alighted at the door of the Golden Cottage. He begged Finette's pardon, held the stirrup for her, and seated her behind him on his own horse, neither more nor less than a duchess in person. Through respect he did not speak a single word to her on the way. On reaching the castle he uncovered his head and led her to the seat of honour that he had chosen for her. The Baron's departure had made great excitement, and his return caused still greater surprise. Every one asked who the lady could be that the Baron treated with such respect. Judging from her costume she was a foreigner. Could she be the Duchess of Normandy, or the Queen of France? The steward, the bailiff, and the seneschal were appealed to. The steward trembled, the bailiff turned pale, and the seneschal blushed, but all three were as mute as fishes. The silence of these important personages added to the general wonder. All eyes were fixed on Finette, who felt a deadly chill at her heart, for Yvonne saw, but did not know her. He cast an indifferent glance at her, then began to talk in a tender tone to the fair-haired lady, who smiled disdainfully. Finette, in despair, took from the purse the golden bullet, her last hope. While talking with the Baron, who was charmed with her wit, she shook the little ball in her hand, and repeated in a whisper, "'Golden bullet, precious treasure, save me if it be thy pleasure.' And behold, the bullet grew larger and larger, until it became a goblet of chaste gold, the most beautiful cup that ever graced the table of baron or king. Finette filled the cup herself with spiced wine, and calling the seneschal, who was cowering behind her, she said in her gentlest tones, "'My good seneschal, I entreat you to offer this goblet to Lord Javon. I wish to drink his health, and I am sure that he will not refuse me this pleasure.' Yvonne took the goblet, which the seneschal presented to him on a salver of enamel and gold, with a careless hand, bowed to the stranger, drank the wine, and setting his cup on the table before him, turned to the fair-haired lady who occupied all his thoughts. The lady seemed anxious and vexed. He whispered a few words in her ear that seemed to please her, for her eyes sparkled, and she placed her hand again in his. Finette cast down her head and began to weep. All was over. "'Children!' cried the baron, in a voice of thunder. "'Fill your glasses. Let us all drink to the noble stranger who honours us with her presence. To the lovely lady of the golden cottage!' All began to huzzah and drink. Yvonne contented himself with raising his goblet to a level with his eyes. Suddenly he started and stood mute, his mouth open, and his eyes fixed like a man who has a vision. It was a vision. In the gold of the goblet, Yvonne saw his past life as in a mirror the giant pursuing him, Finette dragging him along, both embarking in the ship that saved them, both landing on the shore of Brittany, he quitting her for an instant, she weeping at his departure. Where was she? By his side, of course. What other woman than Finette could be at the side of Yvonne? He turned toward the fair-haired lady, and cried out like a man treading on a serpent. Then, staggering as if he were drunk, he rose and looked around him with haggard eyes. At the sight of Finette he clasped his trembling hands, and, dragging himself toward her, fell on his knees and exclaimed, "'Finette, forgive me!' To forgive is the height of happiness. Before evening Finette was seated by the side of Yvonne, both weeping and smiling. And what became of the fair-haired lady? No one knows. At the cry of Yvonne she disappeared, but it was said that a wretched old hag was seen flying on a broomstick over the castle walls, chased by the dogs, and it was the common opinion among the Carevers that the fair-haired lady was none other than the witch, the godmother of the giant. I am not sure enough of the fact, however, to dare warrant it. It is always prudent to believe, without proof, that a woman may be a witch, but it is never wise to say so. What I can say, on the word of a historian, is that the feast, interrupted for a moment, went on gayer than ever. Early the next morning they went to the church, where, to the joy of his heart, Yvonne married Finette, who was no longer afraid of evil spirits. After which they ate, drank, and danced for thirty-six hours, without any one thinking of resting. The steward's arms were a little heavy, the bailiff rubbed his back at times, and the seneschal felt a sort of weariness in his limbs. But all three had a weight on their consciences, which they could not shake off, and which made them tremble and flutter, till finally they fell on the ground and were carried off. Finette took no other vengeance on them. Her only desire was to render all happy around her, far and near, who belonged to the noble house of Kerver. Her memory still lives in Brittany, and, among the ruins of the old castle, anyone will show you the statue of the good lady,
with five bullets in her hand. End of part two of Yvonne and Finette, A Tale of Brittany. Recording by Lucy Perry, in Bath, on May 1st, 2009. Story number 18 of The Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 18 the fair one with the golden locks. There was once a king's daughter, so beautiful that they named her the fair one with golden locks. These golden locks were the most remarkable in the world, soft and fine, and falling in long waves down to her very feet. She wore them always thus, loose and flowing, surmounted with a wreath of flowers, and though such long hair was sometimes rather inconvenient. It was so exceedingly beautiful, shining in the sun like ripples of molten gold, that everybody agreed she fully deserved her name. Now there was a young king of a neighboring country, very handsome, very rich, and wanting nothing but a wife to make him happy. He heard so much of the various perfections of the fair one with golden locks, that at last, without even seeing her, he fell in love with her so desperately that he could neither eat nor drink, and resolved to send an ambassador at once to demand her in marriage. So he ordered a magnificent equipage, more than a hundred horses and hundred footmen, in order to bring back to him the fair one with golden locks, who, he never doubted, would be only too happy to become his queen. Indeed, he felt so sure of her that he refurnished the whole palace, and had made by all the dressmakers of the city dresses enough to last a lady for a lifetime. But, alas, when the ambassador arrived and delivered his message, Either the princess was in a bad humour, or the offer did not appear to be to her taste, for she returned her best thanks to his majesty, but said she had not the slightest wish or intention to be married. She also, being a prudent damsel, declined receiving any of the presents which the king had sent her, except that, not quite to offend his majesty, she retained a box of English pins, which were in that country of considerable value. When the ambassador returned, alone and unsuccessful, all the court was very much affected, and the king himself began to weep with all his might. Now there was in the palace household a young gentleman named Avenant, beautiful as the sun besides being at once so amiable and so wise that the king confided to him all his affairs, and every one loved him, except those people, to be found in all courts, who were envious of his good fortune. These malicious folk, hearing him say gaily, If the king had sent me to fetch the fair one with golden locks, I know she would have come back with me repeated the saying in such a manner that it appeared as if Avenant thought over much of himself and his beauty, and felt sure the princess would have followed him all over the world, which, when it came to the ears of the king, as it was meant to do, irritated him so much that he commanded Avenant to be imprisoned in a high tower and left to die there of hunger. The guards accordingly carried off the young man, who had quite forgotten his idle speech, and had not the least idea what fault he had committed. They ill-treated him very much, and then left him, with nothing to eat and only water to drink. This, however, kept him alive for a few days, during which he did not cease to complain aloud 
and to call upon the king, saying, O king, what harm have I done? You have no subject more faithful than I. Never have I had a thought which could offend you. And so it befell that the king, coming by chance, or else from a sense of remorse, past the tower, was touched by the voice of young Avenant, whom he had once so much regarded. In spite of all the courtiers could do to prevent him, he stopped to listen, and overheard these words. The tears rushed into his eyes. He opened the door of the tower and called, Avenant! Avenant came creeping feebly along, fell at the king's knees, and kissed his feet. Oh, sire, what have I done that you should treat me so cruelly? You have mocked me and my ambassador, for you said if I had sent you to fetch the fair one with golden locks, you would have been successful and brought her back. I did say it, and it was true, replied Avenant fearlessly, for I should have told her so much about your majesty and your various high qualities, which no one knows so well as myself that I am persuaded she would have returned with me. I believe it, said the king, with an angry look at those who had spoken ill of his favourite. He then gave Avenant a free pardon, and took him back with him to the court. After having supplied the famished youth with as much supper as he could eat, the king admitted him to a private audience, and said, I am as much in love as ever with the fair one with golden locks, so I will take thee at thy word, and send thee to try and win her for me. Very well, please your majesty, replied Avenant cheerfully. I will depart to-morrow. The king, overjoyed with his willingness and hopefulness, would have furnished him with a still more magnificent equipage and suite than the first ambassador. But Avenant refused to take anything except a good horse to ride and letters of introduction to the princess's father. The king embraced him and eagerly saw him depart. It was on a Monday morning when, without any pomp or show, Avenant thus started on his mission. He rode slowly and meditatively, pondering on every possible means of persuading the fair one with golden locks to marry the king. But, even after several days' journey toward her country, no clear project had entered into his mind. One morning, when he had started at break of day, he came to a great meadow with a stream running through it along which were planted willows and poplars. It was such a pleasant, rippling stream that he dismounted and sat down on its banks. There he perceived, gasping on the grass, a large golden carp, which, in leaping too far after the gnats, had thrown itself quite out of the water, and now lay dying on the greensward. Avenant took pity on it, and though he was very hungry, and the fish was very fat, and he would well enough have liked it for his breakfast, still he lifted it gently and put it back into the stream. No sooner had the carp touched the fresh cool water than it revived and swam away, but shortly returning it spoke to him from the water in this wise. Avenant, I thank you for your good deed. I was dying, and you have saved me. I will recompense you for this one day. After this pretty little speech, the fish popped down to the bottom of the stream, according to the habit of carp, leaving Avenant very much astonished, as was natural. Another day he met with a raven that was in great distress, being pursued by an eagle, which would have swallowed him up in no time. See, thought Avenant, how the stronger oppress the weaker. 
what right has an eagle to eat up a raven so taking his bow and arrow which he always carried he shot the eagle dead and the raven delighted perched in safety on an opposite tree abenant screeched he though not in the sweetest voice in the world you have generously succored me a poor miserable raven i am not ungrateful and i will recompense you one day thank you said abenant and continued his road entering in a thick wood so dark with the shadows of early morning that he could scarcely find his way he heard an owl hooting as if in great tribulation she had been caught by the nets spread by bird catchers to entrap finches larks and other small birds what a pity thought avenant that men must always torment poor birds and beasts who have done them no harm so he took out his knife and cut the net and let the owl go free she went sailing up into the air but immediately returned hovering over his head on her brown wings abenant she said at daylight the bird catchers would have been here and i should have been caught and killed i have a grateful heart i will recompense you one day these were the three principal adventures that befell avenant on his way to the kingdom of the fair one with golden locks arrived there he dressed himself with the greatest care in a habit of silver brocade and a hat adorned with plumes and scarlet and white he threw over all a rich mantle and carried a little basket in which was a lovely little dog an offering of respect to the princess with this he presented himself at the palace gates where even though he came alone his mien was so dignified and graceful so altogether charming that every one did him reverence and was eager to run and tell the fair one with golden locks that avenant another ambassador from the king her suitor awaited audience avenant repeated the princess that is a pretty name perhaps the youth is pretty too so oh, beautiful said the ladies of honour that while he stood under the palace window we could do nothing but look at him how silly of you sharply said the princess but she desired them to bring her robe of blue satin to comb out her long hair and adorn it with the freshest garlands of flowers to give her high-heeled shoes and her fan also added she take care that my audience chamber is well swept and my throne well dusted i wish in everything to appear as becomes the fair one with golden locks this done she seated herself on her throne of ivory and ebony and gave orders for her musicians to play but softly so as not to disturb conversation thus shining in all her beauty she admitted avenant to her presence he was so dazzled that at first he could not speak then he began and delivered his harangue to perfection gentle avenant returned the princess after listening to all his reasons for returning with him your arguments are very strong and i am inclined to listen to them but you must first find for me a ring which i dropped into the river about a month ago until i recover it i can listen to no propositions of marriage avenant surprised and disturbed made her a profound reverence and retired taking with him the basket and the little dog cabriole which she refused to accept all night long he sat sighing to himself how can i ever find a ring which she dropped into the river a month ago she has set me an impossibility my dear master said cabriole nothing is an impossibility to one so young and charming as you are let us go at daybreak to the riverside 
Avenant patted him, but replied nothing, until worn out with grief he slept. Before dawn Cabriol wakened him, saying, Master, dress yourself and let us go down to the river. There Avenant walked up and down, with his arms folded and his head bent, but saw nothing. At last he heard a voice calling from a distance, Avenant, Avenant! The little dog ran to the waterside. Never believe me again, master, if it is not a golden carp with a ring in its mouth. Yes, Avenant, said the carp, this is the ring which the princess has lost. You saved my life in the willow meadow, and I have recompensed you. Farewell. Avenant took the ring gratefully and returned to the palace with Cabriole who scampered about in great glee. Craving an audience, he presented the princess with her ring, and begged her to accompany him to his master's kingdom. She took the ring, looked at it, and she was surely dreaming. Some fairy must have assisted you, fortunate Avenant, said she. Madame, I am fortunate only in my desire to obey your wishes. Obey me still, she said graciously. There is a prince named Gallifron, whose suit I have refused. He is a giant as tall as a tower, who eats a man as a monkey eats a nut. He puts cannons in his pockets instead of pistols, and when he speaks his voice is so loud that everyone near him becomes deaf. Go and fight him, and bring me his head." Avenant was thunderstruck, but after a time he recovered himself. Very well, madam, I shall certainly perish, but I will perish like a brave man. I will depart at once to fight the giant Gallifron. The princess, now in her turn surprised and alarmed, tried every persuasion to induce him not to go, but in vain. Avenant armed himself and started carrying his little dog in its basket. Cabriol was the only creature that gave him consolation. Courage, master! While you attack the giant, I will bite his legs. He will stoop down to strike me, and then you can knock him on the head. Avenant smiled at the little dog's spirit, but he knew it was useless. Arrived at the castle of Gallifron, he found the road all strewn with bones and carcasses of men. Soon he saw the giant walking. His head was level with the highest trees, and he sang in a terrific voice, Bring me babies to devour, more, 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 more. Men and women tender and tough, all the world holds not enough to which Avenant replied, imitating the tune. Avenant, you hear, may see, he is come to punish thee. He be tender, he be tough, to kill thee, giant, he is enough. Hearing these words, the giant took up his massive club, looked around for the singer, and perceiving him would have slain him on the spot, had not a raven, sitting on a tree close by, suddenly flown down upon him and picked out both his eyes. Then Avenant easily killed him and cut off his head, while the raven watching him said, You shoot an eagle who was pursuing me. I promised to recompense you, and today I have done it. We are quits. No, it is I who am your debtor, Sir Raven replied Avenant, as, hanging the frightful head to his saddle-bow, he mounted his horse and rode back to the city of the fair one with golden locks. There everybody followed him, shouting, Here is brave Avenant, who has killed the giant, until the princess, hearing the noise, and fearing it was Avenant himself who was killed, appeared, all trembling, and even when he appeared with Gallifron's head, she trembled still, although she had nothing to fear. Madam, said Avenant, your enemy is dead, so I trust you will accept 
the hand of the king my master. I cannot, replied she thoughtfully, unless you first bring me a vial of the water of the grotto of darkness. It is six leagues in length and guarded at the entrance by two fiery dragons. Within it is a pit full of scorpions, lizards, and serpents, and at the bottom of this place flows the fountain of beauty and health. All who wash in it become, if ugly, beautiful, and if beautiful, beautiful for ever, if old, young, and if young, young for ever. Judge then, Avenant, if I can quit my kingdom without carrying with me some of this miraculous water. Madame, replied Avenant, you are already so beautiful that you require it not. But I am an unfortunate ambassador whose death you desire. I will obey you, though I know I shall never return. So he departed with his only friends, his horse and his faithful dog Cabriol, while all who met him looked at him compassionately, pitying so pretty a youth bound on such a hopeless errand. But however kindly they addressed him, Avenant rode on and answered nothing, for he was too sad at heart. He reached a mountainside where he sat down to rest, leaving his horse to graze and Cabriol to run after the flies. He knew that the grot of darkness was not far off, yet he looked about him like one who sees nothing. At last he perceived a rock as black as ink, whence came a thick smoke, and in a moment appeared one of the two dragons, breathing out flames. It had a yellow and green body, and claws, and a long tail. When Cabriol saw the monster, the poor little dog hid himself in terrible fright. But Avenant resolved to die bravely, so taking a vial which the princess had given him, he prepared to descend into the cave. Cabriol, said he, I shall soon be dead. Then fill this vial with my blood and carry it to the fair one with golden locks, and afterwards to the king my master, to show him I have been faithful to the last. While he was thus speaking, a voice called, Avenant, Avenant, and he saw an owl sitting on a hollow tree. Said the owl, You cut the net in which I was caught, and I vowed to recompense you. Now is the time. Give me the vial. I know every corner of the grotto of darkness. I will fetch you the water of beauty. Delighted beyond words, Avenant delivered up his vial. The owl flew with it into the grotto, and in less than half an hour reappeared, bringing it quite full and well corked. Avenant thanked her with all his heart, and joyfully took once more the road to the city. The fair one with golden locks had no more to say. She consented to accompany him back with all her suit to his master's court. On the way thither she saw so much of him and found him so charming that Avenant might have married her himself had he chosen but he would not have been false to his master for all the beauties under the sun. At length they arrived at the king's city, and the fair one with golden locks became his spouse and queen. But she still loved Avenant in her heart, and often said to the king her lord, But for Avenant I should not be here. He has done all sorts of impossible deeds for my sake. He has fetched me the water of beauty, and I shall never grow old. In short, I owe him everything. And she praised him in this sort so much, that at length the king became jealous, and though Avenant gave him not the slightest cause of offence, he shut him up in the same high tower once more, but with irons on his hands and feet, 
and a cruel jailer besides, who fed him with bread and water only. His sole companion was his little dog Cabriole. When the fair one with golden locks heard of this, she reproached her husband for his ingratitude, and then, throwing herself at his knees, implored that Avenant might be set free. But the king only said, She loves him, and refused the prayer. The queen entreated no more, but fell into a deep melancholy. When the king saw it, he thought she did not care for him, because he was not handsome enough, and that if he could wash his face with a water of beauty, it would make her love him more. He knew that she kept it in a cabinet in her chamber, where she could find it always. Now it happened that a waiting maid, in cleaning out this cabinet, had the very day before knocked down the vial, which was broken in a thousand pieces, and all the contents were lost. Very much alarmed, she then remembered seeing in a cabinet belonging to the king a similar vial. This she fetched and put in the place of the other one, in which was the water of beauty. But the king's vial contained the water of death. It was a poison, used to destroy great criminals, that is, noblemen, gentlemen, and such like instead of hanging them or cutting their heads off, like common people. They were compelled to wash their faces with this water, upon which they fell asleep and woke no more. So it happened that the king, taking up this vial, believing it to be the water of beauty, washed his face with it, fell asleep, and died. Cabriol heard the news and gliding in and out among the crowd, which clustered round the young and lovely widow, whispered softly to her, Madame, do not forget poor Avenant. If she had been disposed to do so, the sight of his little dog would have been enough to remind her of him, his many sufferings and his great fidelity. She rose up without speaking to anybody, and went straight to the tower where Avenant was confined. There, with her own hands, she struck off his chains, and, putting a crown of gold on his head and a purple mantle on his shoulders, said to him, Be king, and my husband. Avenant could not refuse, for in his heart he had loved her all the time. He threw himself at her feet, and then took the crown and sceptre, and ruled her kingdom like a king. All the people were delighted to have him as their sovereign. The marriage was celebrated in all imaginable pomp, and Avenant and the fair one with golden locks lived and reigned happily together all their days. End of the Fair One with Golden Locks Read by Lars Rolander Story 19 of The Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Julie van Mannichem The Fairy Ring Edited by Kate Douglas Wigan and Nora Archibald Smith. Story nineteen of the Little Good Mouse. Once upon a time, there lived a king and queen, who loved each other so much that they were never happy unless they were together. Day after day, they went out hunting or fishing. Night after night, they went to balls or to the opera. They sang and danced and ate sugar plums and were the gayest of the gay, and all their subjects followed their example, so that the kingdom was called the joyous land. Now in the next kingdom everything was as different as it could possibly be. The king was sulky and savage, and never enjoyed himself at all. He looked so ugly and cross that all his subjects feared him, and he hated the very sight of a cheerful face. So if he ever caught anyone smiling, he had his head cut off that very minute. 
this kingdom was very appropriately called the land of tears now when this wicked king heard of the happiness of the jolly king he was so jealous that he collected a great army and set out to fight him and the news of his approach was soon brought to the king and queen the queen when she heard of it was frightened out of her wits and began to cry bitterly sire she said let us collect all our riches and run away as far as ever we can to the other side of the world but the king answered fie madam i am far too brave for that it is better to die than to be a coward then he assembled all his armed men and after bidding the queen a tender farewell he mounted his splendid horse and rode away when he was lost to his sight the queen could do nothing but weep and wring her hands and cry alas what will become of me and of my little daughter and she was so sorrowful that she could neither eat nor sleep the king sent her a letter every day but at last one morning as she looked out of the palace window she saw a messenger approaching in hot haste what news corre what news cried the queen and he answered the battle is lost and the king is dead and in another moment the enemy will be here the poor queen fell back insensible and all her ladies carried her to her bed and stood round her weeping and wailing then began a tremendous noise and confusion and they knew that the enemy had arrived and very soon they heard the king himself stamping about the place seeking the queen then her ladies put the little princess into her arms and covered her up hat and all in the bedclothes and ran for their lives and the poor queen lay there shaking and hoping she would not be found but very soon the wicked king clattered into the room and in a fury because the queen would not answer when he called to her he tore back her silken coverings and tweaked off her lace cap and when all her lovely hair came tumbling down over her shoulders he wound it three times round his hand and threw her over his shoulder where he carried her like a sack of flour the poor queen held her little daughter safe in her arms and shrieked for mercy but the wicked king only mocked her and begged her to go on shrieking as it amused him and so mounted his great black horse and rode back to his own country when he got there he declared that he would have the queen and the little princess hanged on the nearest tree but his courtiers said that seemed a pity for when the baby grew up she would be a very nice wife for the king's only son the king was rather pleased with this idea and shut the queen up in the highest room of a tall tower which was very tiny and miserably furnished with a table and a very hard bed upon the floor then he sent for a fairy who lived near his kingdom and after receiving her with more politeness than he generally showed and entertaining her at a sumptuous feast he took her up to see the queen the fairy was so touched by the sight of her misery that when she kissed her hands she whispered courage madam i think i see a way to help you the queen a little comforted by these words received her graciously and begged her to take pity upon the poor little princess who had met with such a sudden reverse of fortune but the king got very cross when he saw them whispering together and cried harshly make an end of these fine speeches madam i brought you here to tell me if the child will grow up pretty and fortunate then the fairy answered that a princess would be as pretty and clever and well brought up as it was possible to be and the old king growled to the queen that it was lucky for her that it was so as if they would certainly have been hanged if it were otherwise then he stamped off taking the fairy with him and leaving the poor queen in tears how can i wish my little daughter to grow up pretty if she is to be married to that horrid little dwarf the king's son she said to herself and yet if she is ugly we shall both be killed if i could only hide her away somewhere so that the cruel king could never find her as the days went on 
the queen and the little princess grew thinner and thinner, for their hard-hearted jailer gave them every day only three boiled peas and a tiny morsel of black bread, so that they were always terribly hungry. At last, one evening, as the queen sat at a spinning wheel, for the king was so avaricious that she was made to work day and night, she saw a tiny pretty little mouse creep out of a hole, and said to it, Alas, little creature, what are you coming to look for here? I only have three peas for my day's provision, so unless you wish to fast you must go elsewhere. But the mouse ran hither and thither, and danced and capered so prettily, that at last the queen gave it her last pea, which she was keeping for her supper, saying, Here, little one, eat it up. I have nothing better to offer you, but I give this willingly in return for the amusement I have had from you. She had hardly spoken when she saw upon the table a delicious little roast partridge and two dishes of preserved fruit. Truly, said she, a kind action never goes unrewarded. And she and the little princess ate their supper with great satisfaction, and then the queen gave what was left to the little mouse, who danced better than ever afterwards. The next morning came the jailer with the queen's allowance of three peas, which he brought in upon a large dish to make them look smaller. But as soon as he set it down, the little mouse came and ate up all three, so that when the queen wanted her dinner, there was nothing left for her. Then she was quite provoked, and said, "'What a bad little beast that mouse must be! If it goes on like this, I shall be starved!' But when she glanced at the dish again, it was covered with all sorts of nice things to eat, and the queen made a very good dinner, and was gayer than usual over it. But afterwards, as she sat at her spinning wheel, she began to consider what would happen if the little princess did not grow up pretty enough to please the king, and she said to herself, Oh, if I could only think of some way of escaping! As she spoke, she saw the little mouse playing in a corner with some long straws. The queen took them and began to play them, saying, If only I had straws enough! I would make a basket with them, and let my baby down in it from the window to any kind passer-by who would take care of her. By the time the straws were all plated, the little mouse had dragged in more and more, until the queen had plenty to make her basket, and she worked at it day and night, while the little mouse danced for her amusement, and at dinner and supper-time the queen gave it the three peas and the bit of black bread and always found something good in the dish in their place. She really could not imagine where all the nice things came from. At last one day, when the basket was finished, the queen was looking out of the window to see how long a cord she must make to lower it to the bottom of the tower, when she noticed a little old woman, who was leaning upon her stick and looking up at her. Presently she said, "'I know your trouble, madam. If you like, I will help you.' "'Oh, my dear friend,' said the queen, "'if you really wish to be of use to me, "'you will come at the time that I will appoint, "'and I will let down my poor little baby in a basket. "'If you will take her and bring her up for me, "'when I am rich I will reward you splendidly.' "'I don't care about the reward,' said the old woman. "'There is one thing I should like. "'You must know that I am very particular about what I eat.' And if there is one thing that I fancy above all others, it is a plump, tender little mouse. If there is such a thing in your garret, just throw it down to me, and in return I will promise that your little daughter shall be well taken care of. The queen, when she heard this, began to cry, but made no answer, and the old woman, after waiting a few minutes, asked her what was the matter. Why, said the queen, there is only one mouse in this garret, and that is such a dear, pretty little thing, that I cannot bear to think of its being killed. What? cried the old woman in a rage. Do you care more for a miserable mouse than for your own baby? Good-bye, madam. I leave you to enjoy its company, and for my own part I thank my stars that I can get plenty of mice without troubling you to give them to me. And she hobbled off, grumbling and growling. 
as to the queen, she was so disappointed that, in spite of finding a better dinner than usual, and seeing the little mouse dancing in its merriest mood, she could do nothing but cry. That night, when her baby was fast asleep, she packed it into the basket, and wrote on a slip of paper, This unhappy little girl is called Delicia. This she pinned to its robe, and then very sadly she was shutting the basket, when in sprang the little mouse and sat on the baby's pillow. "'Ah, little one,' said the queen, "'it cost me dear to save your life. How shall I know now whether my Delicia is being taken care of or not? Any one else would have let a greedy old woman have you and eat you up, but I could not bear to do it.' Whereupon the mouse answered, "'Believe me, madam, you will never repent of your kindness.' The queen was immensely astonished when the mouse began to speak, and still more so, when she saw its little sharp nose turned to a beautiful face, and its paws to hands and feet. Then it suddenly grew tall, and the queen recognized the fairy who had come with the wicked king to visit her. The fairy smiled at her astonished look, and said, "'I wanted to see if you were faithful and capable of feeling a real friendship for me. For you see, we fairies are rich in everything but friends, and those are hard to find. It is not possible that you should want for friends, you charming creature, said the queen, kissing her. Indeed it is so, the fairy said. For those who are only friendly with me for their own advantage, I do not count at all. But when you cared for the poor little mouse, you could not have known there was anything to be gained by it and to try you further, I took the form of the old woman who you talked to from the window, and then I was convinced that you really loved me. Then, turning to the little princess, she kissed her rosy lips three times, saying, Dear little one, I promise that you shall be richer than your father, and shall live a hundred years, always pretty and happy, without fear of old age and wrinkles. The queen, quite delighted, thanked the fairy gratefully, and begged her to take charge of the little Delicia, and bring her up as her own daughter. This she agreed to do, and then they shut the basket and lowered it carefully, baby and all, to the ground at the foot of the tower. The fairy then changed herself back into the form of a mouse, and this delayed her a few seconds, after which she ran nimbly down the straw rope, but only to find when she got to the bottom that the baby had disappeared. In the greatest terror she ran up again to the queen, crying, "'All is lost! My enemy, Cancelin, has stolen the princess away. You must know that she is a cruel fairy, who hates me, and as she is older than I am, and has more power, I can do nothing against her. I know no way of rescuing Delicia from her clutches.' When the queen heard this terrible news, she was heartbroken, and begged the fairy to do all she could to get the poor little princess back again. At this moment in came the jailer, and when he missed the little princess, he at once told the king, who came in a great fury, asking what a queen had done with her. She answered that a fairy, whose name she did not know, had come and carried her off by force. Upon this the king stamped upon the ground and cried in a terrible force, you shall be hung. I always told you, you shoot. And without another word, he dragged the unlucky queen out into the nearest wood, and climbed up into a tree to look for a branch to which he could hang her. But when he was quite high up, the fairy, who had made herself invisible, and followed them, gave him a sudden push, which made him lose his footing and fall to the ground with a crash, and break four of his teeth. And while he was trying to mend them, the fairy carried the queen off in a flying chariot to a beautiful castle, where she was so kind to her, that but for the loss of Delicia, the queen would have been perfectly happy. But though the good little mouse did her very utmost, they could not find out where Cancaline had hidden the little princess. Thus fifteen years went by, and the queen had somewhat recovered from her grief, when the news reached her that the son of the wicked king wished to marry the little maiden who kept the turkeys, and that she had refused him. The wedding dresses had been made, nevertheless, and the festivities were to be splendid, 
that all the people for leagues round were flocking in to be present at them. The queen felt quite curious about a little turkey maiden who did not wish to be a queen, so the little mouse conveyed herself to the poultry-yard to find out what she was like. She found the turkey maiden sitting upon a big stone, barefooted, and miserably dressed in an old coarse linen gown and cap. The ground at her feet was all strewn with ropes of gold and silver, ribbons and laces, diamonds and pearls over which the turkeys were stalking to and fro, while the king's ugly, disagreeable son stood opposite her, declaring angrily that if she would not marry him she should be killed. The turkey maiden answered proudly, "'I never will marry you. You are too ugly and too much like your cruel father. Leave me in peace with my turkeys, which I like far better than all your fine gifts.' The little mouse watched her with the greatest admiration, for she was as beautiful as a spring, and as soon as the wicked prince was gone, she took the form of an old peasant woman and said to her, "'Good day, my pretty one. You have a fine flock of turkeys there.' The young turkey maiden turned her gentle eyes upon the old woman and answered, "'Yet they wish me to leave them to become a miserable queen. What is your advice upon the matter?' "'My child,' said the fairy, "'a crown is a very pretty thing, but you know neither the price nor the weight of it.' "'I know so well that I have refused to wear one,' said the little maiden, "'though I don't know who was my father, or who was my mother, and I have not a friend in the world.' You have goodness and beauty, which are of more value than ten kingdoms. But tell me, child, how came you here, and how is it you have neither father nor mother nor friend? A fairy called Cancaline is the cause of my being here, answered she, for while I lived with her I got nothing but blows and harsh words, until at last I could bear it no longer, and ran away from her without knowing where I was going and as I came through a wood, the wicked prince met me and offered to give me charge of the poultry-yard. I accepted gladly, not knowing that I should have to see him day by day, and now he wants to marry me, but that I will never consent to. Upon hearing this, the fairy became convinced that a little turkey maiden was none other than the prince's delicia. "'What is your name, my little one?' said she. "'I am called Delicia, if it please you,' she answered. Then the fairy threw her arms round the princess's neck, and nearly smothered her with kisses, saying, "'Ah, Delicia, I am a very old friend of yours, and I am truly glad to find you at last. But you might look nicer than you do in that old gown, which is only fit for a kitchen-maid. Take this pretty dress, and let us see the difference it will make.' So Delicia took off the ugly cap, and shook out all her fair shining hair, and bathed her hands and face in clear water from the nearest spring till her cheeks were like roses, and when she was adorned with the diamonds and the splendid robe the fairy had given her, she looked the most beautiful princess in the world, and the fairy with great delight cried, "'Now you look as you ought to look, Delicia. What do you think about it yourself?' And Delicia answered, I feel as if I were the daughter of some great king. "'And would you be glad if you were?' asked the fairy. "'Indeed I should,' answered she. "'Oh, well,' said the fairy, "'to-morrow I may have some pleasant news for you.' So she hurried back to her castle, where the queen sat busy with her embroidery, and cried, "'Well, madam, will you wake your thimble and your golden needle, that I am bringing you the best news you could possibly hear?' Alas, sighed the queen, since the death of the jolly king and the loss of my delicia, all the news in the world is not worth a pin to me. There, there, don't be melancholy, said the fairy. I assure you, the princess is quite well, and I have never seen her equal for beauty. She might be queen to-morrow, if she chose. And then she told all that had happened, and the queen first rejoiced over the thought of delicious beauty, and then wept at the idea of her being a turkey maiden. "'I will not hear of her being made to marry the wicked king's son,' she said. "'Let us go at once and bring her here.' In the meantime, the wicked prince, 
who was very angry with Delicia, had set himself down under a tree, and cried and howled with rage and spite, until the king heard him and cried out from the window, "'What is the matter with you, that you are making all this disturbance?' The prince replied, "'It is all because our turkey maiden will not love me.' "'Won't love ye?' said the king. "'We'll very soon see about that.' So he called his guards, and told them to go and fed Delicia. "'See if I don't make a change in mind pretty soon,' said the wicked king with a chuckle. Then the guards began to search the poultry-yard, and could find nobody there but Delicia, who, with her splendid dress and her crown of diamonds, looked such a lovely princess that they hardly dared to speak to her. But she said to them very politely, "'Pray tell me, what are you looking for here?' Madam, they answered, we are sent for an insignificant little person called Delicia. Alas, said she, that is my name. What can you want with me? So the guards tied her hands and feet with thick robes for fear she might run away, and brought her to the king who was waiting with his son. When he saw her, he was very much astonished at her beauty which would have made any one less hard-hearted sorry for her. But the wicked king only laughed, and mocked at her, and cried, "'Well, little fright, little toad, why don't you love my son, who is far too handsome and too good for you? Make haste and begin to love him this instant, or you shall be tarred and feathered.' Then the poor little princess, shaking with terror, went down on her knees, crying, "'Oh, don't tar and feather me, please. It would be so uncomfortable. Let me have two or three days to make up my mind, and then you shall do as you like with me. The wicked prince would have liked very much to see her tarred and feathered, but the king ordered that she should be shut up in a dark dungeon. It was just at this moment that the queen and the fairy arrived in the flying chariot, and the queen was dreadfully distressed at the turn affairs had taken, and said miserably that she was destined to be unfortunate all her days. But the fairy bade her take courage. "'I'll pay them out yet,' said she, nodding her head with an air of great determination. That very same night, as soon as the wicked king had gone to bed, the fairy changed herself into his little mouse, and creeping up onto his pillow, nibbled his ear, so that he squealed out quite loudly, and turned over on his other side. But that did no good, for the little mouse only set to work and gnawed away at the second ear until it hurt more than the first one. Then the king cried, Murder! and Thieves! and all his guards ran to see what was the matter. But they could find nothing and nobody, for the little mouse had run off to the prince's room, and was serving him in exactly the same way. All night long she ran from one to the other, until at last, driven quite frantic by terror and want of sleep, the king rushed out of the palace, crying, "'Help! Help! I am pursued by rats!' The prince, when he heard this, got up also, and ran after the king, and they had not gone far, when they both fell into the river, and were never heard of again." Then the good fairy ran to tell the queen, and they went together to the black dungeon, where Delicia was imprisoned. The fairy touched each door with her wand, and it sprang open instantly, but they had to go through forty before they came to the princess, who was sitting on the floor, looking very dejected. But when the queen rushed in, and kissed her twenty times in a minute, and laughed and cried, and told her all her history, the princess was wild with delight. Then the fairy showed her all the wonderful dresses and jewels she had brought for her, and said, "'Don't let us waste time. We must go and harangue the people.' So she walked first, looking very serious and dignified, and wearing a dress the train of which was at least ten ells long. Behind her came the queen, wearing a blue velvet robe, embroidered with gold and a diamond crown that was brighter than the sun itself. Last of all walked Delicia, who was so beautiful 
that it was nothing short of marvellous. They proceeded through the streets, returning the salutations of all they met, great or small, and all the people turned and followed them, wondering who these noble ladies could be. When the audience hall was quite full, the fairy said to the subjects of the wicked king that if they would accept Delicia, who was the daughter of the jolly king as their queen, she would undertake to find a suitable husband for her, and would promise that during their reign there should be nothing but rejoicing and merry-making, and all dismal things should be entirely banished. Upon this the people cried with one accord, We will, we will, we have been gloomy and miserable too long already. And they all took hands and danced round the queen and Delicia, and the good fairy singing, Yes, yes, we will, we will. Then there were feasts and fireworks in every street in the town, and early the next morning the fairy, who had been all over the world in the night, brought back with her in her flying chariot the most handsome and good-tempered prince she could find anywhere. He was so charming that Alicia loved him from the moment their eyes met, and as for him, of course he could not help thinking himself the luckiest prince in the world. The queen felt that she had really come to the end of her misfortunes at last, and they all lived happily ever after. End of the Little Good Mouse Story to any of the fairy ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. C. Y. The Fairy Ring. Edited by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 20. The Story of Blanche and Vermilion. There was once upon a time a widow, a very good kind of woman, who had daughters both very amiable. The elder was called Blanche, and the younger Vermilion. They had received these names, because one of them had the fairest complexion that was ever seen, and the other had cheeks and lips as red as coral. One day, as a good woman was seated near the door of a cottage spinning, she perceived a poor old woman who could hardly hobble along with the assistance of her stick. "'You appear to be very much tired, my good woman,' said the widow. "'Sit down here and rest yourself a while.' And she then desired one of her daughters to fetch her a chair. Both of them immediately rose, but Vermilion outran his sister and brought the chair. "'Will you please to drink?' said the good old dame to the old woman. "'With all my heart,' answered she, "'and I feel even as if I could eat a little, "'if you could give me a bit of something nice.' "'You shall be welcome to anything that I have,' said the good widow, "'but as I am poor, it would be nothing out of the common way.' At the same time she desired her daughter to lay the table for the good old dame, who straightway seated herself at it. The widow then told the elder daughter to go and gather some plums from a tree that she had planted herself, and was very fond of. Blanche, instead of obeying her mother willingly, murmured and said to herself, "'So it is for this old gormandizer that I have been so very careful of my plum tree.' She, however, dared not refuse to fetch a few plums, but she gave them with much reluctance and very ungraciously. "'You, Vermilion,' said the good woman to her younger daughter, "'have no fruit to give to this good dame, for your grapes are not ripe.' "'That's true,' said Vermilion. "'But I hear my hen cackling, so she must have laid an egg, "'and if the gentlewoman would like a new laid egg, she is very welcome to it.' And without waiting for any answer from the old woman, she ran off to seek her egg. The moment she presented it, however, the old woman disappeared, and was replaced by a beautiful lady, who said to the mother, "'I am about to recompense your two daughters according to their deserts. The elder shall become a great queen, and the younger a farmer's wife.' With these words she struck the house with her wand, 
it disappeared, and in its place rose a nice, snug-looking farm. "'That is your portion,' she said to Vermilion. "'I know that I have given each of you what you like best.' Having thus said, the fairy departed, and the good woman and her two daughters remained in great surprise. They went into the farmhouse, and were charmed with the neatness and the furniture. The chairs were only of wood, but they were so bright that one might see one's face in them, as in the looking-glass. The bedding was of Irish linen, as white as snow, and the pens were sheep, four oxen, and the like number of cows were in the cow-houses, and the yard was well stocked with all sorts of domestic animals, as poultry, ducks, pigeons, etc. There was also a pretty garden, planted with different kinds of fruit, vegetables, and flowers. Blanche regarded without any feelings of jealousy the fairy's gift to her sister. Her only thoughts were concerning the pleasures she anticipated in being a queen. All at once she heard a huntsman's horn, and going to the door to see the party pass, she appeared so beautiful to the king that he resolved to marry her, and did so accordingly. Blanche, when she was become a queen, said to her sister Vermilion, "'I do not wish that you should marry a farmer. Come to court with me, sister. I will procure you a great lord for your husband.' "'I am very obliged to you, sister,' replied Vermilion. "'But I am accustomed to a country life, and I do not wish to change it.' Queen Blanche then set out, and she was so gratified that she passed several nights without sleeping for joy. The first few months she was so taken up with fine clothes, balls, and plays that she thought of nothing else. But she soon grew used to these things, and nothing now amused her. On the contrary, she was very discontented. All the ladies of the court showed her great respect when they were in her presence, but she knew that they did not like her, and that they said to each other behind her back, "'See how this peasant girl plays the fine lady. The king must have had very poor taste to take such a personage for his consort.' The king heard of these remarks, and they made him reflect on what he had done. He began to think that he had acted wrongly in marrying Blanche, and as his passion for her had cooled, he soon neglected her. When the courtiers perceived that the king no longer loved his wife, they paid her little or no attention. She was very unfortunate, for she had not a single friend to whom she could impart her grief. She observed that it was the fashion at court to sacrifice one's friend to one's interests, to smile on one's bitterest enemy, and to tell lies continually. She was obliged to be serious, because she was told that a queen ought always to look grave and majestic. She had several children, and during all this time she was constantly attended by a physician, who examined everything that she ate, and ordered everything that she liked to be removed from the table. She was allowed no salt in her soup. She was forbidden to quit the house when she felt inclined to take a walk. In a word, she was contradicted from morning until night. Governesses were engaged for her children, who brought them up in direct opposition to her wishes, yet she was not permitted to find fault. Poor Queen Blanche was dying with sorrow, and she grew so thin that it was pitiable to see her. She had not seen her sister once during the three years that she had been a queen, because she thought it would be demeaning her high rank to pay a visit to a farmer's wife, but when she was quite oppressed with melancholy, she came to the resolution of spending a few days in the country to restore herself. She asked leave of the king to go, who permitted her very willingly, for he thought that he should thus get rid of her for some time. She set out, and arrived in the dusk of the evening at Vermilion's farm. As she was drawing near, she observed about the door a company of shepherds and shepherdesses who were dancing and merry-making in high glee. Alas, said the queen, sighing, there was once a time when I could divert myself like these poor people, and no one found fault with me. Directly she came inside, her sister ran to embrace her. She looked so happy, she had grown so plump, 
that the queen could not forbear crying when she looked at her. Vermilion had married a farmer's son, who had no fortune, but he never ceased to remember that his wife had brought him all that he possessed, and he strove by his obliging disposition to show his gratitude. Vermilion had not many servants, but those that she had were as fond of her as if she had been their mother, because she treated them well. All her neighbors also liked her, and they were all zealous in showing their love. She had not much money, nor had she any occasion for much, for her farm yielded her corn, wine, and oil. Her herds furnished her with milk, with which she made butter and cheese. She spun the wool supplied by her sheep into the materials of clothes for herself, her husband, and her two children. They all enjoyed excellent health, and in the evening, when the period of working had passed, they diverted themselves with all sorts of pastimes. Alas! cried the queen, the fairy made me a very evil present when she gave me a crown. Contentment is not to be found in magnificent palaces, but only in the innocent employments of a country life. These words had hardly passed her lips when the fairy appeared. It was not my intention when I made you queen to reward, but to punish you, said the fairy to her, for giving me your plums with so much ill will. To be truly contented and happy, you must, like your sister, possess only what is necessary, and wish for nothing more. Ah, madam, faltered Blanche, you are sufficiently revenged. I entreat you to put an end to my unhappiness. It is at an end, answered the fairy. The king, who no longer loves you, has just married another wife, and his officers will arrive here tomorrow to desire you, in his name, never to return to his court. It came to pass exactly as the fairy had foretold. Blanche passed the remainder of her days with her sister Vermilion, in all happiness and reasonable pleasure, and she never thought of the court again, except to thank the fairy for having brought her from it to her native village. End of the story of Blanche and Vermilion. Story twenty one of the Fairy Ring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Bassel, Whitchurch, Buckinghamshire, United Kingdom. The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wigan and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 21, Prince Desire and Princess Mignonetta. There was once upon a time a king who was passionately fond of a princess, but she could not be married because she was enchanted. He went to consult a fairy, to ascertain what he ought to do to make the princess love him. The fairy said to him, You know that the princess has a large cat, of which she is very fond. Well, she can marry that person only who can succeed in treading on her cat's tail. The king said to himself, That will not be very difficult to accomplish. And he quitted the fairy, determined rather to crush the cat's tail than to fail in treading on it. He hastened to his mistress's palace. Master Puss came to meet him, very consequentially, as was his wont. The king lifted up his foot, but when he thought to have put it on the cat's tail, Puss turned round so quickly that he trod on nothing but the floor. He was a week trying to tread on this fatal tail, which appeared to be full of quicksilver, for it was continually moving. But, at last, the king had the good fortune to surprise Master Puss while he was asleep, and trod upon his tail with all his weight. Puss awakened, mewing horribly, and immediately took the shape of a tall man, who, looking at the king with eyes full of anger, said to him, You may now marry the princess, since you have dissolved the enchantment which prevented you. But I will be revenged. You shall have a son who will always be unfortunate until the time when he shall become aware that his nose is too long. And, if you take any umbrage at what I threaten, you shall immediately be put to death. Although the king was frightened at the sight of this tall man, who was an enchanter, he could not help laughing at his threat. If my son's nose should be too long, said he to himself, unless he should be either blind or silly, he will certainly be able to see or feel it. When the enchanter had disappeared, 
the king went to find the princess, who consented to marry him. However, he did not live long with her, for he died eight months after the wedding. Shortly after his death, the queen gave birth to a young prince who was called Desire. He had the finest large blue eyes in the world, and a pretty little mouth. But his nose was so large that it covered half his face. The queen was inconsolable when she saw this large nose. But the ladies who were with her told her that the nose was not so large as it appeared to her to be, that it was a Roman nose, and that history averred that all heroes had large noses. The queen, who loved her son to excess, was charmed with this discourse, and, by continually looking at desire, his nose no longer appeared to be so very long. The prince was brought up very carefully, and, as soon as he could speak, all kinds of shocking stories were told to him of people who had short noses. No one was allowed to remain near him whose nose did not a little resemble his own, and the courtiers, to show the respect to the queen and her son, pulled their children's noses several times a day, with a view of lengthening them. They had, however, a difficult task, for their sons appeared to have hardly any nose at all compared with Prince Desire's. When he became old enough to understand it, he was instructed in history, and whenever any great prince or handsome princess was mentioned to him, he or she was always spoken of as having a long nose. The room was hung round with pictures in which all the figures had large noses, and Desire grew so accustomed to regard length of nose as an ornament that he would not for an empire have parted with an atom of his. When he had reached the age of twenty, it was thought expedient for him to marry, and the portraits of various princesses were submitted to him. He was in raptures with that of Mignonetta, the daughter of a great king, and heiress to several kingdoms. Of the kingdoms, however, Desire thought not at all. He was so much struck with her beauty. The Princess Mignonetta, although he was thus charmed with her, had a little turned-up nose which harmonized admirably with her other features, but which very much perplexed the courtiers. They had acquired such a habit of ridiculing small noses that they sometimes could not forbear laughing at that of the princess. But Desire would not suffer a jest on this subject, and he banished two courtiers from his presence, who dared to make insinuations against Mignonetta's nose. The others, warned by their fate, were more cautious, and there was one who said to the prince that, in truth, a man could not be amiable who had not a large nose, but that it was not the same in respect to woman, for a wise man, who spoke Greek, had informed him that he had read in an old manuscript that the fair Cleopatra had the end of her nose turned up. The prince made a magnificent present to the courtier who told him this good news, and dispatched ambassadors to demand Mignonetta in marriage. His proposal was accepted, and he was so anxious to see her that he went more than nine miles on the road to meet her. But just as he was stepping forward to kiss her hand, the enchanter appeared and carried off the princess before his face, leaving him quite inconsolable. Desire resolved never to re-enter his kingdom until he had discovered Mignonetta. He would not allow any of his courtiers to accompany him, and, mounting a good horse, he laid the bridle on his neck, allowed him to choose his own road. The horse presently came to a large plain, which he traversed the whole day without seeing a single house. Both horse and rider were ready to die with hunger. At last, as night was about to set in, they discovered a cave in which a light was burning. Desire entered, and saw a little old woman, who appeared to be more than a hundred years old. She put on her spectacles to look at the prince, but she was a long time adjusting them, for her nose was too short. The prince and the fairy, for it was a fairy, burst out laughing as they looked at each other, exclaiming simultaneously, "'Oh, what a comical nose!' "'Not so comical as yours,' said Desire. "'But, madam, let us leave our noses as they are, and have the goodness to give me something to eat, for both I and my poor horse are dying with hunger. With all my heart, answered the fairy, although your nose is ridiculous, you are not the less the son of my best friend. I loved the king, your father, like my own brother, but he had a very handsome nose. And what is there wanting in mine? asked Desire. Oh, it wants nothing, answered the fairy. On the contrary, there is far too much of it. But no matter, a man may be very good, and yet have too large a nose. I was saying, then, that I was your father's friend. At that time he frequently came to see me. And you must know that in those days I was very pretty. Your father told me so. I must repeat to you a conversation that we had together the last time he saw me. Very well, madam, said Desire. 
I will listen to you with a great deal of pleasure when I have had my supper. Consider, if you please, that I have eaten nothing today. The poor child is right, said the fairy. I did not think of that. I will prepare your supper, and, while you are eating, I will tell you my history in a few words, for I do not like long tales. A long tongue is still more insufferable than a large nose, and I remember, when I was young, that I was admired for not being a great talker. The queen, my mother, used frequently to have it mentioned to her, for such as you see me, I am a great king's daughter. My father, your father ate when he was hungry, said the prince, interrupting her. Yes, he did, doubtless, said the fairy, and you will also have your supper in a moment. I was merely going to tell you that my father, but I will not listen to a word until I have something to eat, said the prince, growing angry. He checked himself, however, for he wanted something of the fairy, and said, I know that the pleasure I should take in listening to you would make me forget my own hunger, but my horse, who will not understand you, is in need of some food. This compliment made the fairy blush prettily. You shall wait no longer, said she to Desire, calling her domestics. You are very polite, and, in spite of the size of your nose, you are very amiable. Plague take the old woman with my nose, said the prince to himself. One would have sworn that my mother had stolen what is wanting in hers to make mine with. If I were not hungry, I would leave this prey to Pace, who fancies that she is a little talker. One must be very stupid not to perceive one's own defects. That comes of her being born a princess. Flatterers have spoiled her, and persuaded her that she is a little talker. While that was passing in the prince's mind, the servants laid the table, and the prince wondered at the fairy, who kept asking them a thousand questions, solely to have the pleasure of talking. He was especially surprised at a waiting woman, who, in everything that she saw, praised her mistress for her discretion. Egad, thought he, as he was eating, I am delighted to have found my way here. This example demonstrates to me how wisely I have acted in not listening to flatterers, who praise all princes very shamelessly, concealing our defects from us, or representing them to us as perfections. But as for me, I shall never be their dupe. I know my own defects, God be thanked. Poor Desire quite thought he was right, and little imagined that those who had praised his nose had ridiculed it in their hearts, as the waiting woman was ridiculing the fairy, for the prince observed that she turned her head aside every now and then to laugh. With regard to himself, he did not say a word, but ate away as fast as he could. Prince, said the fairy to him when he began to be satisfied, move a little, I entreat you. Your nose makes so large a shadow that it prevents me from seeing what is on my plate. By the way, with regard to your father, I went to his court when he was quite a child, but it is forty years since I first retired into this solitude. Tell me a little how things are going on at court now. Are the ladies still as fond of running about? In my time they used to go on the same day to the promenade, to the assembly, to the theatre, to the ball. But how long your nose is! I cannot grow used to it. In truth, madam, answered Desire, do not say any more about my nose. It is as it is, and in what does it concern you? I am contented with it, and do not wish that it was any shorter. Every one to his taste. Oh, I perceive now I have hurt your feelings, my poor desire, said the fairy. But I did not intend to do so. On the contrary, I am your friend, and I wish to do you a service. But notwithstanding that, I cannot help being shocked at your nose. I will not, however, mention it to you again. I will even constrain myself to think that you are snub-nosed, though in truth there are materials enough in it to make three reasonable noses. Desire, who had finished his supper, grew so tired of the fairy's tedious prattle about his nose, that he sprang on his horse and rode away from the cavern. He continued his journey, and wherever he went, he thought that everybody was mad, for everybody talked about his nose. Nevertheless, he had been so accustomed to hear it asserted that his nose was handsome, that he could not reconcile to himself the idea that it was too long. The old fairy, who wished to do him a service in spite of himself, determined to shut up Mignonetta in a crystal palace, and place this palace in the prince's road. Desire, transported with joy, strove to break it, but he could not succeed. In despair, he wished to approach near it, so as at least to speak to the princess, who, on her part, stretched her hand close to the crystal wall of the palace. He was very anxious to kiss her hand, but turn his head which way he would, he could not place his mouth near it, his nose constantly preventing him. He then perceived for the first time its extraordinary length, and feeling all over it with his hand, I must confess, said he, that my nose is too large. 
At the moment he pronounced those words, the crystal palace vanished, and the fairy appeared leading Mignonetta by the hand, and saying, Confess that you are greatly obliged to me. I vainly wished to speak to you about your nose, but you would never have acknowledged its defect unless it had become an obstacle to your wishes. In this way, self-love conceals from us all the defects of our minds and bodies. In vain, reason endeavours to unveil them to us. We can never perceive them until the same self-love that blinds us to them finds them to be opposed to its interests. Desire, whose nose had become an ordinary nose, profited by this lesson. He married Mignonetta and lived very happily with her to a good old age. End of Prince Desire and Princess Mignonetta Story 22 of The Fairy Ring This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tisto, T-Y-S-T-O dot com. The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wigan and Nora Archibald Smith. Story 22, The Yellow Dwarf. There once lived a widowed queen who had one daughter. There had been several other children, you must know, but one by one they had died, until the beautiful Princess Allfair was the only child left. Time passed on, and every day the maiden grew more and more lovely, and, to tell the truth, she not only grew lovelier, she also became very vain indeed. Well, by the time she reached the age of eighteen, All Fair was so charming that she had won the hearts of twenty noble kings, and they all were courting her at the same time. But never a smile did they get from the fair princess. There was not a man living, be he king or peasant, who was good enough to become her husband, she said. So when the twenty kings heard this, nineteen of them took their hats at once and set off in a body to search for brides who were a little less charming and a little easier to please. But the twentieth man, the king of the golden mines, was so much in love with All Fair that he stayed behind in the hope that she would change her mind. This will never do, said the queen one day. Here I am getting quite old, and I want to see All Fair safely married and settled down before I die. I must go and visit the desert fairy and see if she will give me some advice as to how I can manage my stubborn daughter. Now you must know that it was a very hard task indeed to reach the desert fairy, for she was guarded by two fierce and terrible lions. The only way to get past the animals was to throw them a huge cake made from crocodiles' eggs, millet, and sugar candy. So the queen set to work, and with her own royal hands she prepared one of these cakes. Then she placed it in a basket and set out for the home of the desert fairy. Well, the day was hot, and the cake was heavy, and before long the queen was lying fast asleep under a big tree. Suddenly a terrible roar awakened her, and she looked round for her cake to throw to the angry lions, but to her horror it was gone. "'What is to become of me?' cried the poor queen in terror, and she burst into tears. <clears throat> cried a small voice, and the queen looked all around her to see who could be speaking. At last she looked upward, and there, in the branches of the big orange tree overhead, sat a little yellow man. He was just half a yard high, and he was eating oranges as quickly as ever he could. In fact, he didn't even stop eating while he spoke to the queen, which, of course, was very rude. "'Ah, queen,' he went on, "'there is only one way by which you can escape the lions, 
and, and that is by letting me marry your daughter. The queen was so surprised that she even stopped crying. The idea of that hideous little creature marrying her beautiful daughter was quite absurd, and she was just about to tell him so when again she heard the dreadful roaring of the lions. "'Be quick and make up your mind,' cried the yellow dwarf. He was called the yellow dwarf, you know, because he lived in the orange tree, and he had eaten so much of the fruit that his skin had become the same color. "'Just remember, you have no cake to throw to the lions.' So, to save her life, the queen was forced to give her consent to a marriage between the yellow dwarf and her beautiful daughter. No sooner did she agree to the match than she began to feel very drowsy, and the next minute the queen found herself safely back in her own palace. She was so filled with sadness at the thought of her promise to the dwarf that a fit of deep gloom settled upon her, and for weeks she never smiled. The princess was quite at a loss to know what had come over her mother, so in the end she too made up her mind to visit the desert fairy in the hope that she would be able to tell what ailed the queen. Then All Fair set to work and made a cake from the crocodile's eggs, millet, and sugar candy, and when it was ready she started off for the desert fairy's grotto. She soon reached the fatal orange tree, and the fruit looked so very tempting that All Fair laid her cake upon the ground and began to pick and eat the ripe oranges. Just then one of the lions gave a terrible roar, and All Fair looked for her cake to throw to them. Alas, it was gone, and the maiden began to weep bitterly. "'Dry your eyes, lovely princess,' cried a voice, and looking up, All Fair spied the yellow dwarf. "'You need not trouble to go to the desert fairy,' went on the dwarf, "'for I can tell you what ails your mother.' "'I shall be obliged if you will tell me at once, then,' replied All Fair. "'Oh, it is all your fault,' said the yellow dwarf. "'How dare you say such things?' cried the princess. "'It is nothing of the sort.' "'Oh, yes, it is,' answered the dwarf with a grin. "'Your mother is sorry now that she promised you to me in marriage.' "'I am sure my mother did not promise me to a fright like you,' cried the angry princess and I will not marry you. Oh, please yourself, answered the yellow dwarf, but if you don't marry me, you will make a fine meal for the lions, that is all. Just at that moment the lions began to roar louder than ever. Well, to save my life, cried poor Allfair, I will agree to marry you. I wouldn't have you now, said the dwarf with an air of disdain. "'Oh, please do,' begged All Fair, "'or I shall be torn to pieces by the lions.' "'I'll marry you out of charity, then,' said the yellow dwarf. "'But don't suppose that I really want a vain creature like you.' At that instant the princess found herself growing very drowsy, and the next minute she was back again at the palace, and on her finger was a ring made of a single red hair which she could not take off. After that All Fair grew sad, for she feared that the yellow dwarf might claim her. Of course nobody knew the cause of her sadness, and they all wondered what it could be. So the Queen's ministers held a cabinet meeting, and they agreed to ask the princess once more if she would marry, for they thought the excitement of choosing her wedding gown might rouse her from her gloom. To the great surprise of them all, All Fair said she was quite willing to do as they wished. So the king of the golden mines had his reward for waiting so long, for the princess chose him as her husband. He was very rich and powerful, and so gallant that All Fair thought when once she was his wife she would need fear the yellow dwarf no more. 
the wedding day arrived at last, and as the guests were on their way to the church, they saw a big box moving toward them, and on the top sat a very ugly old woman. Stop! she cried with a dreadful frown. Do you remember the promise you made to my friend the yellow dwarf? I am the desert fairy, and if all fair does not marry the dwarf, she will taste my wrath, you will find. This speech made the brave king of the golden mines so angry that he drew his sword and shouted loudly, Be gone, or I will take your evil life. As soon as he uttered these words, off flew the top of the box, and out came the yellow dwarf seated upon a big black Spanish cat. "'Not so fast,' cried the yellow dwarf. "'I am your rival, so do not vent your wrath upon the desert fairy. I claim the princess for my bride, and in token of her promise to me, on her finger you will find a ring made of a single red hair.' "'It is false,' cried the king of the golden mines, and he made a dash sword in hand for the yellow dwarf. But quick as thought the dwarf drew his sword also, and he rode forward on his Spanish cat. Well, they fought long and fiercely, but the king was not able to overcome the dwarf because he was protected by two enormous giants, who stood one on each side of him. Suddenly the desert fairy stepped forward, and on her head was a wreath of big, curling snakes. Raising her lance, she struck the princess such a blow that Olfair sank fainting into her mother's arms. "'Revenge!' shouted the king of the golden mines, and he rushed to the aid of his love, as a brave man would, of course. But alas, he was too late for the dwarf had torn her from her mother's arms, lifted her onto his Spanish cat, and the next minute they were flying through the air beyond his reach. The poor king was so surprised that all he could do was to gaze up towards the clouds and wonder what would happen next. Suddenly a mist gathered before his eyes, and he felt himself being carried up into the air also. Now you must know that the ugly old desert fairy had fallen madly in love with the king of the golden mines, and she had made up her mind that he should never marry Allfair, so she carried him off to secure him for herself. Up into the air they went, until they reached a gloomy cave. Then the fairy set him down, and restored his sight by means of her magic arts. "'He is sure to fall in love with me,' she cried to herself, "'now that all fair is safely out of the way.' But it was not a bit of use, for she was so ugly that the king only looked the other way the whole time, and this made her very angry indeed. So the fairy tried another plan. She took the form of a beautiful maiden, and placed the king in a splendid chariot drawn by two snow-white swans. Then she, too, stepped in, and together they sailed away through the air. "'He'll never resist my charms this time,' she said to herself. But she found out her mistake very soon, I can tell you. You see, although the fairy could change her form at will, her feet always remained the same, and the king caught sight of the two ugly webbed feet that looked as if they belonged to a griffin. So he was not deceived at all, and he knew her to be the desert fairy, in spite of the disguise. On and on they went, and once the king chanced to look downward, there he saw a castle built of bright polished steel, and on the balcony stood Olfair, weeping very bitterly. Olfair chanced to look upwards, 
and she spied the chariot drawn by the snow-white swans. Although it passed along very quickly, she could see the king seated inside with a lovely maiden. And as she did not know it was the desert fairy, she felt very jealous indeed. Soon the chariot alighted at a lonely palace, shut in by a wall of emeralds on one side and the sea on the other. Well, the king just cast his eyes around the place and made up his mind not to stay there long. I'll escape somehow, he said to himself, and he did, too, before very long. He pretended to be in love with the desert fairy, and this pleased and flattered her so much that she began to treat him very kindly indeed. She even allowed him to walk alone on the seashore for half an hour each day. One morning, as the king stood upon the beach, he was surprised to see a charming mermaid rise up from the water. "'King of the golden mines,' she said, "'I know your story and have the power to set you free. I can also restore your princess Allfair to you once more. Now, as I am an enemy of the desert fairy, I will do this for you. The king thanked her, of course, and the mermaid bade him set himself upon her tail, and away they sailed at full speed across the blue ocean, until they had gone many miles. The princess, you must know, said the mermaid, is being kept a prisoner by the yellow dwarf. She is in a bright steel castle, and in another hour we shall reach the place. On they went still farther, and at length the mermaid set the king down upon the seashore. The rest of the journey, she said, you must take alone, and you will have many enemies to fight before you reach the princess. But, she added, I will present you with this magic sword, which will overcome everything, so long as you never let it out of your hand. The king took the sword, and thanked the mermaid again and again, and then he set out to seek the steel castle. But before he had gone a hundred yards, four terrible griffins attacked him, and the king stood a good chance of being torn to pieces by their long claws. Just in time, however, he remembered his magic sword, and no sooner did the four griffins behold it than they sank to the ground, blinded by its brightness. After that it was an easy matter to cut off their heads, and the king went on his way again. Soon after he met six big dragons, and each one was covered with scales like cast iron. But by means of his magic sword the king was able to kill them also, and he hoped his troubles were nearly over. Alas, before he had gone many yards, Twenty-four nymphs, all lovely as the sun, set themselves right in his path. "'Our business,' they said, "'is to keep you from reaching the steel castle. "'If we let you pass, all our lives will be sacrificed. "'We have done you no harm, so do go back again, "'that our innocent lives may be spared.' "'Well, the king scarcely knew how to act.' It seemed a pity to destroy such lovely creatures, and yet get to the steel castle he must. "'Strike! Strike!' cried a voice loudly, "'or you will lose your princess for ever.' So his majesty destroyed the whole twenty-four of them, and at that moment the steel castle appeared in sight. On the balcony stood Allfair, just as she had been when he passed through the air in the chariot drawn by swans. "'Princess,' he cried, "'your faithful lover has returned at last.' "'Faithful indeed,' replied Allfair angrily. 
you were not faithful when I saw you being carried through the air in company with a beautiful maiden. Indeed I was, replied the king of the golden mines. The maiden you saw was the wicked desert fairy. She carried me off to an island, and there I should be now if a kind mermaid had not set me free. Then the king cast himself at her feet, but unfortunately he managed to drop the magic sword over the balcony. Out popped the ugly yellow dwarf from behind a big cabbage where he was hiding, and he snapped up the sword in a trice. The princess gave a loud shriek when she set eyes on the dwarf, but the little man, who knew well what a treasure the sword was, just uttered two magic words, with the weapon in his hand, and there appeared two terrible giants, who at once bound the king in chains in spite of his struggles. Now, chuckled the yellow dwarf, your lover is in my power. If he will consent to your becoming my bride, I will set him free at once. Never, cried the king of the golden mines. Then take that, replied the yellow dwarf, and he buried the magic sword in the heart of the king. The poor princess was filled with sorrow at the loss of her lover, and she cried loudly, Hideous dwarf! You have gained nothing by slaying my lover, for I will never marry you. Since he is dead, I will die too. Then she seized the sword and plunged it into her own heart. The good mermaid was very unhappy when she heard what had taken place. But as her only power lay in the magic sword, she could help them no further. So she changed them into two palm trees, growing side by side, and every time the soft breezes blew, their branches caressed and kissed each other. So they were happy together after all, in spite of the ugly yellow dwarf. End of the Yellow Dwarf